Jacqueline. Hello. Uh, just testing. Can you hear me okay? I sure can. Thank you very much. So you can see me okay. I sure can. Thank okay. you. And thank you for being here. Thank you. This is the clerk with a courtesy announcement that the meeting is now live on the meeting portal and YouTube. Good morning, Amanda. Supervisor Ellenberg. How's my sound today? It sounds wonderful. Thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you. Have a great day. Good morning, Martha. Morning, Rhonda. Have a great meeting. Good morning, Glenn. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? I sure can, thank you. Good morning, Supervisor Simidian. Good morning, Rhonda. Let's do a sound check. How are we doing this morning? Doing great. And you sound lovely. Thank great. you. Thank you, ma'am. I'm going to uh, both uh, go off camera and mute, and uh, I'll come back on when roll is called. Thank you, Supervisor right. Simidian. Thank you, sir. Supervisor Wasserman, sounding wonderful today. Rhonda, how are you? Lovely. How are you? Lovely as well. Your clerk today is going to be the wonderful Peggy Doyle. Yay, Peggy. And good morning, President Wasserman. Good morning. Peggy, I see Vice President Ellenberg, who will be leading us in the pledge in just a minute, Supervisor Chavez, Supervisor Sumidian, and their Supervisor Lee. Three, two, one, showtime. All right, Peggy, if you'll please take a roll to establish the presence of a quorum. Supervisor Lee. Good morning. Supervisor Chavez. 
I will come back. Supervisor Simidian. Simidian here. Vice President Ellenberg. I'm here. President Wasserman. Here. And going back for Supervisor Chavez, who appears to be in the room but is not responding. You do have a quorum. Thank you very much. With that, we'll move on to the Pledge of Allegiance. And today's pledge will be led by Vice President Ellenberg. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Vice President Ellenberg. With that, we're gonna move on to item number three, which is an invocation. And I have the honor of giving our invocation today. Last month, the Board of Supervisors vo voted to appoint a new Santa Clara County Poet Laureate for a two-year term through December 2023. Today, I have the honor of introducing a multi-talented individual to you. Following a competitive peer review and interview process with Silicon Valley Creates and our county library staff, San Jose resident Shaka Campbell was chosen as the county's seventh poet Laureate, and I see him on our screen right now. Shaka Campbell was born in England and moved to the US at the age of 10. He developed a love for language from his father who taught him about great ideas and great speakers. Shaka is what we would call in baseball, a five tool player. When it comes to the arts, he can do it all. He has authored four books of poetry. He is an accomplished performer taking part in multiple individual and group poetry competitions across the country. He curates the Beautiful Black Books program for Poetry Center San Jose. He conducts lectures and workshops in creative writing. Shaka is also a talented musician taking part in a number of musical collaborations in multiple genres. I think it is safe to say that Shaka is a true Renaissance man. We are very happy to have him as our new County Poet Laureate where he can share his many talents and interests to elevate Santa Clara County residents' awareness of poetry. As Poet Laureate, Shaka plans to focus on engaging the community to listen different and implementing a program called In Our Words, working with public libraries and schools. We all look forward to hearing more about this and other ideas he has for his term. Before we hear from Shaka, I'd like to recognize and thank our previous County Poet Laureates, Niels P Peterson, Sally Ashton, David Perez, Arlene Biala, Mike McGee, and Janice Lobo Sapigo. I'd also like to thank Silicon Valley Create CEO Connie Martinez for her group's assistance in selecting the new Poet, poet Laureate, along with our county librarian, Jennifer Weeks. Now I'd like to invite Shaka to say a few words and to share some of his work with us. Shaka. Um. Hey, can you guys hear me okay? Yes, we can. Well, first of all, I want to say I'm honored. I'm I'm humbled uh, to be in this position, so I thank you very much. I am standing on the shoulders of uh, many great uh, poet laureates uh, before me, so I, I appreciate all that they've done to uh, sort of curate this position to where it is. Um, I think it's extraordinary um, also in the fact that it's Black History Month and I am the first uh, African-American Poet Laureate, so that puts a little bit more cherry on the top for me, as you can see with my hat. Bad joke. Um, anyway, so I'm just going to do a quick, uh, a quick poem uh, for you guys, if that's okay. Yes. Um, it's uh, it's called a love letter, love letter to the aftermath, and it's basically a view of um, sort of my bird's eye view of the last couple of years and sort of. The last three years during the pandemic, et cetera, and how I've sort of gone through it. Uh, here we go. I'll caveat by saying I'm not a singer, I'm a poet. Sun up in the sky, you know how I feel. Breeze drifting on by, you know how I feel. And then there was the outside left empty. It was a street from the asphalt, the roads had eaten themselves and only then could we hear the language the outside sung to its young. 
the yawn of the day breaking into dewdrops like a secret that couldn't be tamed. And we saw how the leaves danced now that they've shed their human husks, how they play fought with the wind again and again, falling into a portrait of untethered landscape attached to nothing but themselves. But meanwhile, you and I, our bodies became a house of windows looking for a new view of the world and aching to end the silence. But it's a new dawn. It's a new day. It's a new life for me. But the anxiety, the anxiety was fair. See, the opposite of grace comes as quiet grabs the air around me at night. I can hear my bones contract, my eyes empty, not, not from the lack of light, but to familiar my mind on how to navigate the darkness. See, then, then, then came the terror. More and more, a sharpened scalpel cut leaks a narrative, a global nightmare sung in the key of naught, and then a stolen life and then another and another and then multiplied in its own image atop a pale horse a movement haunted to sleep sees scenes bled into themselves like take one a taser bears the face of death take two tweaked to defibrillate back to black take three what's left when the police remove the a and e from blame is a movement meant to reclaim the color back to breathing in the day and the day the day is the place where the demons thread their religion into the screams no one heard and it hurt me, it hurt. And they asked, how, how do you silent the noise, Shaka? It must be deafening. And I say, as if they care, as if the reach of gunpowder will not surface my skin with each venture into the undecided climate of whether I matter. So I tell them, I tell them, I tell them my poem. I poem, I tell them I write because you can't murder it. But the truth is it's the only way to ensure the bullets have exit wounds, but it's a new dawn. It's a new day, it's a new life for me. And I'm choosing us, you and me, us, all of us, because, because the space beneath us heaves when we are hummingbird to flower. We are better than this thing that was given to us without warning, without peril. So this rebellion blood that gallops our veins is in every stride we gain closer to the we we were and are in this is us and as us we readied will ride this ghost till its skeleton breaks because we, together, we are stronger than the menu of outcomes this year has allowed us to pluck life from. And we together are more because we choose it. Because in an echo of yesterday, a slip past midnight, we speak our names, even the ones already gone and our hearts would smile. And those with questions still on their tongues will receive the light of a dying galaxy trapped in a kiss. It will disappear into their heartbreaks like a coddled storm to let the fear in them know that we, we are eternity. And together we will turn those scars into nostalgia and show ourselves, show all of ourselves how to heal. Birds are flying high, you know how I feel. Sun up in the sky, you know how I feel. Breeze drifting in on by, you know how I feel. It's a new dawn, it's a new day, it's a new life for me. And I'm feeling good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Chaka, thank you for that excellent reading and pretty darn good singing. Congratulations on becoming Santa Clara County's newest poet laureate. Thank you very much. I just, I uh, just texted one of my, one of my staff members that helped put this together for me, and I said, I love this guy. <laughs> Take thank care, Chaka. Take care. Thank you. All the best. Bye bye. All right. With that, we're going to move on to item number four, announcements, uh, Germans in, more, in memoriam. And Supervisor Lee, we're turning to you first. Yes, good morning. Um, we'd like to uh, adjourn today in honor and memory of uh, my good friend, uh, Daniel Hoffman, uh, who passed away peacefully in the sleep on January 15th, uh, 2022, at the age of 95. You lived a very full life indeed. He was born in Utica, uh, uh, New York, uh, on J July 7th and 26th to Rabbi Isidore Hoffman and Thoda Burstein. 
Dan was a strong proponent of peaceful activism. He participated in nonviolent civil rights demonstrations back in the 1948, resulting in his arrest actually three times. He married Nancy Rosenfeld in 1961 and raised three children in Saratoga. He was very extremely devoted to social justice issues and political causes throughout his life. He worked tirelessly for the Democratic Party, walking precincts, working phone banks, and registering voters. He was honored with the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Santa Clara Democratic Party in 2020. He was also a co-founder and board member of the Martin Luther King MLK Association of Santa Clara Valley and helped organize the annual MLK Dinner as MLK Day Freedom Train. He was also a board member of the NWCP and the African American Heritage House. Dan was president of the Reduced Gun Violence of Santa Clara County. I was involved with many other civic and political organizations. He was a feminist and a longtime member of the League of Women Voters. Dan received numerous awards over the years and was especially proud of the GEM, which stands for Greatly Enlightened Male Award that he was given in 2015 from Don, which is, stands for Democratic Activist for Women's Now. He was an avid sports fan, especially enjoyed watching baseball and football. He was a voracious reader and book collector. Part of his generous spirit was buying books in order to give them away. Dan loved reading the daily newspaper, collecting stamps, playing bridge, watching old movies, and bragging about his children. Dan was an outspoken progressive who dedicated his life to community service he was a true philanthropist who gave equally of his time and his money. He was altruistic and kind-hearted and believing in empowering others to succeed. Dan has lived a purposeful life and will be dearly missed. My last meeting with Dan was about a year or so ago uh, when I was running for this very office. And he was very generous on his advice and also his checkbook. And he actually wrote a check not only to my campaign, but to many important campaigns he saw important for our nation for our Senate and other offices. He is survived by his three daughter, children, Sharon Hoffman, Jeremy Hoffman, and Carolyn Hoffman Calasimo, PJ, and grand grandchildren, Kyle and Casey. And he would truly be missed. Now community has lost a tremendous leader. And I would like to also acknowledge, I believe his daughters, Sharon and Carolyn uh, are here, but wasn't planning to speak. I believe they're here observing today. Hi, Sharon. Hi. Thank you, Thank Thank you, you Dr. Sharon. Sharon, if I may ask just a minute, Supervisor Smithian had a few words to say about your dad too. And it looks like Supervisor Chavez does too. And then if we can have you be the final speaker regarding your father, if that's all right with you. We want to hear from you last. Thank you. Supervisor Smithian. Thank you, Supervisor Wasserman. And uh, thank you to Supervisor Lee for a really lovely memory. I, I just wanted to add my uh, condolences as well. Dan was someone I knew over the years uh, through all of the good works that uh, Supervisor Lee described. And uh, I think the only thing I would add or the way I would characterize my observations of Dan over the years is, you, you know, there are people who talk a good game when it comes to their values and their uh, priorities. And then there are people who actually live that life. And Dan was a person who lived that life. And uh, to me, that was always what was so uh, genuinely impressive about it was this was a person who didn't simply articulate good values. He lived them in his daily life and in what he chose to do with his time and talent. So condolences to the family, but uh, a lovely, lovely memory of a lovely, lovely human being. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor. Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. And um, Sharon, to you and your, your siblings and your his grandchildren, I'm so sorry for your loss. Um, you know, I, I think all of us um, have, have known um, Dan for in different ways, but I wanted to say one thing I really, really appreciated about him. He was so generous with his time. So when, when new people were trying to get involved in their community and really trying to find their way, he took time to help them figure out how they could fit in, how they could plug in. And, and that, you know, from somebody to, to, to kind of raise the next generation of leaders and activists, it was just a really thoughtful way of the way he entered the world. And the other thing I wanted to say is he loved a good argument. And I, I enjoyed um, years of debating with him on one idea or another. And I always left feeling like I heard something I hadn't heard before or a perspective I hadn't really thought about. 
Um, and I, I just wanted to say thank you for sharing him with us. I know he had to spend a lot, he was with us a lot um, in the community and, um, and just really deeply grateful. And Otto, thank you so much for remembering him today. That is so, so well and richly deserved. Thank you, Sharon. Sure. Um, thanks for the tribute today. We, we opted not to do a service because of the times being what they are. So this is uh, the most formal tribute he, he has. So thank you. I really appreciate you taking the time for this and, um, and just giving your, your thoughts about him. I mean, I know personally that politics and social justice causes were his favorite topic whenever we got together. And I grew up with, we all did, all of us kids, with debate around the dinner table. And we were taught that's how a curious mind gets to know different issues. And I later came to realize that's not how most dinner tables operated. <laughs> but I learned a lot from, from growing up with my dad. And uh, I will sorely miss him. So thank you again, everybody. Thank you very much, Sharon, and, and thank you all. It's, uh... Sounds like a fantastic man in many, many, many ways. Thank you. We now move on to item number five. And Supervisor Lee, before we have you present the commendation, I do want to say to everyone listening today at home or in, at work that wishes to speak about public comment, which will be the item coming up after Supervisor Lee finishes his presentation, please register electronically now so we can get an idea of how many speakers wish to speak during item number six, public comment, which is your opportunity to speak about anything not on today's agenda. Thank you very much. And with that, we'll turn to Supervisor Lee. Thank you, President Wasserman. Today, uh, I would like to present a commendation for my good friend here uh, in Sunnyvale, Glenn Hendricks, for his heartfelt dedication service to improve the transportation for the residents of our county. Um, I want to thank the VTA now, former chair, Glenn Hendricks. Um, Glenn has taken over the leadership of the board at what turned out to be a very challenging and important and extremely meaningful time in the history of the VTA, a Valley Transportation Authority. All the while, he led with remarkable steadiness, empathy, compassion, grace, and unwavering concern for the well-being of the VTA's employees and the public. Some of his many accomplishments during his time as chair included managing more than 30 virtual meetings during a global pandemic so the important oversight work the board does never stops. He worked to get VTA personnel priority vaccination status as frontline workers serving our community day in and day out during the pandemic. Partnered with the Amalgamated Transit Union, ATU Local 265, to establish the COVID-19 vaccination clinics and testing opportunities at all the VTA divisions. Appointment of the general manager and CEO and the CFO and guided the VTA's response and recovery from a cyber attack on the agency's computer systems and the deadly shooting that took place at Guadalupe Division on May 26, 2021. Establishing the VTA's Joint Labor Management Committee to direct $20 million in state funding to support the VTA and its employees and the families in the recovery from the shooting. And he helped to restore and continue vital transit services to our community during this incredibly challenging period in the VTA's history. And if that was not enough, he also helped to oversee the groundbreaking of numerous highway projects, approving the 2016 Measure B tenure program, advancing the BART extension of the Silicon Valley project, and successful Section 2218 ballot to preserve social security benefits for past, current, and future employees. This long list is just to say he will forever be a figure within the VTA as the person who stepped up to challenge when called to do so, to chart and chart of waters and steer the ship to safety when few could see the way. For this, we will be forever grateful for your leadership, Glenn. And from all of us, we thank you for your tireless work to make our county a better place for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Lynn, please go right ahead. Yeah, I, first of all, to the supervisor, I wanna thank you very much for this uh, commendation. Um, I've worked with all of you in various forms on VTA as either a board member or an alternate or on the PAC. So I know you all have 
great uh, uh, interest and desire in seeing public transportation work here in the county. Um, as you all know that being on a board is a team sport. And so I wanna go ahead and thank all the BTA board members who we couldn't have done this work last year without them. I wanna thank all of our riders who continue to come out and use our service. And we hope they continue to come out in larger droves. And lastly, I just wanna go ahead and thank the employees. Um, we all know boards, we get to make our policy decisions and, and help give direction, um, but it's actually the employees of the organization that are out there day to day um, doing the work to deliver the high quality service to our residents. So I just wanna make sure we say thank you to them and just thank you very much. Thank you very much. Supervisor Chavez. I just wanted to add um, one point. First, Otto, thank you so much for even thinking about doing this. I, I think so often, um, especially on, on the public side, we don't take a moment to just say, wow, like amazing job well done. Um, but um, I wanted to just share with my colleagues that um, Glenn was as um, generous and consistent and open in, in private as he was in public during this last year. I, I really can't imagine um, one more thing that could have gone wrong. And he kind of kept his arms around the entire organization, the board, the, the senior staff, the employees, and even the public to keep us all moving forward. And it was just such a pleasure to get to serve with him. Thank you. Congratulations. I'll toss in my kudos too, Glenn. When I think about you, I think of a classy guy. I appreciate your leadership. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, we now move on to item number six, which I mentioned a few minutes ago. It's public comment. When anyone has the uh, opportunity to speak about anything not on today's agenda. So we're gonna give this another 10 seconds to see who else would like to register to be heard today. And then we'll assign the number of minutes. And then Peggy, I will turn to you. If you'll please start now, Peggy, and give each speaker one minute each. And remember, this is on items not on today's agenda. Our first speaker is Gail Ann Osmer. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute when you will have one minute to speak. Oh, hi. Um, happy Tuesday. Listen, I'm calling regarding um, SB 1152. It's a new California law that hospitals can't discharge homeless without care. March 22nd, 2019. O'Connor Hospital has been discharging people and no place for them to go. A gal just had a, uh, a foot operation and they discharged her back into the wilds of um, living unhoused. We need to check into this. We need to look at respite beds. O'Connor is the worst hospital to let people out of um, after operations. A gal had a hernia operation last year and O'Connor let her out back living at Corey Court. People have been let out that are in wheelchairs. Please, somebody take this up and look into this. It's very important that the unhoused have respite beds to go to after hospitalization. Thank you. Our next speaker is Angelique Martinez. Please accept the unmute to begin. My name is Angelique. I'm with the Young Women's Freedom Center, and I am a local in District 2. I'm in support of the Care First Jail Last Coalition, and I'm calling on Supervisor Lee to reconsider your A vote on items 11, 12, and 13 on building the new jail from 125-22 per preliminary procedures. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Karen Matsueta. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Hi, this is Karen Matsueta. I'm also here in support of the Care First Coalition, urging Supervisor Lee to request a revote on January 25th, agenda items 11 and 13, and to change your vote to no on item 11 and possible actions A, B, C, and D, and yes on item 13 and possible actions A, B, C, D, and E without amendments. If the board is serious about its alternatives to incarceration work plan, it would be premature to assume the scope, number, scale, and services of any new carceral and or mental health facilities right now. It would also be premature to proceed with plans for new facilities run by the Sheriff's Department until the Attorney General's investigation is complete. The results should inform the county in shaping an accountable, transparent, and humane framework for justice-involved individuals. Thank you. 
Our next speaker is Tina Brown. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Good morning, this is Tina Brown. I'm a system impacted family member with Silicon Valley Debug and I am also in support of the Care First Gel Never Coalition. Today I'm calling on Supervisor Lee to reconsider your A vote on the building of a new jail from 125 22 per, per parliamentary procedures. The ATI work plan that will be discussed at PSJC this Thursday is a direct conflict with your A vote to build a new jail because the county needs to look at proposals coming from those work groups to see what incarceration and or mental health facilities would look like in terms of scope, number, scale, and services. Additionally, the AG investigation of the sheriff's management of the jail could inform the county in determining what an accountable and transparent framework for justice involved individuals should look like. Look like. Again, I am calling on Supervisor Lee to consider the completion of the ATI and the AG's investigation. Our next speaker is Nicolasa Trujillo. Please accept the unmute to begin. Good morning, this is Nicolasa Trujillo. I'm part of the IDL department at San Luis Hospital. I work in MedSource unit. Our safety and care of our patients is our priority, which is getting more difficult every single day because the highest census and understaffed I can tell you right now, it is so sad to see our patients lonely and sad every single day. As, as me showing in one of the rooms cleaning every single day, waiting, the patients waiting for us just to complain about the service they receive. They're complaining about their breakfast is cold or their husband calling the nurse for the past half an hour. It's, it's very sad. Um, I invite you guys to spend a day with us to see how's the condition to work. We work in very hard every single day. As every single morning when I go to work, my children will ask me, mom, what time you will come back to work? And I will say, well, 3.30, but sometimes it's just impossible. We really need help. Thank you. Our next speaker is Nancy Carionas. Please accept the unmute to begin. Supervisor Lee, it is not too late for you to demonstrate integrity and courage and exercise those imagination muscles. I'm here to support the Care First Coalition and asking you to request a re-vote on January 25th agenda items 11 and 13 and change your vote to no on agenda item 11, January 25th, 2020. 22 possible actions A, B, C, and D, and yes on agenda item 13, also from January 25th, possible actions A, B, C, D, and E without amendment. Thank you. Our next speaker is Olamide Abios. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hi, I'm also here in support of the Care First Coalition, and I urge you, Supervisor Lee to request a revote on your January 25th agenda items 11 and 13 and change your vote to no on agenda item 11, possible actions A, B, C, and D, and yes on agenda item 13, possible actions A, B, C, D, and E without amendments. The county needs to look at the proposals coming out of the PSJC alternatives to incarceration work groups before deciding what incarceration and or mental health facilities would look like in terms of scope, number, scale, and services. Also, you may have made your decision based on false information that a new jail is required due to the consent decrees. Finally. I am so sorry. What? Let's restore her. Yes, one moment. Yep, let's go back to 30 seconds, please, Peggy. Need to go find. Apologies. She is no longer in the room. I will keep an eye out for her um, and go back uh, while the next speaker is called. Our next speaker is Deborah St. Julian. And your mic is open, Deborah. Okay. Uh, my name is, you know my name. I, I agree with the previous speakers. I wanted to say I love the poet laureate, the new poet laureate. and. His encouragement to go to community consideration and the we 
Um, I'm in support of the Care First Coalition, and we urge, I also urge Supervisor Lee to request a revote on the January 25th agenda item 11 and 13, as previously noted by the other spoke speakers, um, and the encouragement to look at the proposals coming out of the PSJC ATI work groups before deciding what incarceration or mental health facilities would look like. We need this input before we make these big expenditures and plans. So as Nancy said, be courageous and request a revote. Thank you. And I am going back to Olamai. And your mic is open again. My apologies earlier. Okay. Um, and it's Olami Day actually, but um, as I was saying, the county needs to look at the proposals coming out of the PSJC alternatives to incarceration work groups before deciding what incarceration and or mental health facilities would look like. And then I was also saying that Otto Lee, you're, you may have made your decision based on false information that a new jail is required due to the consent decrees. Finally, while the attorney general is conducting an investigation into the sheriff's management of the jail, lessons learned from that process could greatly inform the county in determining what an accountable and transparent our next speaker is Adam Gomez. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hello, I, I'm a medical social worker at O'Connor Hospital. I'm a member of SEIU 521. I'm here to ask for your support to support frontline workers by approving extended paid sick leave for October through December 2021 and approving an extra shift premium to increase workers to incentivize workers to pick up extra shifts. Our hospital is critically understaffed and the new positions that you are considering today are great, but they will take time to fill and do not address all of the staffing needs. Um, the census at O'Connor has been the highest we've seen through the pandemic. While COVID has not stopped, extended paid sick leave did. I tested COVID positive on October 1st, and while I managed serious COVID symptoms, I was disheartened to hear that I would not be receiving extended paid sick leave during the time that I was out sick with COVID. I will end by asking you again to please consider supporting the frontline workers by approving extended paid sick leave for October through December 2021. Our next speaker is Ryan. Please accept the unmute to begin. Good morning, my name is Ryan. I'm a firefighter in Santa Clara County and was removed from duty on February 1st and my family's future is now unknown. You've heard the concerns about the effect this mandate will have on staffing and healthcare and those are real. We should all be focused on supporting public health policies that are based in truth and facts, not influenced by politics or ego. The premise of this mandate is to protect the high risk and vulnerable populations. It is now common knowledge that the vaccines do not stop infection or transmission. Therefore, removing the unvaccinated does nothing to protect these individuals. It only undermines public safety. This mandate makes no legal or rational sense and is only going to ruin the lives of professionals and their families and cause more harm to the healthcare industry and the patients it serves. Board of Supervisors, I ask that you take time to hold this mandate up against current reality and facts and make a decision based on that reality and not politics. You can affect lives in a positive way by stopping the mandate. You may not have power with Dr. Cody, but you have significant power with the county executive under Article 3, Section 301C of your county charter. Please do that what's right and thank you for your time. Our next speaker is Karen. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hi, my name is Karen Lee, and I'm a licensed clinical social worker at Santa Clara County Behavioral Health, located at Downtown Specialty Mental Health. I provide behavioral health services to severely mentally ill adults. I'm here to bring up issue of the lack of staffing in the behavioral health department, especially the outpatient specialty mental health clinics. In our county, we have only two clinics, Downtown Behavioral Health and Navarraz. We used to have four, but due to 2008 recession, it was cut down to two. We, the outpatient specialty mental health clinics, are the heart and soul of our clinic. Yet, we feel we are the forgotten little child. We are the clinics that help the, the chronic mentally ill out of jail, out of the hospital, out of EPS, and out of the street. Traditionally, in the past, each clinician supports about 70 clients. In 2018, it doubled to 140. Now, in 2022, it is to over 200. Our next speaker is Brody Story. Please accept the unmute to begin. 
Uh, I would like to ask Otto Lee to change his vote on the decision to build another jail. And historically, compromises between making decisions to build a jail and seek alternative mental health services uh, have not always gone successful. We usually favor the worst of two options. Um, in the spirit of Black History Month, I think that we should also take care for our Black and Brown community by not favoring something that has done detriment to the Black community. Um, and in the words of a friend, no one gets well in a cell. I think that we need to take a look at mental health services that better our community. It sounds like a lot of people are advocating for that as well as uh, services in hospitals. And I concede my time. Our next speaker is Nam Tai. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Yes. <clears throat> Good morning. My name is Nam Tai. I'm a psychiatric social worker working at the, the mental health call center. I'm uh, I'm speaking today to draw your attention in the crisis of compassion, as I call it. Uh, when I started the county uh, the call center in 2018, there were 12 staff. Now we are down to four, and. Uh, in the beginning of pandemic, management gave us notice that uh, five, four of us gonna be removed from our post. So since then, four of us had left voluntarily and yet they have not replaced us. And we are in the county of 2 million people responsible to call, uh, accept call for mental health. Uh, a lot of these calls are mental health crisis. People have to wait over an hour just to get through to the phone line. I urge you to turn this crisis of compassion around and look into this. This is not this is not right. Especially we live in the richest area of the Bay Area. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Sue Rodriguez. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hi, my name is Sue Rodriguez, and I've been a respiratory therapist at BMC for twelve years. And thank you for listening today. I think what's most important for you to know is what it takes to take care of our most critical patients in the hospital has actually changed. It actually, it's, it takes a lot more. Um, our staff is working hard with chronic staffing issues and little time and resources for training, staff development and equipment, um, getting a hold of what we need has been difficult. Uh, we have been grouped with nursing um, many times, but we don't get the same perks as nursing. Um, one thing would be, on an overtime um, incentive that's crucial for the staff um, so that they don't leave and they know that they're valued. Um, also provide extra shift premium pay to severely understaffed positions. Our next speaker is Melissa. Please accept the unmute to begin. Melissa, can you, there you go. Hi, thank you. Um, Hi, my name is Melissa and I am part of the Care First Jail Last Coalition and I am calling on Supervisor Lee to reconsider your I vote on items 11, 12, and 13 on building a new jail from 125-22 per parliamentary procedures. Um, I am looking at an assembly bill that we are looking to hopefully pass, um, AB 256, that is the Racial Justice Act and it um, it's pretty much, um, prohibits the state from seeking or obtaining a criminal conviction or from opposing, imposing a sentence based upon race, ethnicity, or national origin. And I feel like that is what is happening. There's a new jail being built and there's these um, laws that are trying to help people from um, being convicted based on those things. And um, Lee is pretty much advocating for this type of thing, which is um, not fair and it's not right. I seen that you um, say you listen to your community in a, um, uh... Our next speaker is Megan Swift. Please accept the unmute to begin. Megan, there you go. My name is Megan Swift and I'm calling to ask that you support the Care First Coalition. Supervisor Lee, I urge you to request a revote on January 25th, agenda items 11 and 13. Change your vote to no on agenda 11, possible actions A, B, C, and D. And yes, on agenda item 13, possible actions A, B, C, D, and E without amendments. 
It is unconscionable to decide what incarceration and or mental health facilities would look like in terms of scope, number, scale, and services without looking at the proposals coming out of the PSJC ATI work groups first. Please do this. The community sees that you've made a mistake basing your decisions on false information that a new jail is required due to the consent decrees. Finally, while the Attorney General is conducting an investigation of the Sheriff's management of the jail, learn from that process. You show the county what accountability and transparency. Our next speaker is Cody Griggs. Please accept the unmute to begin. My name is Cody Griggs. I'm a firefighter with the Santa Clara County Fire Department. I'm here today to ask for help from the Board of Supervisors. Sarah Cody's health order has taken my career away from me. As of last week, I have been on leave without pay and I am the sole provider for my family. I've always done anything this department has asked of me. I'm a member of our special operations division and I teach multiple disciplines to new firefighters. Last fire season, I worked 39 to 41 days to do my part for the department, the county and the state. I medically cannot get a COVID vaccination and have an exemption from my doctor that has been approved by my department. Despite this, I am now no longer receiving a paycheck and have been informed by our acting chief, Brian Glass, that he will fire me. Please do something. Do anything to help me and the many other county workers in a similar position as me. Thank you. Our next speaker is P. Silvio. Please accept the unmute to begin. And your mic is open. Hello, I'm one of the emergency doctors at Valley Medical Center. I'm remaining anonymous out of the fear of retribution from USAC. USAC, U.S. Acute Care Solutions, is a largely private equity-backed corporation that staffs us doctors to work in your county's ER. The fact that I and many other ER physicians have this fear of speaking out should tell you how powerful and scary these corporate medical groups are. I want to raise my concerns as others have and will about the county continuing to contract with USAC or, or any other corporation. At the end of the day, these corporations' ultimate goal is to maximize profits for their administrators and shareholders and not make things safer in the ER. Have you ever wondered why your loved one with abdominal pain has had to wait up to eight hours to be seen by a physician? Although USAC has been asked repeatedly to make things safer for patients and increase the number of doctors and PAs working, they have been reluctant because additional staff means more clinicians they have to pay and more, less profit they get to keep. And when they did finally add one more shift in November, they fired the medical director three weeks ago who had been fighting so hard for this and other safer changes. Please look to other alternatives such as being directly employed by the county because we simply want better care for our patients. Our next speaker is Andrew Bigelow. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hey, how you doing? Can you hear me? Yes. Right on. Um, so I'm, I'm calling uh, a part of the uh, Care First Coalition. Um, and just like all, a lot of these other folks on public comment been saying, um, you know, we're here to here to ask for uh, Supervisor Otto Lee to reconsider his A vote on items 11, 12, and 13 um, on January 25th. Uh, in regards to building a new jail. Um, you know, it was uh, over a year and a half ago um, that this county declared racism a public health issue. Um, and then a year and a half later, uh, this county voted to build a maximum security jail uh, to further increase um, uh, incarceration of people, um, mostly people of color. Um, I Otto Lee, uh, you know, my family lives in your district. Um, everyone who was speaking at that last um, county meeting was heavily in favor of not building this jail. Please listen to them. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lyle Kipp. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hi, uh, my name is Lyle Kipp and I'm a firefighter in Santa Clara County. My apartment is currently great and staff and we are charged to lose numerous firefighters as a result of this public health order. I am personally vaccinated and boosted and still got sick with COVID-19. The rea reality is that you can carry the virus regardless of your vaccination status. So why are we getting rid of good men and women who have served their community selflessly for years on end? We signed up to do a high-risk job, and that's all that we want to do. I urge the Board of Supervisors to do everything in their power to reverse the public health order and allow my comrades to keep their jobs. I... Uh, see my time. Thank you. Next speaker is telephone ending 661. Please accept the unmute to begin. 
Telephone 661, can you, there you go. My name is Priscilla Mena. I'm with the Young Women's Freedom Center. Um, I live in Santa Clara County. I am in support of the Care for Zero Never Coalition, and I am calling on Supervisor Lee to reconsider your yes vote on items 11, 12, and 13 on building a new jail from January 25th, 2022, per parliamentary procedures. The county needs to look at the proposals coming out of the HCI work groups to see what incarceration and mental health facilities would look like in terms of scope, number, scale, and services. Additionally, the Attorney General's investigation of the Sheriff's management of the jail could greatly inform the county in determining what an accountable and transparent framework of, for justice involved individuals should be. Again, I'm calling on Supervisor Lee to consider the completion of the alternative to incarceration work plan and the Attorney General's investigation of the Sheriff to recall your A vote to building maximum, a maximum security jail. Thank you. Our next speaker is William Armeline. Please accept the unmute to begin. Thank you. Uh, my name is Will Armeline, and I'm the uh, director of the Human Rights Institute at San Jose State University and the criminal justice chair for NAACP of San Jose and Silicon Valley. I'm also a member uh, of the Care First Coalition and a member of Silicon Valley Debug. Um, I, I really urge Supervisor Lee to reconsider his vote in the ways that many of my colleagues today have described. Uh, I also urge the board in general to try and think about this issue in the spirit uh, that they approved uh, themselves as a human rights county in 2018. Uh, and I've, uh, uh, in my letters to the board, uh, sort of explained human rights standards that guide uh, our position on this issue. Um, beyond that, I just urge the board also to pay attention to current events and Santa Rita Jail was just put in receivership to a law firm in the Department of Justice for the inhumane treatment of folks with mental health uh, issues. And I, I just urge them to pay attention to those signs. Thanks. Our next speaker is YWFC Santa Clara County. Please accept the unmute. Can you, there you go. Yeah, hi, my name is Alexis Roman and I'm with the Young Women's Freedom Center and I live with District 4. I'm in support of the Care First Jail Never Coalition and I'm calling on Supervisor Lee to reconsider your I vote on items 11, 12, and 13 on building a new jail from January 25th, 2022 per parliamentary procedures. The county needs to look at the proposals coming out of the ATI work groups to see what incarceration and their mental health facilities will look like in terms of scope number, scale, and services. Additionally, the Attorney General's investigation of Sheriff's management of the jail could greatly inform the county in determining what an accountable and transparent framework for justice involved individuals should be. Again, I'm calling on Supervisor Lee to consider the completion of the alternatives to incarceration work plan and the Attorney General's investigation of the Sheriff's to recall your I vote to build a maximum security jail. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lori Catcher. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hi, supervisors. My name is Lori Katcher, and I live in district um, in support of the care, I'm urging Supervisor Lee to request a revote on the January 25th agenda items 11 and 13. We are asking you to change your vote to no on agenda item 11, actions A, B, C, and D, and yes on agenda item 13 from 125-22 also possible actions a b c d and e without amendments um i've been listening to people speaking today people who work in our county in behavioral health and mental health services um the call center the incredible needs that we have and we have limited money we have limited tax dollars our next speaker is annalisa louise please accept the unmute to begin hi my name is annalisa louise i'm with young women's freedom center and i am a local voter who lives and works in district two I'm in support of the Care First Jail Never Coalition, and I'm calling on Supervisor Lee to reconsider your IVO on items 11, 12, and 13 on building a new jail from January 25th, 2022, per parliamentary procedures. The county needs to look at the proposals coming out of the ATI work groups to see what incarceration and mental health facilities would look like in terms of scope, number, scale, 
uh, and services. Additionally, the Attorney General's investigation of the Sheriff's management of the jail could greatly inform the county in determining what an accountable and transparent framework for justice-involved individuals should be. Again, I'm calling on Supervisor Lee to consider the completion of the Alternatives to Incarceration Work Plan and the Attorney General's investigation of the Sheriff's to recall your IVO and build uh, to build a maximum security jail. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sam. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hi, my name is Sam. I am a firefighter for the city of San Jose. I've been serving my local community since 2008. I grew up in San Jose. I have an approved religious exemption. Um, I am unable to work. I'm about to lose my livelihood. Um, along with a lot of my brothers and sisters in the fire service and a lot of people in the healthcare industry as well. And I'm here to ask you to look at reality and not just Fauci's opinion. If you look at, I have plenty of tapes of Fauci talking about the AIDS pandemic and or epidemic and pretty much everything you said about transmissibility and everything you said about AIDS at the time was wrong. Just like, <clears throat> excuse me, just like here today, because if you look at the facts, the virus actually mutated to beat the vaccine, not the way that Fauci was talking about it, like the people that are unvaxxed are going to spread it. All of my friends that have had COVID are vaxxed and boosted. And me personally, I, prote I protect myself with a mask and distance, and I haven't had COVID this whole time. Our next speaker is Edward Strine. Please accept the unmute to begin. Edward, can you accept the unmute? I will come back to him. Our next speaker is Crystal Gomez. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Hello, good morning. My name is Crystal Gomez. Um, I work for Santa Clara South County Behavioral Health here in Gilroy. Um, I would like to address the security situation within our department. We do work at a shopping mart or shopping center. We don't have no panic buttons, no loudspeaker. And it's a, we had incidents in the past three years that have been going on. We also are understaffed, so we're venting for ourselves as they want us to remain the with the door open from eight to five and during lunch and would like two people to be on board. So it's very impossible and we're practically renting for ourselves. Um, I would like to address this and we have brought it to our managers and upper management as they have continued to say that we don't have money in the budget, but yet we are still going to build a jail that is not needed at all. So if you can please help us with security, PSO or some type of, um, help within our South, South County Behavioral Health Clinic. Thank you. Our next speaker is A.B. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Hi, I am also a physician at Santa Clara Valley Medical, and I wanted to express concern about the use of corporate medical groups um, to staff the VMC emergency room. Corporations are designed to make a profit, and this is problematic in a county hospital. Deliberate skeletal staffing of physicians maximizes corporate profit and has resulted in prolonged ER wait times, often in excess of eight hours, and unsafe conditions for both patients, nurses, and physicians. We ask that you put patient care before profits and reconsider the use of corporate medical staff groups and make physicians county employees. Our next speaker is Alan Kamara. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hi, good morning, Board of, can you hear me? We can. Hey, good morning, Board of Supervisor. Um, this is Alan Kamara. I'm calling on behalf of the emergency room at Santa Clara Valley Medical. As you've heard some of the physicians speaking up, uh, it is becoming a very, very concerning situation in our ER. Uh, wait time, average wait time in the waiting room is eight to 14 hours. Now imagine if that's your loved one. And why are we having this problem? It's because we have a, a physician group who's staffing the department with skeletal crews and new doc physicians every other month. We are, a we are a level one trauma center. We serve the 10th largest metropolitan city in the United States. We only have 20 25 ED beds. That is scary. We ask that you consider looking into the issue over in the ED and make sure you make a decision and hire this physician as an in-house. We, 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 we support the physician and we support patient care. Thank you. Our next speaker is Monique Gonzalez. Please accept the unmute to begin. 
Mona, can you accept the unmute? There you Hi. go. Hi, my name, my name is Monique Gonzalez. I'm with the Young Women's Freedom Center and I live in local, I, I live in local work, dis, local district three. I am, I'm in support of the Care First Jail Never Coalition and I am calling on Supervisor Lee to reconsider your I vote on items 11, 12 and 13 on building a new jail from 125, 2022 per Particularly procedures, the county needs to look at the proposals coming out of the ATI work groups to see what incarcerations and mental health facilities would look like in terms of scope, number, scale, and services. Additionally, the attorney, attorney general's investigations of sheriff's management of the jail could greatly inform the county in determining what an accountable and transparent framework for justice involved individuals would be. Again, I'm calling on Supervisor Lee to consider the completion of the alternatives of the incarceration work plan and Attorney General's investigation of the sheriff's. Our next speaker is Michael Vergona. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hello, my name is Michael Vergona. Um, I, I do want to speak about the vaccine mandate that has cost me and many of my brothers and sisters their jobs. I'm a firefighter with over 20 years experience and I've currently been pulled off the job disregarding a medical exemption from a medical exemption from my doctor. This health order is out of touch with the current facts about this virus and needs to be reevaluated. I am not a threat to the public. I'm an asset. I've worked through this entire pandemic and now I'm being thrown out on the street. First responders are already overworked and this health order will only exasperate this problem and pull experienced firefighters out of the system. Please have the conversation with Dr. Sarah Cody and help us get back to work and serving the communities that we love. And I yield the rest of my time. Our next speaker is Paul Soto. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Uh, good morning, uh, Board of Supervisors. Um, Malcolm X used two words when he was talking about government officials talking to him. He says, Thank you. he used hoodwinked and bamboo. Can you hear me? Paul, can you hear me? Can you hear me? I, see, I see you're stopping it and can't hear you. His, his mic is still open. Peggy, now we can Hello? hear you. Hello, can you? Hello? We can hear you. Oh, okay, 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 thank you, thank you. Okay, uh, Malcolm X used two words to describe uh, the way that he was treated by government officials, hoodwink and bamboozle. And that's exactly what happened at that meeting when that vote came in and you voted for that jail, uh, Supervisor Otto. I mean, this is, this is, uh, I mean. To, Peggy, you I mean, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, we couldn't hear you if you've been saying anything the last 20 seconds. If you've got Paul now, please start yeah, him over. Mike, I think something is happening with your sound because Paul has been talking and we, and oh. we can hear him and Peggy has not. Thank you, I, I can hear you. Uh, all right, hey, uh, <laughs> you know what? I'll pass on a public comment. I just want to say, you know what, uh, uh, Supervisor Lee, you, you conned the people, you conned us and you need to own up to that. That you conned us, you lied to us, and that you receive your power from the consent of the government. And we didn't give you consent to do what you did. Our next speaker is Rupini Kamat. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hi, I'm Rupini Kamat. I live in Santa Clara County, uh, calling today to ask Supervisor Lee to please rescind his vote for a new jail and support Supervisor Ellenberg's resolution in full. Um, you heard other people on this call talk about how behavioral, behavioral health clinics in Santa Clara County are severely understaffed. Someone else mentioned there are only two in the county. At the same time as this board voted to spend $400 million on a jail that no one wants, run by a sheriff that is currently under attorney general investigation. Uh, it makes it clear that when people on this board say we can do both uh, when it comes to alternatives to incarceration and building jails, it's frankly just not true. And at the end of the day, unless jails are shut down, the carceral system receives priority when it comes to funding and staffing. So please, Adelie, we're asking you to help move this county forward into a more humane future uh, and not backwards. Please recall your vote. 
Our next speaker is Joe A. Please accept the unmute to begin. Joe, can you accept the unmute? There you go. Your mic is open. Hi, can you hear me? You can. Okay, thanks for your time. Uh, my name's Joe. I'm a firefighter with uh, the county. Um, I'm speaking on health of the, or sorry, on behalf of the county health order. I was hoping today if you could speak to uh, Dr. Sarah Cody and uh, try to nail down some benchmark markers or the intent of uh, how long the order is going to last. Uh, is the intent for the Omicron surge or does she have intentions on keeping this thing going? Thank you. Thank you. And Peggy, before you go on to the next person, um, we are going to hear, be hearing about COVID no sooner than one o'clock today. So those individuals who have chosen to speak about it now will not be uh, permitted to speak about it then. Go ahead, Peggy. Our next speaker is telephone ending 000. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Telephone ending 000. Can you accept the unmute? And they are not responding. I will go ahead and come back. Our next speaker is Mackenzie Owens. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Can you guys hear me okay? We yes. can. Okay. <clears throat> Hello, I'm from Students Against Mass Incarceration and I'm also part of the Care for JLS mm -hmm. Coalition. I live in District 3. Supervisor Lee, I urge you, the community urges you, to reconsider your I vote on items 11, 12, 13 for building a new jail. Not only is it crucial to better destigmatize mental health and mental health care, it is imperative to continue to look into non carceral alternatives rather than moving forward with this jail project. Thank you. Our next speaker is James Saunders. Please accept the unmute to begin. James, can you accept the unmute? He is not responding. I will go ahead and go to the next speaker for now, Milan Valentin. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Good morning, can you hear me? We can. Thank you. I'm calling to show my support for the work moving forward to meet our urgent housing needs here in Santa Clara County. The affordable housing and supportive housing developments are proven to prevent and end homelessness. Okay. And are much needed for our underserved communities. Let's keep the work moving forward and support affordable housing here in the County of Santa Clara. We can do it. And are you finished, Milan? Our next speaker is Joe Dossierno. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. And your mic is open, Joe. Joe, your mic is open if you're ready to begin. He is not responding. Um, I will go one back one more time for James Saunders. You can unmute. And he is not responding and that concludes our speakers. Thank you very much, Peggy. I'm not quite sure what uh, <laughs> hiccup my computer had, but I'm glad I'm back with the game. All right, we have now taken public comment. We now move on to item number seven, which is to approve the consent calendar. Anyone wishing to speak on consent items, please go ahead and register now. In the meantime, Peggy, if you'll please read through our previously posted consent calendar update. Uh, we have a request from Vice President Ellenberg and Supervisor Lee to add item number 12 to the consent calendar. Item number 12 is to approve county sponsorship and donation for Rotary International through use of county facilities and in-kind staff support not to exceed $5,000 from the Supervisorial District 2 allocation in the Office of the Clerk of the Board fiscal year 2022-2023 budget 
to support the 2022 Rotary International Promoting Green Transportation Summit. We have a request from President Wasserman to consider item numbers 15 and 16 concurrently. Item number 15 is to consider recommendations relating to the fiscal year 2021-2022 mid-year budget review. And item number 16 is adoption of salary ordinance number NS-5.22.812 relating to compensation of employees, deleting and adding various positions as part of the fiscal year 2021-2022 mid-year budget review. We have a request from President Wasserman to consider item numbers 20 and 21 concurrently. Item number 20 is to approve request for appropriation modification number 70 in the amount of $11,122,040.50, transferring funds from the American Rescue Plan Act funds, increasing the 2013 Measure A sales tax revenue, and transferring funds from the COVID-19 and other economic uncertainty reserve to the Office of the County Executive, the Office of Supportive Housing, and the Public Health Department budgets relating to addition, adding positions to address the COVID-19 pandemic response. Item number 21 is adoption of salary ordinance number NS-5.22.40 relating to compensation of employees, adding various classified and unclassified positions in the Office of the County Executive, Office of Supportive Housing, and the Public Health Department relating to the COVID-19 response. We have a request from administration to hold item number 23 to date uncertain. Item number 23 is to receive report relating to a small business resiliency grant program and the American Rescue Plan Act funds. We have a correction to item number 42 that should read as follows. Item number 42, approve grant agreement with Gardner Health Services relating to providing COVID-19 related services, including testing and vaccinations in an amount not to exceed $283,657 for the period February 8, 2022 through February 28, 2022, that has been reviewed and approved by County Council as to form and legality. We have a request from Supervisor Simidian to hold item number 53 to March 22, 2022. Item number 53 is to approve memorandum of understanding with the Santa Clara County Housing Authority regarding housing opportunities for the period February 8, 2022 through February 8, 2031. And I dropped my paper. Pursuant to Government Code Section 54953, the following is an oral summary of the proposed salary adjustments that are required to be disclosed. NS-20.21.10 was approved on first reading on January 25, 2022, but it will not be finally approved until it is approved for a second reading, which is agendized to occur at today's meeting. NS-20.21.10, item 84, provides for deferred compensation and an automobile allowance for the Director of Finance Agency position. And that concludes the consent calendar update. Thank you very much, Peggy. I appreciate that. Board members, do you have any comments you want to make now? And then we'll turn to the public for their comments. Supervisor Lee. Uh, thank you, President Wasserman. I don't have any changes to the uh, consent calendar, uh, but I do have comments to make on a couple of items, items number 44 and 51. Um, is this a good time for me to make them now? Yes, it is. Thank you. So on item number 44 related to report, on the category expansion for eligible immigrants for our county's new American Fellowship Program. I want to first thank uh, Maribel, Rocio, and Zelica for taking the time to meet with our staff yesterday and agreeing to implement the changes to address some of the concerns I had uh, discussed. I definitely think it's important that we expand our other immigrant categories, include asylees, refugees, UNT visa holders, TPS recipients, and beneficiaries of VAWA, the Violence Against Women's Act, to make sure that it's a more inclusive program. Also think that the success of the, the eligibility criteria expansion hinges on how we're able to expand the number of participants in the program and leaving it as 10 spots for DACA recipients certainly ensure that the original spirit is being maintained. So I want to uh, uh, say that I would support receiving report with the follow direction uh, to the administration, which are one, reserving the 10 spots for the new American Fellowship program for DACA recipients for this year and every year moving forward to ensure that the original spirit is maintained. And two, provide an off-agenda report around what resources and how much funding 
is necessary to increase the number of participants or program so that we could accommodate other immigrant categories as well. For item number 51, I also want to briefly acknowledge that, uh, which is to do with the Orchard Gardens development. And that's the first Measure A affordable development happening in Sunnyvale. It's obviously heartening to see that partnership with the city of Sunnyvale bearing fruit here, but there's obviously much more work to be done relating to housing within the area and Supervisor District 3 in general. And that's all I have, President Wasserman. Thank you. Thank you very much. Supervisor Chavez. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to leave item 54 on consent, but just to make a few comments. This item increases the contract with Amigos de Guadalupe to extend their shelter program or really to expand it, their shelter program for homeless families with um, children. And I wanted again, just to thank Supervisor Ellenberg for her leadership on this. I also just want to say to the staff um, and to uh, the, the um, Amigos staff, um, how much I appreciate how quickly they're working on this and moving so rapidly in the right direction. In addition to the actions that we're taking on the um, expansion of that service, which is with $2 million, we are also taking an action of another a total of $75 million for over 700 units to further address the housing shortage in our county. And I just wanted to share with my colleagues, I had a chance to do some a communication on this yesterday. And one of the women who spoke um, said the following, her name is Cindy Wen, and she lives in uh, Las Casitas. She says, Casitas has been helping me providing tutoring after school for my boys and much more support. I feel like we're a family here and we feel safe here. And that's really what, what we want. And as an opportunity to really help the, this next generation of children thrive and really to stabilize these families. So. I, I, I feel like um, doing the business of the county, we often put things on consent and we have to because the, the calendar is so uh, big. Um, but as we're moving forward, really doing these um, actions that so dramatically impact people's lives, I wanted to just um, take a moment to acknowledge that, uh, say thank you. And you know, as always, we are asking our staff to do more, do it faster, but we do appreciate their work. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Chavez. Vice President Ellenberg. Thank you very much. I, I also really appreciate um, uh, Amigos de Guadalupe for being able to expand this work and to see such good, good outcomes. Uh, Supervisor Wasserman, I would like to suggest that we hear items 20 and 21 concurrently with items uh, 15 and 16 on the, on the mid-year budget. And on item 23, I'm concerned with the administration's proposal to hold this item to a date uncertain. The board voted unanimously to implement a small business grant program. Uh, so we certainly have an obligation to the public as well as to the local small business community to follow through on that commitment. I absolutely understand that there are some concerns regarding scope and structure and management of the program. And my office would be glad to help sort through those. I would like to direct administration to designate appropriate staff to work with my team on those issues, uh, to jointly design a workable funding program using either internal staff or external stakeholders and have staff return to the board with a revised proposal or at the very least a progress report at the March 8th meeting. Okay, I heard that request and we will hear from Dr. Smith after we hear from the public. Any other members? Supervisor Ellenberg, I'm sorry, did I cut you off? You have your hand raised. It did not. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Seeing no other hands raised at this time, I'm going to call on Peggy to uh, allow our speakers, and they'll have two minutes each. Peggy? Our next speaker is Alan Guig. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Hello, and good morning, everyone. My name is Alan Guig, and I am calling in support of consent items 46 to 54 listed on today's consent calendar, which are the items around the Measure A funding approval. Today, I'm speaking in my capacity as the Policy and Advocacy Associate with the Silicon Valley Council of Nonprofits, SVCN. As a nonprofit association, SVCN serves as an alliance of more than 150 different nonprofit organizations, all working to support thriving and equitable communities here across Santa Clara County. Approving the six additional proposed housing developments will create more than 700 new homes, bringing the Measure A total to more than 4,400. 
We strongly believe that funding more supportive and affordable homes is the best way to end and prevent homelessness in our community. And the support of these items are absolutely crucial and some of the best ways to achieve these goals. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Rick Gosalvez. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Good morning. My name is uh, Rick Gosalvez with SB at Home. We are the voice of affordable housing in Silicon Valley. Um, as the prior caller uh, called in, I'm calling to, to thank the Board of Supervisors for their unwavering commitment to lead in the resolution of our shared housing crisis. Um, as we can all see, Measure A is an important housing bond that has already opened 800 doors with thousands more scheduled to support our neighbors in need over the coming months. This is a major accomplishment and approving the proposed six additional housing developments will bring another 700 doors, bringing the total to over 4,400 as was just mentioned. We strongly support these projects as a means for creating tangible housing solutions that accomplish the goals of the community plan to end homelessness a plan that really helps our community members most in need. So I thank you for your leadership because it's making a real difference. I yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jesse Gomez. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hi, good morning. This is Jesse Gomez speaking on behalf of PATH, People Assisting the Homeless in favor of items 46 through 54. Homes in homelessness, by investing in affordable housing today, the county is freeing up new units for people desperate to finally come indoors, as well as more affordable rents across the region. So fewer people are pushed into homelessness. We're glad to see the county make a good use of Measure A dollars and excited to see all these projects built and leased up in the near future. Thank you. See the rest of my time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Robert Stromberg. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Thank you very much. Good morning, supervisors and staff. My name is Bob Stromberg. I work with Destination Home. We're a nonprofit organization working to end and prevent homelessness throughout Santa Clara County. And I just wanted to express our thanks to the board and county staff for your really unwavering commitment to move forward more and more and more new affordable and supportive housing to meet the goals of the community plan to end homelessness. Evidence-based study after evidence-based study show us that one, supportive housing ends homelessness, and two, deeply affordable housing prevents homelessness. Thankfully, the 2016 Measure A housing bond does both. Measure A has and continues to end and prevent homelessness in our community. With more than 800 Measure A funded affordable homes already open and hundreds more opening this year, the housing bond has already provided a safe and stable home for more than 1,600 people. Approving funding today for six additional developments will create more than 700 additional new homes. We encourage your support. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Alex Shore. Please accept the unmute to begin. Good morning, supervisors. This is Alex Shore, Executive Director of Catalyze SV. Sounds like we've got some great comments from groups supporting affordable housing here today, and it's always good to have a chance to talk about these items. Catalyze SV, as you know, scores development projects. Our members live throughout the community and throughout this county as we evaluate development projects. And there are three that came before our members over the last couple of years. If you can believe it, the Santa Clara County Housing Authority project came to us almost four years ago. So we appreciate everything you're doing, Soups and Office of Supportive Housing to speed up the building of these homes. The projects we had a chance to support include First Community Housings Project in San Jose on McAvoy, the Hawthorne Senior Apartments on 15th Street, and the Bellarmino Place Project on Race Street. The Bellarmino project included as a result of Catalyze This V's advocacy, some active ground floor, which we believe will make a, a better neighborhood for not only the residents of the affordable housing project, but the larger community as well. And that's a crucial component to building up public support for affordable housing is community benefits and amenities. We do want to mention that on one of the projects, the Hawthorne Senior Apartments, there did seem to be a restraint on the number of uh, stories that were built, which means the number of homes, and that there was, our members thought, a little extra parking that was needed along 
this transit corridor. So I would always encourage the soups to work with the Office of Supportive Housing and the developer to build as many homes as possible. The only way to solve this crisis is more homes. And when we have land, let's do as much as we can to build as many homes on it as possible. Thank you so much for approving these loans today. Thank you, Alex. Our next speaker is Steve Pinkston. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Good morning, supervisors. My name is Reverend Steve Pinkston of Maranatha Christian Center and the Silicon Valley Faith Collaborative. I'm here this morning to thank you for your previous support and again to encourage you to support Measure A, affordable and supportive housing developments uh, that are before you. Sacred scripture from various religious traditions asked the question, who is my neighbor? Is it only the one that helps me and supports me? Or might it be those who I am able to help and support? Frankly, I want all of those men, women, children, family to be housed and to thrive. Thanks in advance for your support moving forward to meet our urgent housing needs in this valley. God bless. Thank you. Our next speaker is Paul Soto. Please accept the unmute to begin. Paul, can you? Uh, hello, can you hear me? We can. Okay, thank you. Uh, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Oh my God, I can't believe I was on the same call with Bob Stromberg and uh, Alex Shore. I mean, these are two con men that have no business coming to these meetings and acting like they're legitimate. Anyways, with respect to the consent calendar, uh, $11 million is, is being extracted from the American Cares Fund. I have a problem with that because that funding was given to us because Latinos were dying in record numbers on the east side. Okay, they were also they were also uh, the 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 population that had the most COVID infections on the east side. Okay, that's what that money is coming from. If you didn't have that money coming from them, which means that Latinos are the ones that are picking up the bill because we're the ones that, ex that we're the ones that experience the most pain from it, and we're still experiencing that pain. You guys need to know that, you know what, we don't just expect you to come here and administer the business of the city. It's also the morality. There is a moral issue here. This is, there is a moral issue here. And I'm glad that I still have feelings to where I can become morally offended. I can't just be like Supervisor Otto Lee sitting there and just calmly go from one thing to the next. That's a sociopath. That's what that is. That's sociopathic behavior. You don't believe me? Look at Lori Smith's face when you start questioning her. Look at Lori Smith's face when you start questioning her. Then you'll know what a sociopath looks like. And it looked just like Otto Lee's face. So what I'm saying, man, is you have to understand that the decisions that you are making, they have moral implications. The only one that I see on this panel that has an uh, uh, understanding of that is Supervisor Allen Burke. She is the only one. Our next speaker is Angela Rausch. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Hi, I gotta take a breath after that, I'm sorry. So, hi, my name is Angela Rausch. I've been a resident in the Santa Clara County for 17 years. I support consent items 46 through 54, and I support six additional housing developments. I wear a couple different hats in the county. I'm a president of the St. Vincent de Paul Society, which is a church ministry. I'm also a member of the board for Livable Sunnyvale. But I'm gonna speak in my own capacity. In my volunteer ministry work and what I've seen, right now I have a client who's unhoused. I can't say to her we have housing available. Housing is scarce. We need more housing. And like Reverend Pinkston said, who is my neighbor? We're all neighbors, guys. 
So please support this. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Christine Fitzgerald. Please accept the unmute to begin. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Christine Fitzgerald, community advocate for the Silicon Valley Independent Living Center. We would like to thank you all for your efforts and continuing support in increasing affordable, accessible housing for all in the Santa Clara County. As this is a critical time where we need far more units because far more people need to be housed. Like so many here who have spoken before me, we work with people with all different disabilities and many are homeless. The more folks we can help get off of the streets and into accessible, affordable housing that can make their lives far more comfortable, perhaps things can move forward for them in different ways from there. So again, we thank you for your efforts and we look forward to continuing to work with you on these issues. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. Our next speaker is Melissa. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hi, um, my name is Melissa and I just wanna speak on things that I've been hearing. And I just feel, and I know that this land is sacred land and we shouldn't really be building on it like this. We are all neighbors. Whoever is speaking, they're not like my neighbor. They're somewhere far away in a nicer neighborhood neighbor. But we all respect each other. And that's the beautiful part. But we don't need to be building. We don't want to be in one giant facility. There's more housing here ever like weighing up. And there's still like the most homeless I've ever seen. Even back in the day, there wasn't this many housing projects. And there was not homeless people. I don't know where the disconnect is, but you guys got to figure it out. And that concludes our speakers. Thank you very much, Peggy. That concludes our speakers for item number seven, which is the consent calendar, as you heard Peggy read. And um, each of you, I think I heard from each of you, except Supervisor Simidian, on these items. Is there anything else to be said? Otherwise, I'll look for a motion. So moved, Chavez. Second. Thank you. Motion for approval of the consent calendar as printed and as amended verbally and a second by Vice President Ellenberg. Any further discussion? Seeing none, roll call vote, please, Peggy. Supervisor Lee. Yes. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. And President Wasserman. Yes as well. Thank you very much. We're gonna skip item eight as it's to be heard no earlier than one o'clock. Uh, that'll be our report from the Public Health Department, Dr. Cody and company regarding COVID. We move on to item number nine now, which is approved referral to administration and county council to report to the board March 8th relating to staff support. And let me just turn my binder if I may, but I've got to believe that's referral by Supervisor Chavez. Yes, it is. Supervisor Chavez, go right ahead. Yes, thank you so much. And I'm really pleased to be joined by the district attorney today. Uh, this is a referral colleagues that um, will allow us to work throughout the organization and with all of our different partners throughout the county to address the increasing um, the high risk we see of people um, ODing and getting poisoned from fentanyl. Uh, District Attorney Rosen and I have done community meetings to better understand how this uh, problem is showing up in our community. We're really very interested in working together with the administration, County Council, and Bruce. Uh, Bruce, you're part of the reason we're doing this um, so formally because I'd really like you to play a leadership role in a cross-sectoral um, approach to how we address uh, fentanyl. I know we only have the DA for a few moments, so I did want to give um, Jeff a moment to chime in here. Thank you, Mr. DA. Thank you very much, Supervisor Wasserman. Thank you, Supervisor Chavez. Um, I just wanted to add that the fentanyl poisoning and the fentanyl overdose crisis is, is very serious and significant uh, in our county, and that over the last few years, the number of fentanyl poisonings has gone up exponentially and is now more than half of the drug ODs in our, in our county currently. 
uh, and with Supervisor Chavez and, and others, I'm very interested in exploring uh, different ways to decrease the demand for fentanyl and, and what kinds of services we would need to provide or oppor rehabilitative opportunities to provide that, uh, as well as also trying to reduce the supply of this very, very dangerous, very, very uh, addictive drug. So uh, I look forward to serving on this working group and coming up with some suggestions in the next few months about what we can do to address this. Thank you. Thank you, look forward to that info. Supervisor Chavez, anything else? Thank you. Um, colleagues, I just wanted to give one other piece of information. So as I said that um, Jeff and I had had a chance to go out um, and talk to folks, we went to St. James Park and just had a conversation with people who were living there. And we met with um, Fly, the young folks out at Fly. And we met with folks who had lived experience who were part of Destination Homes Lived Experience Board. And one of the stories, there are many that we heard, but one of the stories that I just wanted to lift up is that they, one of that there was a woman there who was telling us that a friend of hers died from an overdose while he was waiting to get into one of our beds. And it's just a reminder of the, the high level of need in the community and the um, re-examination, not just of our mental health services, but really our drug and alcohol services that are really required of us at this time. So with that, I'd like to ask all my colleagues support and, um, and would really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. We'll turn to Supervisor Lee. You're on mute, Otto. Sorry, thank you. Uh, we'll uh, be honored to uh, second this, uh, this motion, certainly. Uh, as uh, many of you know that I have a relative that has uh, died from overdose this past year, uh, fentanyl is certainly one of the most dangerous substance that we are realizing uh, recently in California and definitely in Santa Clara County as well. And I want to first thank uh, uh, Supervisor um, Chavez for leading uh, this effort to bring this uh, working group uh, and looking forward for that to work because I believe it's going to be very complementary to the work of the uh, Santa Clara County Opioid Overdose Prevention Project as well, uh, working together and to specifically to, in this case, to focus on the fentanyl issue. Uh, and uh, the overdose is no longer just a matter of a lot of the traditional drug users. We're hearing that also uh, going to our high schools and even in some middle schools as well is extremely dangerous. And I think this is a, a, a real pandemic that we need to uh, uh, work hard on and thanks for uh, making this uh, work uh, uh, sunshining and looking forward to also the good work from our uh, district attorney, uh, Jeff Rosen, for uh, taking this as a, a priority issue. Thank you. Thank you. And if I may help move this referral along, Supervisor Chavez, did you want to make a motion in favor of your referral? I apologize that I didn't do that. Yes, so, somewhere. Thank you. And Supervisor I'm sorry. Lee. I thought you did, so I'll second it. <laughs> and Supervisor Thank Lee, you wish to second? Yes, definitely. Thank you. Thank you very much. Peggy, if we'll please turn to the speaker we have and give that person two minutes. Our next speaker is Paul Soto. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Uh, thank you, uh, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Um, District Attorney Rosen, there was, uh, this isn't the first time that this happened. There was 24 deaths in the month of August. And I'd like for you to confirm that that there was that many deaths that was happening on the streets, I know because three of those people were my homeboys, three of them, okay? And as long as it was staying in the homeless population, there was no, there was no press. There was a couple of articles that came out and that was it. The story died along with my homeboys. Now, I don't appreciate these issues being politicized. You see, that's, what, that's the sociopathic element of a politician is they take a little girl, just like they did with Polly Class, and they get it and they use it and they politicize the death, they politicize the harm, they politicize the tragedies that are happening in our bodies for political, for political capital and political gain. There was those deaths in the month of August. And I'm asking, please, I need a confirmation on that. Because if that is true, then why wasn't that an issue back then? You see, we're not, you, you guys aren't gonna be getting away with these lies anymore. I'm, I'm tired of being lied to, tired of being bamboozled, tired of being hoodwinked. It's not gonna happen anymore. 
Okay. I, the only one that has responded in like kind, once again, Supervisor Allenberg, where does she go? The source. Judge Manley runs the show. Judge Manley knows what time it is. He knows exactly what is needed. And what has happened in this county is that we had 10 detox beds for over 25 years at Horizon South for a population of 1,700,000 people. Okay. Those deficiencies is what caused that person's death that was waiting for a bed and he couldn't get one because uh, he, he OD'd on the street. There's an infrastructure issue with respect to these houses. And that concludes our speakers. Thank you. With that, I'll turn to our CEO, Dr. Jeff Smith. I have nothing to say on this issue. Okay, gotcha. Thank you very much. Uh, we've got a motion. We have a second. I'll ask for a roll call vote, please. Supervisor Lee. Lee, aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Allenberg. Yes. And President Wasserman. Yes, as well. Thank you. And Dr. Smith, I need to apologize. I did not recognize your hand prior raised. It was not on this issue. Was it on a prior issue during uh, consent? We'll talk to about it off the agenda. No okay. That's fine. All right. That uh, concluded item number nine. We'll now move to item number 10, approving referral to administration. And this one is also Supervisor Chavez. Please go right ahead. Thank you. This referral asks the administration to return with a plan to extend the state's micro business grant program to newer, very small businesses that have been impacted by COVID. The grant excludes companies that started operating after 2031, 219. Unfortunately, what that means is that individuals who were displaced from their jobs during the pandemic and were resourceful and created very small business ventures um, are, are uh, ineligible. So what I'm asking is if the county can, could consider allocating resources to expand the grant program to include newer businesses. And although these grants are small, they're $2,500 uh, to a micro business, they can really be the difference between having the ability to stay open. Um, it, the other thing I would just add is that we have, um, I would ask staff if they could through, through Dr. Smith, confirm the state's um, making resources available. We understood that it appeared that the state was telling folks that they wouldn't be receiving grants until really mid to end of April, um, but that date may have been changed. And I don't know if there's anybody from staff who knows whether or not the state's grant program is in fact going to be moving more quickly. Uh, Glenn Williams can give you an update, Glenn. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, Supervisor Chavez, uh, President Wasserman, members of the board. Uh, I do not have a more recent update, although I've been trying to, uh, from the state of California. They did indicate that it might be as late as April, uh, but I think that was sort of to cover uh, their bases in case the state was delayed. I'm sure that they are trying their best to get the money out, and I would be hopeful that we would have it much earlier than that. But uh, Glenn, are we the, we're the folks who are gonna give the money out, right? So we get the money and then we, we convey it? Uh, sort of, uh, we would be the recipient um, and the fiscal agent for the state of California. We would then in turn uh, disperse the money to the Enterprise Foundation, who is our sub agent, whom we have contracted with to actually make the $2,500 grants. So one thing I would like to ask um, again through Dr. Smith is as the um, expansion is being considered, if we could have um, a check-in on uh, March 8th, that if the state is behind, but we know that money's coming, if we can forward uh, front that resource and then be paid back, if that's possible. Oops, we can't hear you. Back, back, but we, um as you will find out in the mid-year, don't have any money to front. We don't have cash flow to fund even if we're gonna get repaid? Um, I don't wanna preempt the mid-year. Okay, well then what I'll do is I'll put it in just as a referral as part of this referral so that we can get that information back. 
And under, I understand the timing issue you're raising, Dr. Smith. Thank you. Supervisor Chavez, if I'm yes, right. Mr. Williams. Um, through the chair. Uh, it is our intent at this point to disperse the funds in two tranches uh, to do the first as soon as possible and limit that to the first 600 uh, successful applicants. In order to do that and to maintain the rights to that, it will probably take 30 to 45 days for us to process all of those. So we're not anticipating actually making a first check until probably 30 to 45 days out, which may well fit into the timetable uh, that the state is actually funding. I think that, that, my, that reinforces my concern, actually, that it's gonna take that long. And if we know we're getting the money, the state's already promised the money, then if we could just act um, more quickly. So I th thank you for that information, Glenn. And if we could have a report back on um, the 8th would be great. Thank you. That would be my motion. That is your motion of approving the referral and report back. Vice President Ellenberg. I am very happy to second uh, that motion. I'm really supportive of the, the concept and, and eagerly await the report. I'd be interested to see an estimate of the number of qualifying businesses in our county. And if it's all right with the maker of the motion, I'd like the report back um, to include both that estimate and um, uh, some information as much as we have about the demands for these grants because the size is so small. And I just wanna be sure that if we allocate funds that the amount is dependent on demand and should there be unused funds that they can be reallocated to other board priorities. Yes, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Great, thanks so much. We have a motion and a second. We have a couple of speakers. Would you give them two minutes each, please, Peggy? Our next speaker is Gabriel. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Um, good morning, uh, supervisors. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Um, yeah, th this item, uh, uh, among others that you all have put forward, are those types of things that the CSIP Weather Collective has been um, looking for in terms of trying to address a number of different things in the community. Um, you know, again, with, you know, the pandemic and the loss of income, uh, we have been working with our Jobs to Grow program and actually we'll have our first cohorts um, graduating at the end of this month. There's about 40 to 50 of them, both in food service and then also in childcare um, uh, providers, um, learning and teaching them over this past year of, of how to create uh, new businesses so that they could generate some kind of income. Obviously, um, a number of our families didn't have access to the stimulus checks or unemployment. And so we've tried to become creative in, in finding other ways of, of creating that income. So these types of um, uh, small uh, grants and support uh, for these types of uh, situations and families is well needed. And we thank you for, um, again, and hope that you'll uh, make this happen as, uh, as soon as possible, and then also consider uh, continuing it for the next year or so, because again, we, we expect to continue uh, developing uh, uh, trainings uh, for more families to, to learn how to create their businesses. And so again, thank you for all your support. For the, the thank you. Year. Our next speaker is Paul Soto. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Uh, thank you, Gabriel, for your um, for your work that you do for uh, La Gente on the East Side. I like that, uh, that posting that you have with the señoras with their fist up, and uh, and one of them has a baby in her hand. She's got a baby in her hand, and she's still fighting. You know, so I love that. That's my people. That is my people. That is how beautiful we are as a raza, as Chicanos, as Mexicanos, as Salvadorians, Andorians, uh, Guatemalans. This is who we are. Okay, and, and so what I would like to know is how can I assist the businesses that are on Calle Willow? Okay, that's my barrio, that's what I do. Okay, I do anything for Calle Willow. So, if, I, 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 but I know you guys got like certain districts and you guys are switching lines on us and I don't even know what that district is. But the only politician that I trust on this panel is Supervisor Allenberg. And so, so you know, I, I'm kind of in a quandary. So I, I would hope that there's somebody within her office 
that I can get in touch with because I'm going to start getting these business owners, these paleteros, these, and anybody that I'll just get them off the street. I'll get them a business license. It'll be under my name. I want the grant and I'll give it to, I'll give the money to them because we talk a big, a good game with respect to, uh, we talk a good game with respect to uh, equity. And then we do this. We don't take into consideration that that is how equity is applied. The people that have been impacted the most are the people that get the resources. This is what equity looks like. And so I would like to see a little bit of equity with respect to these types of grants to the people that have been most impacted. And that is the Latinos and all the aforementioned people that I just named. Thank you. And that concludes our speakers. Thank you very much. So we had a motion by Chavez with the report with the report back request and the second by Lee. Is that correct? I believe that was Vice President Ellenberg as the seconder. Vice President Ellenberg, thank you. Supervisor Lee, your hand is raised. Yeah, I just want to echo my colleagues that um, the strong support of this program. Uh, I did believe that the earlier program has forgotten about the newer businesses. If anything, the newer small businesses are the ones that need uh, just as much help, if not more. So I'm glad that uh, Supervisor Chavez recognized that and bring this up, uh, up forward. So thank you. I just want to say uh, great program and looking forward, forward to uh, be uh, successful to get the funds as soon as possible to those businesses. Thank you. Thank you for echoing. Let's have a roll call vote now. Supervisor Lee. Yes. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Simidian, yes. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. And President Wasserman. Yes. Thank you very much. We now move on to item 11, a referral by Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. Um, this referral is requesting administration and council return on April 5th with options to authorize the micro enterprise home kitchen uh, operations. And this is known as Mikos in Santa Clara County. Mikos are a type of retail food facility that will allow an individual to operate from home. And this is a wonderful chance to create economic opportunities for small scale home cooking operations, which are primarily operated by by women and people of color and coming out of their homes. Um, in, in fact, in Riverside County, the county adopted the MECO program and operators you know, hit the ground running pretty quickly. Eight other California cities and counties have authorized MECOs as of today. And there's a lot we can learn from other jurisdictions. My referral requests that the administration and council provide options for recommendations to authorize MECOs based on staff analysis of the equity impacts the success of implementation in other counties, options for regulations to address potential health, safety, and or other community issues, and information on the current cottage food permit program and how MECOs can expand opportunities for home cooks. And with that, I would move approval. Thank you. We have a motion to approve. We have a one finger hand raised speaker and Vice President Ellenberg, and then we'll go to our speakers. Thank you so much. I am I'm very glad to second uh, this referral. I, I, um, it really aligns well, well with my top policy priorities, of course, of children and families. These types of businesses, as Supervisor Chavez said, are largely run by women, by, um, by people of color, and by single moms, by immigrants. And I eagerly await a report back from staff. Uh, if it's all right with the maker of the motion, I'd like to add a couple of questions uh, that I'd like the report back to address. Um, uh, four questions specifically. First, uh, what would oversight of the home kitchen look like from a health and safety inspection perspective? Uh, second, do we need one or more additional uh, FTEs in uh, SEPA? to oversee, monitor, and support this work. Three, what kind of costs are expected to be associated with the home kitchen applications and permits and inspection needs? Uh, and I ask that because we need to ensure that we are covering our costs while not pricing out the very micro businesses that we are trying to support and grow. And uh, finally, what safeguards should be in place to ensure that this opportunity is not exploited by larger uh, businesses. That means we'll need to define meal and we'll need to be clear on how we enforce the 30 meals a day cap, uh, among other things that I'm sure I haven't thought of. 
Uh, so Supervisor Chavez, is, do those four questions work for you too? Oh, to absolutely. Include? Thank you for okay. asking them. Okay, fantastic. Thanks so much. I really think this is just a tremendous opportunity to expand opportunities for, um, for people to build wealth and work toward economic freedom in our county. Thank you. I like it. Supervisor Sumidia. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and just so I can keep track, was there a second to the motion somewhere along the yes, way? Yes, there was by Vice President Ellenberg. Thank you. Um, uh, let me ask staff, if I may. Um, I, I approached uh, our county staff, gosh, five, six years ago now, uh, about the challenge that uh, folks in the faith community, our churches and temples, were uh, facing as they tried to prepare meals in you know, what was for many of them a longstanding tradition of uh, providing food to folks in the community. And they had run into uh, the various uh, faith communities we were hearing from had run into uh, obstacles uh, that are related to uh, the legislation that we're now contemplating. Uh, could staff give us some indication as to whether or not uh, opting in to the Revis legislation uh, will mean what it will mean for uh, churches, temples, other community organizations who have kitchens which may not be quote uh, industrial or commercial kitchens, but that might like to opt in uh, in a similar fashion. Staff, can't give you an answer right now, but we'll definitely have it in the report. All right, and uh, let me just uh, confirm with the maker and the seconder that they're okay adding that to the list of uh, official questions if, if there is such a list in, a, in our, um, in the motion in the second. Let me say thank you for that. And the second question, and if it also has to wait, is related to uh, some of the broader, larger questions that Supervisor Ellenberg raised, which is, um, you know, we all know that uh, environmental health does inspections at something like 5,000 food service agencies, restaurants, uh, but also grocery stores, school cafeterias uh, around the county. Uh, every one of those reports is, um, you know, as I understand it, uh, uh, produces a, a numerical score that the report, the score are made available online through our app, SCC Dine Out. Um, do the staff know today whether the same kind of inspections and reports and public display would apply to home uh, facilities as anticipated in the referral and the opt-in? No, we can't give you that information today. Again, right. we'll give it to you. Back. Well, again, with the consent of the maker and the seconder, I do think it's going to be important, and I think this is consistent with Supervisor Allenberg's questions, to, to know that very clearly. Uh, I, I think there's this needle to thread uh, that uh, both uh, Supervisor Chavez and Supervisor Allenberg have spoken to, which is, on the one hand, just so you know it's really me, um, on the one hand, uh, trying to open up some economic opportunity here as described while on the other hand, meeting our obligation to keep people safe uh, from foodborne illness. So uh, if the maker and the second are amenable, I'd just like to very explicitly call out that set of questions. Looks like they're nodding yes. Yes, I think that makes a lot of sense. And we, yeah, I think we're all aligned. Great. Great. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, maker and seconder. Thank you, Peggy. If you'll please turn to our speakers, give them two minutes each. Our next speaker is Paul Soto. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. One of the reasons why I comment on practically every single item that comes up is because there hasn't been an item, there hasn't been an element of life in Santa Clara County, in the city of San Jose, that my life has not been impacted by racism. Not one. From tree canopies to uh, pavement, uh, uh, pavement allocations to uh, businesses, to housing, to especially housing, to schools. I, I mean, it, it's just riddled with it. My, my life has been infected by it. And it made me sick. It made me sick. I was sickened. Uh, 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 Dr. Cody had stated eloquently 
that racism is a serious health issue. I believe her. I'm still waiting for the memo on it, though. And with respect to this is that you, we need to start centering equity. We need to do it now. Why not? Why not start centering equity? Not just using it when we wanted to support a, a particular type of issue. But if there ever was issues where equity must be centered, it's this. Um, I want to thank uh, Supervisor Smithian for bringing up what he brought up with respect to the churches. I'm in contact with uh, I'm in contact with uh, Lighthouse. City of San Jose wants him to pay fifteen thousand dollars for a freaking for a business license to pass out food to help the hungry on the street. Batman is not going to pay one cent, not one penny, okay? Because I'm going to make sure that he does it, okay? And he's also going to have his budget double, triple, and he's going to get a building. Mark my words, because we are, li we are carrying the weight of the inadequacies of this government because this government never addressed racism in all of its tentacled ways in which it manifests within and our Paul, community. Paul, if you can stop for just a second, you'll have 30 seconds remaining. Peggy, if you can get our timer down to 30 seconds, I saw it wasn't working, so I started my own timer. Thank you, we're resetting it now. Thank you, Paul, please continue. Okay, that's cool, because you know what, this happened This happened before, that uh, on the uh, uh, one of my videos on, on the uh, public meetings, my public comment was completely erased. So this is consistent with that practice. And that's cool because you'll never, you will never ever, ever silence the voice of my people because that is whom I speak on behalf of, not me. You're not talking Paul. So you're talking to generations of Chicanos that suffered in this city. Thank you, Paul. Your speaking was recorded. What wasn't happening was our timer wasn't running. So everything is recorded. Next speaker, please, Peggy. Our next speaker is Ernestina Martinez. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Uh, hola, buenos días. Mi nombre es Ernestina Martinez. Uh, para mí me beneficiaría que se aprobara la ley de cocina en casa porque de ese modo podríamos trabajar con más seguridad, obteniendo un permiso, pudiendo ayudar a hacer un algo para poder apoyar a mi familia. Más que nada que hoy con la pandemia varios perdimos nuestros empleos y nos gustaría trabajar con más confianza y poder uh, cuidar al mismo tiempo a nuestros hijos y a nuestras familias, ser un soporte para ellos. If Gracias. Gracias, too. If we could have our translator, please, Peggy. Sure. So thank you very much. My name is Ernestina, Ernestina Martinez, and it I would be very it would be very beneficial for me to, to have this home at work. It would be a permit that would be very helpful, and this would allow me to be a pillar and a support for my family. Many of us lost our jobs during the pandemic. Many of us are were running out of jobs, and this will let us work in a confident way and we will be able to take care of our children and we'll be able to tell, take care of our families and we will be a support for it. So please approve it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rosario. Please continue, okay. Peggy. Our next speaker is Peter Rudick, or Rudock. Please accept the unmute to begin. Good morning, Supervisor. Good morning. My name is Peter Rudock. I'm a volunteer with the Cook Alliance and the County Co-Lead for adoption and implementation of this bill in the county. Uh, and I am a resident of District 5, unincorporated East Cook Gilroy. Cook Alliance has been involved in 626, working with the Micro Enterprise Home Kitchen Operators Association for years. Our predecessor was a sponsor of HP. We've been involved in just about every county uh, imperial work without us, but every other county that has opted in and working with the cooks and working with the health departments and the county supervisors. We have quite a bit of experience. We have been collecting some statistics, some great reports out of two and a half years of Riverside with quite 200. Uh, I'm hoping 
followingly, you'll hear one of their success stories. Which... And Peter, if you can speak louder, please. Sure. We, we have done uh, some research that I understand that people are concerned that problems might exist in Riverside. Almost none have, no food safety issues, two small other correctable issues. We're happy to share those statistics. We are available for during the implementation of this. We do have answers. Uh, I will give one with my remaining time. Strongly encourage the health department to follow Supervisor Simidian's suggestion of an online directory. As San Diego, Riverside, and Santa Barbara have, we think that is a great resource for cooks and eaters to know that they are working with a permitted home cook. Thank you for your time. Peter, thank you, Peter. Peggy, before you continue, I just want to give 30 minutes advance notice to both the board members and all staff. My intention is to manage this meeting so that we break at 12 o'clock for a 45 minute lunch. Peggy, please continue. Our next speaker is Yadav Lozano. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Yadav, can you accept the unmute? She is not responding. I will um, go to the next speaker, which is Diane and Hugh, and I apologize for that pronunciation. Can you accept the unmute? Hi, hi everyone. Um, yeah, thank you for, for having me uh, talk on this. So, uh, hi, uh, Board of Supervisor. My name is Hugh, and uh, with my wife, Yang. We're the uh, co-owner of a pop-up here in Eastside San Jose. Uh, we specialize in Southern Vietnamese food in the Little Saigon area. We've been following uh, AB 626 for a while and the NICO program um, and how it could help food and business entrepreneurs in Santa Clara County. Uh, through our experience, um, we've been doing this sort of you know, legally through the, the process that's given. And our experience is that this would allow sort of a lower barrier of entry uh, for food entrepreneurs and food producer and a pathway to streamline the process for productions and growing of their business and an opportunity to incubate and grow their ideas and customer base in the area. In addition to what we're seeing is that it's able to grow and strengthen our com local community of where we live, but also supporting the local businesses in our community as well. And the most important reason why we get into this business uh, you know, initially is to diversify the, the, lit, the food landscape that's here in Santa Clara County, uh, to be more inclusive than rather than the big box chains that are here that can only be able to afford in this area. And so this would give this sort of flexibility and a chance for small time food producers in the community to grow and giving pretty much a, a chance to support our local community even further. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lee Thomas. Please accept the unmute to begin. Thank you for this opportunity. My name is Lee Thomas, former San Leandro City Council member and county lead for Cook Alliance. Obviously first uh, permitted uh, Miko in Alameda County. And I can tell you since then, it has been widely successful from people in my neighborhood and throughout the city coming to participate and support my business from home. The one thing you can do by opting into this is by supporting black and brown communities, women and immigrants. You have an opportunity to make them sustainable business owners to be able to provide and support for their own families. I can tell you, if you're worried about food safety, how many times have you ever walked into a backyard barbecue of a friend's or neighbor's house? <laughs> Did you ever once consider what they did to prepare the food? I can tell you that Miko's Home Cooks, we are extremely cautious about food safety because we know that if we mess up, it comes back to us and that could be the end of what we're trying to do. Right now, the food starts with the home cook from grocery shopping to prepping, pre preparing, and then handing it off to you. The food is handled with care because they know everything they do is about their home business. This is a right time in our economy as we're rebounding from COVID. This is the right time for you guys to step up, support your communities, support immigrants, support women, support people of color, allow them to become their own business owners, allow them to set the foundation for their future and create a wide range of diversity in your city of food for everyone in your city to support your economy. 
I highly encourage you to do this, opt in, support the people in your county. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Denise Blackman. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Hi, thank you for having me. My name is Denise Blackman and I am the owner operator of Soul Goodness Home Restaurant in Reno Valley, California in Riverside County. I was the first approved restaurant in my city and I, I can't even go into the details on how much this has helped me. I am a single mother, 58 years old. I have a, an autistic son. So my, my work options were zero. I, I lived on alimony and child support and really had no other options to make any other money because of my caregiving issues with my son. So being able to do this, it just, it, it opened up everything for me. I'm able to make some money. I'm able to um, have ends meet and some extra money. Um, I'm very prideful in the, the food that I put out. My, I've had zero complaints on quality. Um, we have no um, issues in the county of anybody getting sick at any of our MECO approved restaurants. Um, the neighbors are all supportive. Um, it just, it just, it changed my life. And I, I can't even, without sounding too dramatic, it, it literally has changed my life. It's given me something um, to, to be prideful of. You know, I, I don't know if anybody knows, but caregiving for special needs adults is very isolating. And you just, you, you kind of, depression, you know, so being able to do something for the people, be a part of my public, it's, it's just great. And I really appreciate you guys having me talk. I am a huge component of this and I hope you guys approve it. Thank you. Thanks, Denise. Our next speaker is Leonard Grudeau. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Hey, good morning, everybody. First, I'd like to say thanks to uh, Peter Ruddick and uh, Cookie Alliance. I've been following this since it first started, way back when it was Josephine. Um, some of you might know what my sister's done, Stephanie Rideau, with the uh, first minority mental health uh, fair in Hellier Park. Um, I've been kind of like a low-key advocate, low-key mentor throughout the community, throughout San Jose, I don't know for how long. I can tell you for a fact that there are very there is a lot of people interested in this. A lot of people don't know about it. I've been patiently waiting uh, since it became, uh, since uh, Brown opted in, got it going. Uh, and uh, the current, the current Newsom, when Newsom redid whatever he had to do, uh, I've been quietly watching, see what's going on. I know the pandemic shut down the county I've been to a couple county meetings. I've stopped by the county offices when uh, my uh, daddy had to do over duty, talked to some of the aides down there, uh, and just trying to get an idea of when you guys were going to, when the supervisor is going to put this on the agenda so we can talk about it. So when it popped up that you guys are going to talk about it to 8th, I just knew I had to be here. Um, it's, it's of need. It's a want, there's a lot of people interested, I can tell you that, I started a Facebook page uh, to go along with Cooking Alliance have done on my own. I think by time uh, you guys get back in, uh, I think the next time we talk about this, I will have uh, more than enough people to say that they are interested in waiting to, for us, to, for Santa Clara County opt into it. Okay, thank you, appreciate it. Thank you, Leonard. We, we have a motion and a second, I'm gonna be in favor. Looks like we have one more speaker, Peggy. Yes, well, you can go back to Yadith Lozano if she's uh -huh. unable to unmute. Yadith, can you accept the unmute? Uh, yes, listen? Yes. Okay, uh, yes, hello, Board of Supervisors. My name is Yadith, and I graduate of Bayou Lotion Inside Grout Program. Uh, si se aprobara esta ley de AB 626, a mí me beneficiaría para poder cocinar comida casera saludable para mi comunidad, ya que yo vivo en el este de San José 
y hay un alto índice de obesidad y alto colesterol en mi comunidad por falta de comida saludable a precios accesibles a mi comunidad. Eso me permitiría tener un trabajo en mi casa mientras puedo estar al pendiente de mis hijas y obtener un ingreso adicional a mi hogar para poder aportar en los gastos de mi casa. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Thank you. Translation, please. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. So if this AB 626 law will be approved, this will have this will have enormous benefit for me because I will be able to cook from home and I will be able to have very healthy food to my community in the in the east side of San Jose. This side specifically is having high levels of obesity and high levels of cholesterol. So, and because we are not able to get healthy food. So this will be, <clears throat> I will be contributing to my community by having healthier food. And also I will have an income for me and it will allow me to work from home to help my children, uh, my, my daughters and to have something additional additional to support my family. And this will be very helpful for me and my expenses. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rosario. That concludes our speakers. We have a motion, we have a second, we have encouragement. Let's take a vote. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yeah. Supervisor Sabidi. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. And President Wasserman. Yes. All right. We're about 20 minutes away from my desired lunch break. Let's turn to our county executive for his report. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the board. Um, you know, I will try to be short today because we have the mid-year coming up, in which I'll talk a lot more. But for this purpose, I would like to notify the public. I know that the board members already know about this, but... Um, we're watching very closely a no bid contract that the administration of the state is entering into with the uh, Kaiser Foundation or Kaiser Health System. Um, this is a contract in order for them to have a privileged contract to take care of Medi-Cal managed care patients. Um, in our county, this contract has been a um, contract between the state and the family health plan, as well as another one between the state and Anthem Blue Cross, because we are a two plan county. Uh, different counties have different arrangements, but having uh, a situation where Kaiser has a privileged first step at a contract without competition will cause significant problems in the Medi-Cal Medicaid medical, economic, and uh, care programs because um, patients will be skimmed off the top, more desirable patients will be skimmed off the top by Kaiser. So we're uh, following this issue closely and I know that CSAC is following it. Supervisor um, Ellenberg might have some more to say about this because of her experience at CSAC. Um, we're following along with uh, CAPH, and we hope to be able to put restrictions on this contract so that we don't end up in a situation where there's a two-tier level of care. Um, other than that, I have nothing else to say. Thank you. Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. Um, and Dr. Smith, thank you for the update. I'm, I'm wondering if this is an item that can be agenda is for the full board so that there's a more formal action that the board can take. And also, um, I think the point you raised, uh, Dr. Smith, about the risks to the, um, to, to one, to patient care and also to the economics um, are so critical that I, th I think it's worth the whole board understanding that so that we can uh, collectively both um, be better advocates, but also be able to explain to the public what the implications of this are. Yes, Supervisor. We would typically go to health and hospital, but if you want us to go straight to the full board, I do think this is an appropriate issue to have the full board weigh in on. Um, so we'll be happy to do that. Thank you. 
Thank you. With the goal of that meeting, roughly Dr. Smith being what? Besides all this, who Brother Chavez just said. Well, I think uh, it's imperative for the board to set policy with regard to the county's approach to this um, no bid contract. Um, we want to make sure that uh, the board has expressed all of its opinions and that we have clear direction as staff from the board as Super. to how we should approach. Great, I appreciate that. Good idea. Thank you very much. Vice President Ellenberg and Supervisor Smithian. Thanks. Uh, the CSAC staff and executive committee are in fact working on coordinating a position of, of opposition. Of course, nothing is ever equally desirable or undesirable to all 58 California counties. There are a couple um, for, for whom this, this may be advantageous. But as that, as that uh, policy analysis becomes available, I will be sure to share it with, with all of my colleagues. And Dr. Smith, I appreciate you bringing it to all of us so we can do some coordinated advocacy. Thanks. Thank you. Supervisor Smithian. Thank you. Uh, I was just going to say, ordinarily, I might say, uh, let's take it through health and hospitals. But I, I think, as everyone is discerning, this is one of those occasions when uh, time may be of the essence if we're going to have any impact. So I think bringing it back sooner rather than later uh, would be good. And while I thought it was implicit in the comments from uh, the county executive, I, I just wanted to say I hope that when it comes, it will be properly agendized and Brown Act compliant for a formal position by our board, should that be helpful. Okay, thanks. And, yep. and actually, that was in my original request, Supervisor Simidian, for exactly that reason. Thank you. All right, so Dr. Smith has heard that. We'll bring it back that way. We don't have any speakers. That concludes Dr. Smith's report. And Dr. Smith, was that clear? We're all on the same page, it seems. Yes, we'll bring it back as soon as we can get a formal report. Um, there's still some lack of clarity at the state level. Thank you very but much. We'll get it back. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Supervisor Smith, your hand is raised. Your hand is lowered. All right. Thank you for that report. Item 14, report from our county council, Mr. Williams. There were no reportable actions taken at the closed session meeting of February 7, 2022, and that concludes my report. All right. Thank you. Board members, we're going to hear... Supervisor Wasserman, you, you have a hand up. You have a public speaker. Member from the public wishing to speak. Thank you. Two minutes, please. Peggy? If I could clarify. Oops, hold on. Peggy, are you speaking or James? I think Mr. Williams is probably going to say what I was about to say, so. Okay, one of you go ahead and say it. Um, it's my understanding that public comment for the CEO and the county council report is taken during public comment, and we don't separately take comments at this time. Correct. That's Thank exactly you. correct. Thank you very much for that reminder. Okay, board members, we're going to take 15 and 16 and 20 and 21 together. When we get back from lunch, we're going to hear from Dr. Cody on the COVID. Is there any item remaining that you feel we can get done in the 10 minutes? Yes. Supervisor, we can't do the mid-year in 10 minutes. Yes. He, he, he didn't say that. He was asking if there was anything else on the agenda that we thought we could do quickly. I would offer item 17. All right, let's hear item 17. Thank you, Supervisor Chavez. Uh, good morning, uh, President Wasserman and Supervisors, uh, Deputy County Executive Keeley. Item 17 is a progress report on uh, the establishment of the Office of Disability Affairs. Uh, the report covers uh, the status of the, the new RFP for uh, outreach and engagement and anti-ableism training, uh, as, as well as the um, recommendations um, around how a uh, timeline for establishing the office. With that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, I appreciate that. Supervisor Chavez. Yes, thank you. I, I wanted to um, just raise a couple of concerns that the community raised, and they they raised concerns about the, the actual scope of the um, RFP and a concern that there was really a lack of understanding on our part about um, 
how we want to approach this whole issue relative to disabilities. I, I do want to just re recommend that, um, or, and maybe you can answer this now, Key. Could you talk just a little bit about the role of the um, the the community in helping both to shape the RFP and then to evaluate the RFP and then to to work with the um, you know whoever wins the RFP. And I'm nervous about slowing it down, but I have you know I just want to be able to make sure I understand how to respond to the community's concerns. Mr. Lee. Uh, thank you, Supervisor Chavez, for that question. Um, the community of stakeholders uh, assisted us in, in several ways. So uh, first, uh, prior to developing the first RFP, uh, we did have conversations with the various stakeholder organizations. Um, from there, that, that identified the different um, sort of potential priority areas. Uh, from there, we did develop the scope of work for the initial RFP, which we released, um, I think that was in October. The intention of that RFP was try to get uh, the community engagement uh, completed sort of um, in advance of the mid-year uh, budget report. Um, that report, um, that RFP, uh, while it yielded a lot of uh, views and interest, um, that RFP, uh, we were not able to um, have a successful proposal um, and the organizations um, that were helping us to develop the RFP and sort of the priorities for the office, several of them, three of the organizations uh, were uh, participants uh, in the review panel and they will continue to be on the review panel um, for the second RFP, which is uh, out now and will close on uh, Friday. Great, thank you. thank you. And I, I know we have some public speakers. So what I want to do is, I, I, colleagues, I want to receive the report, but have a report back on March 8th, just to get an update on the community and engagement component of it that um, Key's already outlined. Okay, so I'm going to take that as a motion to report back on March 8th. I'm now going to turn to Supervisor. Well, may I have a second for that motion? I'll second it. Thank you. Supervisor Lee, you're next, and Supervisor Smidian. Then we'll hear from the members. <clears throat> Thank you, President Wasserman. Uh, so I uh, just a quick question for the administration key. Mm -hmm. um, how confident do you feel like this uh, expedited solicitation on the way will be successful? And uh, do you think it will be on track to the contract execution by late February as stated in the report? Uh, thank you for the question, Supervisor Lee. Um, I, I think we will be successful for several reasons. First, um, um, after the first RFP closed and where we were not successful mm -hmm. in, in executing contract, we reached out to several organizations, specifically the organizations identified in the original referral. And several of them indicated, um, one, their continued interest and willingness to apply for um, one or both aspects of the RFP, which is the outreach engagement and the training. Um, and then two, uh, the organizations um, uh, identified that uh, really the, they, they did not respond to the RFP initially, mainly for bandwidth and timing issues. Uh, you may recall that we, we had to sort of issue this, you know, late fall sort of during the winter uh, January timeframe and there was a lot going on at that time. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Simidian. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I, um, I wanted to just touch on two issues briefly. One is I wanted to say I was uh, to staff and uh, share with colleagues, I was pleased to see uh, uh, what I'll call a preliminary reference to uh, staff's efforts to identify funding going forward to continue our annual support of $10 million a year for uh, housing that serves uh, the IDD, the uh, Intellectually and Developmentally Disabled Community. I, uh, I know we will be making formal decisions about that at some point in the future, uh, but it, um, I think, has um, been very helpful in filling a very uh, important and uh, specific need for a particular kind of housing, affordable housing response. So I just, I, I sort of wanted to say, glad to see it, hope to see it again in the future. and. Uh, 
Then the second piece is we, um, we have not had for a while now uh, a round of funding for um, all-inclusive playground spaces, but I am inclined to bring uh, one more measure back. And I, um, I, I want to say, I think, frankly, the par Parks Department was right to caution us the last time that the relatively short timeline we had uh, created some challenges. It meant that there weren't as many uh, folks who were um, uh, able or uh, to prepare a plan or a proposal on a timely basis. It also meant that uh, there sort of had to be a hurry up drill in terms of review uh, of those plans. We were trying, I think, to accommodate uh, the understandable desire of one of our colleagues, Supervisor Yeager, to uh, be in the mix on that conversation, but I, I'll just, I'm sort of previewing for staff and for colleagues today, the fact that I think another round would be um, desirable, but with a little bit more time so we could uh, do it in a little more methodical way, and uh, hopefully engage an even wider set of uh, interested proponents. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I, of course, will support the motion in a moment. Thank you. We have some echoing from Supervisor Lee, and we have some previewing by Supervisor Simidian. We are a forward thinking board. All right, with that, let's turn to our speakers, please. Peggy. Our next speaker is Paul Soto. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Yes. Uh, yes, yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Um, sometimes President Wasserman, um, because of technology, the phones will, will turn off and, and like they, they'll recycle, I, I don't know how to explain it, but when that happens, the hand comes down. And so I put my hand up on the other item and it, it was like skipped over. So sometimes when somebody puts their hand up later, sometimes it's because of that, we're dealing with the technology. And I think that we have to be able to have a, uh, at least have some kind of assumption that that is the case. You know, and, and so if we're going to use democ if we're going to use technology in order to administer democracy, sometimes there has to be those allowances for those types of, of, of issues. I just wanted to bring that to your attention because like I said, every single item I'm on because of the way that my ancestors and that my elders have been treated in the city and this county. And that just has to be acknowledged. It has to be acknowledged and it has to be uh, censured within the context of every single one of these conversations, especially with regard to the one that, that was passed up on with regard to, I, I wanna thank uh, uh, Dr. Smith for, for, for him bringing that issue. That is a serious issue with respect to the commodification of our medical systems. And the fact that uh, Governor Newsom got $35 million in campaign funds from Kaiser and then they got the audacity to come to these cities and start doing something like that, these counties. And, and, and this, is, this is the reason why men like him are so important in positions like that. We expect him to do that. That's, what, that's why he's hired to do, be there, is that not only that, but he is watching out for all of these elements because he knows that it's gonna compromise the integrity of the role that he fills within the capacity of county business. So I just wanna extend that thank you. Thank you for extending the courtesy. Let me comment on that. Our next speaker is Michelle Mashburn. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hi, everybody. Um, well, I, you know, the forward direction is appreciated on this initiative. I would like to again state that there is a lack of- Michelle, can you please get closer to your microphone? Let me shift my headset, sorry. There you go. Go right ahead. Okay, uh, could we reset the timer, please? Sure. Thank you. While I appreciate, while the forward direction is appreciated on this initiative, I would like to again state that there's a lack of understanding and too many are unconscious of the basic rights and the various nuances of the experiences of disabled residents, including the inadequate services and supports we experience. We have an ongoing struggle with the difference between the Americans with Dif Disabilities Act definition of disability and the equity for disabled residents of this county that we're trying to put forward with this initiative. 
The county is working on a very transformative process that is setting a standard that will help disabled people in, in our county as well as other counties and states. We are trying, not trying to pathologize people with disabilities through talking about impairments and deficits of their bodies and minds. We are trying to improve services and advance equity for all residents in this county. Through a process of universal design and disability inclusive development, no one gets left behind. At a time when disabled people are being killed by the policy decisions around this pandemic, and yes, even in this county, we are getting killed by these decisions. We need representation in the county that affords us the human rights put forward by the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and the basic human rights we expect for all residents in Santa Clara County, including immigrants, black, Latina, indigenous, and other societally marginalized groups. The work, this work is appreciated um, and we will make it to the office, to where the office is created um, and not the misguided efforts of county staff. Hopefully we'll stop. Uh, we thank also Hillary Armstrong in the office, county executive office and others who are continuing the work with the disability community stakeholders to advance this office in an equitable and inclusive manner. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Molly M. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Good morning. My name is Molly McLeod. And first of all, I'd like to again thank Supervisor Chavez for moving the original referral forward and the unanimous vote of the Board of Supervisors. And for me, it comes down to something that's really simple um, that could be found in this children's book called We Move Together by Kelly Fritz, Anne McGuire, and Eduardo Trejos. I hope that all of you will uh, add it to your collection. And there's a wonderful free um, educational learning approach because the whole idea of nobody being left behind, of the acknowledgement that um, it can be hard to find places where we can all move together. Um, some places weren't designed to welcome everyone and that means that some of us get left out, and that is ableism. It's a form of discrimination that wrongly considers only some bodies and minds and behaviors to be normal, worthy, and valuable. It is um, something that requires accessibility practices. That's something that we strive for and can get better and better at over time. And the foundation of this, this uh, lived experience that people with disabilities have, that, that mine is growing by being part of a, a cross-disability uh, collaboration. Don't see that depth in the reports um, as yet, but that's again why this commitment is going forward and why it does need to be centered and led by uh, disability-led organizations. So um, I think we're getting closer on the mark, but really go back to go back to some of the most foundational things. Read, we move together. Remember why our hearts are in this work um, and why it's so very important that we uh, do this together. Thanks. Our next speaker is Mohammed. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Mohammed, it looks like your mic is open. Can you? Yeah, one more call, Mohammed. It looks like your mic is open. Are you able to speak? He is not coming through, and that concludes our speakers. Thank you very much. I'll now go back. This was a um, received report, but the action was to report back by Supervisor Chavez that was seconded by Lee. With that, I'll ask for a roll call vote. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yeah. Supervisor Semidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. And President Wasserman. Yes, as well. Board members, a 45 minute break would take us to 1250. I don't see anything else that we can handle in 10 minutes. This way we can have the doctors actually start the report on time. So if there is no objection, I suggest that we break until a one o'clock start time. Is that agreeable to everyone? Thank you. All righty. Thank you all very much. We'll see you and staff at one o'clock. Recording stopped.
Peggy, can you hear me? I sure can. Is there something I can help you with? No, I was just checking, uh, making sure all my you. connections work. Hi, Peggy, it's Mike. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Recording in progress. Peggy, all I, I don't see Supervisor Smitty. One moment and I will, he is not currently in the room. There's Supervisor Lee, or at least the shadow of Supervisor Lee. There's Supervisor Lee. In just a moment, when Supervisor Smidian shows up, Peggy, if you'll take a roll call vote again, so we confirm we, who we have here, and then we'll be starting with item number eight. There's Supervisor Smidian. Go right ahead, Peggy. Supervisor Lee. Lee present. Supervisor Chavez. You are muted. Thank you, Supervisor Smidian. Here. Vice President Nellenberg. I'm here. And President Wasserman. There as well. Thank you very much, Peggy. Now we're back to item eight with a time certain no earlier than 1 p.m. It is 1 p.m. So we always kick off this item with our public health officer, Dr. Sarah Cody. Thank you, President Wasserman and members of the board. I will present to you today along with Dr. Kamal. Um, we'll first share with you uh, update as always on our infection trends as well as what we're seeing in hospitalizations and deaths. And then a big picture view of how we've done uh, throughout the pandemic uh, with mortality rates. And then as always, Dr. Samal, Kamal will provide an update on testing vaccination 
and the status of our hospitals and healthcare systems. So here is our epidemic curve throughout the pandemic to give us a sense of where we are. We are still um, in the midst of the Omicron wave, as you can see there on the far right. And we're now a bit more than halfway down uh, from our peak, almost uh, two very challenging months uh, into the Omicron wave. The next slide shows you uh, the same epidemic curve just broken out by the different phases of the pandemic um, by variant. Um, and I thought this was interesting. I just want to highlight two things. Um, one is last winter when we had a very difficult surge. That was the Epsilon variant was dominant. It lasted almost five months. And you can see, of course, in the Omicron wave, um, it went up so fast. Um, and so we're already, as I mentioned, on the way down, but it's really just been um, just a bit over two months since the very first detection of Omicron in Santa Clara County. The next slide, uh, a quick review of a very important surveillance system uh, that we use to complement the case surveillance that I just showed you in that epidemic curve. This is our wastewater surveillance. We uh, have looked back and over time, it's tracked very well with our case data. And as you know, there's a delay in reporting of cases, not so in the detection of SARS-CoV-2 in wastewater. So the wastewater surveillance data generally can uh, show us the trend direction where we're going about five days ahead of the case data. And you can see here with the wastewater surveillance as well that um, the concentrations uh, are continuing to decline. The next slide uh, showing you case rates by vaccination status in the county. And I wanted to highlight that uh, I, this is our, these are the case rates um, for residents age 12 and up, different than on our dashboard when you see this data ages five and up. And that's because I want to show you in detail what a difference not only vaccination makes, but booster, uh, the, the, the impact of boosters on, um, on our case rates. So here, just big picture, of course, you can see that among the unvaccinated, the case rates are significantly higher, dramatically higher than in any other groups. I will say that the case rates for the unvaccinated are based in part on population estimates and the numerator is pretty small. So that's a, a little bit of an unstable uh, rate, but overall, the big picture is it's really high. <laughs> and the next slide, we're just gonna zoom in on that lower right-hand corner to look at and understand how the infection rates, um, the case rates differ by booster status and just focus really on the top line, which is green, which is people who are eligible to be boosted, but haven't been boosted yet. And then the bottom line, which is orange, which is the case rate among those are boosted. The blue line in between is um, really a combination of eligible, anyone who's been vaccinated any which way. But the, 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 what I want you to notice is while the green and the orange lines are coming together, they're still far apart. So, um, not only does getting vaccinated protect you, reduce your chance of getting infected, but being boosted reduces your chance even further. And that's why one of the many reasons uh, why it is so important. The next slide uh, shows both our trends in um, the seven day average rolling case counts as well as hospitalizations over time. And later, Dr. Kamal will detail where we are with these hospitalizations. But I, what I wanted to do is just share this graph to show you how different the Omicron wave looks as compared to previous waves. So if you can see during last winter, um, uh, the hospitalizations did lag, uh, lag the cases, but the waves generally track together. Um, and then, of course, the Delta wave, we had our very high vaccination rates, but we didn't get have widespread boosting. And you can also see the cases rise. And then a bit later, the hospitalization rise. And those curves look about the same. Now, when you look uh, 
at the Omicron wave, you can see, wow, they are really different. So the case wave looks like an upside down icicle, mm -hmm. um, but the hospitalization wave is um, uh, much lower. Uh, it's plateaued and it's a different shape. So, so very, very, very different. And this is what we've been talking about since the Omicron wave, which is that yes, in general, you have milder illness, but the sheer number of cases um, still has had quite a significant impact uh, on our hospitals and our healthcare delivery system. These are uh, the hospitalization rates by vaccination status for adults, for those um, 18 and up. And again, you can see very dramatically that the hospitalization rates among those who are vaccinated, and this is anyone who's vaccinated, the initial series, the boosted, the eligible for booster, but not yet boosted, it's everybody all together. Those rates are quite a bit lower, dramatically lower than the hospitalization rates among those who are not vaccinated at all. So um, the our high vaccination rates, um, I believe are one of the very important factors that has protected our hospitals during this surge. And then finally, um, this is the epidemic curve showing our deaths. This is just through Friday, February 4th. As you may remember, deaths are reported out just once a week on Fridays. And um, you can see that we are beginning to see a little surge in deaths from the Omicron surge. Of course, not nearly as dramatic as what we experienced last winter, um, but nevertheless, we are seeing a small surge in Omicron deaths uh, following our surge in cases and in hospitalizations. So to put those deaths into context, uh, I, I'm going to share some data, but before I do that, I wanted to introduce this map of economic regions. In the last, the last time I presented on COVID, Supervisor Simidian asked to see uh, some more data on mortality rates in our county and, and how do we compare. So these are uh, I'm going to show you data by economic regions, and you can see there we are in the Bay Area region, um, uh, which is several counties right there in the middle. So the next slide uh, shows you the COVID death rates um, and, the, and the vaccination rates and comparing the different regions with the state as a whole and um, the country as a whole. These are data since July 1st of 2021, because as of that date, we'd had vaccinations available for about six months and um, many, but not all uh, were uh, eligible for vaccination at that, at that point. So that's the time period that we're looking at. And what you can see is that you, you'll see a gradient where in general, the higher the percent of the population vaccinated, the lower uh, the death rate. And um, the Bay Area there is on the bottom right with the highest vaccination rates of any of the regions in the state, um, as well as the lowest mortality rate of any region in the state. And Santa Clara County uh, is performing well, even by Bay Area standards. So the next three slides will show you how this translates uh, into um, the number of deaths. So we're going to look at three different time periods, um, both over the course of the whole pandemic, as well as before vaccines and after vaccines. And what we did is we took the death rate in our county and then the death rate in the state and the nation during that same time period and applied it to see what would be the excess deaths we might have had with the statewide rate or the national rate. So you can see here over the course of the whole pandemic, if we had had the statewide rate, we would have had over 3,900 deaths rather than 2,050. And if we had had the, the death rate that experienced across the country as a whole, we would have had uh, over 5,200 deaths. So that's how we've performed over the course of the whole pandemic. Then um, just looking at that period before we had vaccines available, which was, which was the, the year of 2020, 
2020, um, uh, the overall performance uh, is about the same as far as the magnitude difference. And you can see there the number of deaths prevented even before the availability of vaccines in our county. And then finally, the last slide, this shows the period of time um, after vaccines were available. Um, the 1st of July, 2021 through last Friday, our most updated death count. And again, you can see that collectively, this, this combination uh, that we've had available um, and, uh, and embraced by our community, um, all these different protective layers, vaccines being uh, incredibly important, uh, have saved lives in our county. I think this is the, just the testament to the collective work and the commitment of our public uh, to protecting, uh, protecting each other. And now I will turn things over to Dr. Kamal, who will provide a testing update. Thank Good you. afternoon, everybody, and thank you, Dr. Cody. So in terms of testing, we have seen a decline in our testing rate, uh, down from a peak of more than 40,000 tests every day, now down to about half that amount. In addition, we have seen our positivity rate come down, which peaked at around 17%. And um, since the slide was prepared, it's further improved, and our positivity rate as of this morning was 9.4%. And as a reminder, this does not count the antigen test that people are doing at home. This represents the PCR testing uh, largely that's reported by providers in our county. The turnaround time has also improved and it's now down to just over 24 hours across the county. Next slide, please. This shows the testing by healthcare system. And as usual, the county healthcare system continues to lead in testing volume. We did see, however, that our healthcare partners did have an uh, uptick in testing during the peak of the Omicron surge. Next slide. In addition to all this testing, just want to highlight our antigen test distribution. As you all know, that in addition to PCR testing, antigen testing is increasingly used um, in the community. In the past two weeks, the county has distributed more than 650,000 antigen tests. And these tests were distributed to some of the most vulnerable and highly impacted areas in our county and a very diverse uh, number of distribution sites, as you can see listed here, to ensure coverage for the entire county. We have additional distributions planned in the upcoming weeks. And these uh, tests, uh, kits are accompanied by instruction, instructions in four languages. And also when we have them available, we go up N95 masks to people along with these test kits. Next slide. In terms of vaccination, we have also seen a decline in demand for uh, vaccinations in the past uh, month or so. However, we are still seeing a fair number of first doses shown in blue um, on this uh, graph over here which largely reflects the vaccine mandate that's uh, encouraging people to get vaccinated. Next slide. In terms of providers, we've seen no big differences, uh, but the demand has gone down across the board and we continue to work with the health systems to try to match the demand that they have among their patients. Next slide. Um, in terms of vaccine update, uh, Moderna has joined Pfizer in having full FDA approval uh, for product uh, for adults. Next slide. Uh, we also have um, potentially a new group of uh, individuals eligible for vaccination, and this is six month to four year old children. The FDA is planning to meet on February 15th, which will be followed by the CDC meeting potentially the following week with recommendations to come soon thereafter. Uh, we anticipate a new formulation of three micrograms and a different dosing schedule than we're currently using for um, adults. Uh, we estimate that there's about 100,000 kids in this age group countywide. And as always, our mass vaccination sites will be ready to go within 24 hours of the recommendation being issued by CDC and are planning for a peak capacity of up to 14,000 kids per week at our mass vaccination sites. There are multiple planning issues involved with this. Obviously, kids as young as six months are not just small adults. We're going to have up to six different products at each site, so making sure we have good safety protocols to make sure 
uh, the right um, uh, dose is delivered to each client. We also have started training with tie injections and different needle lengths for the smaller children and have been installing diaper changing stations throughout and doing many other uh, changes to make our sites kid friendly. Once again, we are not going to go live with this until the CDC recommendations are out, but we are planning ahead to be able to respond as needed. Next slide. In terms of hospitals, our hospitalizations peaked at a bit about 500, which was below last year's peak of greater than 700. Largely, this was due to a higher vaccination rate and decreased virulence of the virus. If we zoom in on just the last month uh, on the next slide, we can see that our hospitalizations have sort of plateaued a bit. Um, there may be a very gentle, slow decrease, but not as fast as our case rate. And this represents perhaps the persisting uh, PCR positivity of patients who were infected with COVID over the last uh, two months or so, but we're con continuing to monitor this um, very closely. And finally, next slide, um, our ED visits are also returning now to a much more normal level of about 1,500 visits per day after being uh, well in excess of 2,000 visits a day for the um, early part of the year and the end of December. Um, and so we're keeping a close eye on that as well. And with that, I will end and open it up for questions. Thank you, Dr. Kamal, I appreciate that. I think we'll turn to our public first, if that's all right with fellow supervisors. Looks all right. Peggy, will you go ahead and give them two minutes each? Our first speaker is Colin Connors. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. You will have two minutes. Can you hear me? You can. All right. Good afternoon, Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors. Um, a little known study was released last week by a little known university called John Hopkins. This study was conducted across 27 countries and concluded that lockdowns reduced COVID deaths by only 0.2% and shelter in place reduced COVID deaths by a whopping 2.9%. A direct quote from the study says, we find no evidence that lockdowns, school closures, border closures and limiting gatherings had a noticeable effect on COVID-19 mortality. But what they did find was that lockdowns increased depression drug use, domestic abuse, drug overdose, death from deferred medical treatment, destroyed businesses and record unemployment. Congrats, you all. You should all up your update your resume with these fine, fine accolades. Get a clue, people. Your little power trip is over. It is time for you and Nurse Ratchet to roll back all mandates and give the people of Santa Clara their life and their liberty back. Thank you. Our next speaker is Barry Arada. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Good afternoon, Board of Supervisors. I'm Barry Arada. I'm a San Jose firefighter, just shy of 16 years. I was born and raised in Santa Clara County. I speak to you today, and I hope Dr. Sarah Cody, you're listening loud and clear, as well as Dr. Ahmad Kamal, um, Supervisor Chavez, I hope you're listening to as um, a big labor affiliate in this county. And I know that you support San Jose Fire and you support all firefighters. I currently am on unpaid leave because my medical or religious exemption was removed based on Dr. Sarah Cody's irrational public health order attacking all first responders, health care employees in this county, the only county in California who is requiring this. We are facing losing our homes, losing our livelihoods, and it's completely unacceptable. Here's some facts for you, Dr. Cody. Through FOIA requests in the city of San Jose from August until January 11th, the San Jose Fire Department had a total of 160 positive cases, 147 of them were with the vaccinated firefighters, 13 were with the unvaccinated firefighters. Not a single case is documented that we spread this to the community. San Jose PD, same request. 229 positive cases, 182 with the vaccinated, 28 with the unvaccinated. The vaccines are not working to the 100% efficacy that you say they do. You're locking us down. You're throwing away our careers. We have saved countless lives in our careers. We are here to put out fires on the front lines and save people. We have seen death and destruction. I myself was a VTA shooting respondent. 
one of the first crews in. And I'm no longer good enough to do this because your irrational order is here. Rescind it now. Our next speaker is Lisa. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. And your mic is open, Lisa. Can you hear me? We can. So I just want to say to all the firemen, all the policemen, everybody who is speaking out, may God bless them. May God bless you and your souls because all this stuff that you're doing, you already know is wrong. They're giving you information, letting you guys know that all this stuff, all these things that you guys are doing isn't working and it's not right. I have family, all kinds of family who had to get the shot. Do you wanna know how many of them got sick again? At least five, six, seven of them that I know who have gotten the shot, got sick not once, but twice, and twice my sister. Do you wanna know if I have the shot? I don't. Do you wanna know how many times I got sick? Once, when it first came out, and then I was immune to it. So I pray for all your souls. I pray that God has mercy on him, because I know my God is good, and I know damn well that he is protecting all of us. And I wish to God, when you guys go to sleep, that you have visions and dreams of what this world is going to come to because of all of you people. And I'm not talking like people separating. I'm just talking about the way you guys are running this world, this country. We were founded on God and, and freedom. And now you're taking all our rights away? For what? For money? Money, money, money. That's all you guys want. And doctors, you guys, I feel so bad for you because you took an oath. May God have mercy on your soul, Sarah. Our next speaker is Alex Bruni. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hi. On 7-21-21, the CDC issued a lab alert for PCR testing requiring testing to differentiate between the flu and COVID. I'm asking, is that compliance happening here in Santa Clara County? Also, subjecting the non-vaccinated to mandatory testing has led to skewed data. The vaccinated are allowed to work and come and go with little suspicion for infection. As multiple medical journals have disclosed, we know there is an equal chance of infection. This is apparent when looking at the results from a Freedom of Information Act request that Barry just spoke to. From data from August until January 11th of this year, the results fly in the face of what our health department is saying publicly. I will reiterate, SJPD had 229 COVID positives. Only 28 of those were in the unvaccinated. 182 of those were in the vaccinated. The fire department had 160 COVID positives. 147 of those were vaccinated. 13 were unvaccinated. That means the vaccinated would have to show obvious symptoms to get tested versus the asymptomatic two time a week testing of the unvaccinated in San Jose. San Jose has placed 38 firefighters on unpaid leave, 50 new non-booster compliant are on paid leave. San Jose will be placing all city employees on unpaid leave on February 11th. This booster policy and vaccination policy is irrational and not based in any actual real founded data. We can see by a Freedom of Information Act request it distinctly points out that the vaccinated are carrying at a much higher rate. And if we were to subject them to the same testing requirements of two times per week, we would probably see even more numbers. Our next speaker is Dan Kiernan. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. the opportunity to speak. Um, I work in the tech sector for an employer that has over 100 employees. So we were going to be subjected to the vaccine mandate, but thanks to the Supreme Court, my cooler heads prevailed and we have backed away from that. I'm very thankful for this, but my neighbor down the street is a firefighter. He feels the same way I do and has the same 
apprehensions about taking the vaccine. Unfortunately, he is required to do so and is very upset. His job to me is way more important than me as a, a marketing person, and he's saving people's lives. I have no idea why the mandates are still in existence for people such as firefighters, for policemen and others who are doing amazing service to our citizens of Santa Clara County. It's time to end mandates for those people who are doing amazing work, who are putting their lives on the line and who are feeling now so disillusioned and, and so disenfranchised by this mandate. We are citizens. You give us the right to vote after 18. We, are, we know the education. We know what to do. We are all good citizens. Please let us make our own decisions about our personal health. Mandating this to 18 year old and up, people that are voting, people that have the right to make decisions about their own personal health and you're telling us what to do and treating us like a bunch of kids. I have teenagers and I make sure that I give them clear rules, but I also give them um, the ability to make decisions as they've gotten older. It seems like you've not followed that same parenting style. Please let the citizens of Santa Clara County make decisions about their own personal health and stop these mandates. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mike Rogers. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Good afternoon. Um, I wanted to talk briefly on the data presented by the county. As is pointed out for weeks and months, the case count data showing the differentials uh, doesn't show the underlying differential test rate. So there's selection bias in the data and some of the conclusions that have been presented repeatedly by the county are inconsistent with other geographies, uh, but also um, not necessarily supported by the data as presented in that incomplete form. But uh, mainly I wanted to talk about um, uh, immunities of, of prior infections. There are a lot of papers, there's over 100 papers published on this topic based on real empirical results. Uh, the expected results based on analysis of the situation by an influential um, epidemiologist and uh, infectious disease doctors would expect that natural immunity would be as high or higher just based on the microbiology of what the uh, virus presents as a full genomic representation of that microbiology by a molecular level versus a single protein in the mRNA vaccines. The data is very consistent in recent months and weeks from Europe and Denmark and uh, Israel, which have very high vaccination rates, but much better high quality data showing that the natural immunity of previous infection is more durable, especially against the new infections than uh, any of the vaccines, any of the, of the boosters. In fact, recent data um, from that part of the world shows that the booster has very quickly declining efficacy against new infections on the order of 50% in only a few weeks and as much as not greater than 90% over eight weeks. So the requirements of a booster, you have to ask what's the point, especially when you don't even consider whether people have had previous infections. Um, thanks for your time. Our next speaker is Dr. Henry Arnold. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hello, thank you for allowing us to address the council. Um, making vaccines available to people is okay, but mandating vaccines on people who've made their own free choice not to be vaccinated, it's trampling the liberties of a free people. The County of Santa Clara has no right to strong arm people into deciding between their jobs and livelihood and getting the jab. Um, the number of cases in, of COVID-19 in California has plunged by 75% in the last three weeks. Uh, this spike is clearly getting over. Um, why should you continue to trample people's rights and you should stop this, these vaccine mandates? Thank you. Peggy, I'm going to interrupt for just a minute. After we set the time, we had 15 people um, jump in, which of course would have changed the time. We have people the next 15 people will be under the two minutes, and then the ones after that will be under the one minute. Um, if I can clarify, do you want the first 15, which includes the people that have already spoken, to have two minutes and then one minute after that, or the next 15 to have two minutes? No, the first 15 should be two minutes, and then after that should be one. If I knew there were going to be this many people jumping in after we set the time, 
the appropriate thing to be fair to everyone would have been one minute. But we told these people two minutes, so the first 15 should get two minutes. Thank you for clarifying. Our next speaker is April List. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Hello. So I feel like a lot of the things that are being said um, don't have a lot to do with what's really going on. And we are aware of what's really going on. And that is that there is an overreach of power in an effort to implement a totalitarian agenda. And the doctor who spoke before me is exactly right that you are trampling the constitutional rights and freedoms of a people who refuse to be enslaved to big governments. So this is what this is really about. And we all know it, we're all on to you. This has nothing to do with health. It has to do with the totalitarian big brother government agenda. And we will not comply. We will not comply. We are stronger, we are braver. This is absolutely ridiculous and completely out of hand. The data everywhere is continually conflicting. And so we can't really trust the data that's coming out that you guys are presenting because there's so much dishonesty, there's so much corruption everywhere. But we do know one thing, and that is that we are protected by the Constitution, our rights to freedom, our rights to choose are protected by the Constitution. The consistencies are out of, the inconsistency is just out of control. A person can decide whether or not they're a boy or a girl. A person can decide whether or not to abort the unborn baby within them, but they can't decide if they want a shot or not. This is lunacy. It's absolutely crazy. The Bible says, claiming to be wise, they became fools. And that is exactly what's happening in our society and culture today. People think they're so wise and educated, and yet we are beyond foolish in our reasoning. We should have the right to choose whether or not we want to be inoculated or injected with a substance that has not been sufficiently tested. This is absolutely ridiculous. We will not comply to these unlawful orders. Our next speaker is Lori. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. That was beautifully said, and I'm speaking in the same light as that. Um, when will the government overreach stop? The CDC funded a study that showed, quote unquote, no significant difference between COVID-19 transmission between the vaccinated and the unvaccinated. And we did not even need a study like this as the pharmaceutical companies themselves state that immunity is not achieved with these shots. So what are we doing? Why are we discriminating against our frontline workers, these same people that exposed themselves to COVID and recovered while many of us hid behind our computers in the early months. And now they are the ones you want to take the jobs from? Natural immunity has been proven time and again in our history. This is no different. We are no different in the year 2022. Equality for all, vaccinated or unvaccinated. These measures that divide us need to end. Face masks optional, uh, vaccines optional. That is the American way. Our next speaker is Joe. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Good afternoon, Board of Supervisors. I'm a firefighter with an approved medical exemption and currently forced off the line and unable to serve the community that I love and I'm unable to provide for my family due to the, uh, the health order. Um, I'd like to make it clear to the public and to the board that Firefighters such as myself with medical direction from our primary health, primary care health care physicians, uh, we've acquired these exemptions and have still been forced out of our jobs. We have uh, received letters of intended separation from our employers. Just to make it clear, we've been removed from service. We're not being shuffled around. We're not being put on other assignments. We're basically awaiting to be separated, which in other words is fired. Uh, two years ago, we were essential, and now it just seems as if we're expendable. I just have one question, our request for today's uh, meeting. If you could please inform the public uh, of the intended duration of this order. Uh, was this order made in light of the anticipation of the Omicron surge? Uh, can you provide us benchmarks or intentions for the dur duration of this order? Um, is this order intended to outlast the surge and go beyond? Um, please uh, 
think very seriously about um, answering those questions for us. Uh, we'd all like to know. Thank you very much for your time. Bye. Thank you. Our next speaker is Michelle Rotondo. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hello, my name is Michelle and I am the fiance of a Santa Clara County fireman who has served this community for 10 years. He has worked through the entire pandemic and is now on leave without pay due to Sarah Cody's unjust health mandate. The mandate is unjust because the CDC states directly on their website, and I quote, breakthrough infections in people who are vaccinated are likely to occur. The health mandate is discriminatory and not based on the current facts or science, which acknowledges the fact that fully vaccinated people can still catch and spread COVID-19. Therefore, the mandate should be rescinded or at least revised to include a weekly testing option. There's no moral justification for this mandate and the science proves that. And our first responders are already overworked and understaffed. I'm asking you to please consider the facts and take action immediately to get Sarah Cody's mandate rescinded or revised. Thank you. Our next speaker is Brendan Kasten. Please accept the unmute to begin. Good afternoon and thank you for letting me speak. I've been a San Jose City Fireman for 23 years. And um, in my current engine assignment, uh, we respond to the county jail and to nursing homes. And it seems like one of the ideas or purposes is that we as first responders were not to infect these people in these high risk areas. We already wear the P1000 cartridge filter masks to prevent us from being infected from our patients. Um, but the thought of working every day, going into these facilities and the inmates in the jail, they don't wear masks. You go to these convalescent homes, half the patients and half of the patient family members are not wearing masks. So if your concern is to protect these people from us unvaccinated, um, it's completely unrealistic because the, the rules aren't even being followed. So the fact that I am now on unpaid leave and it's something that my family is going to have to figure something out, um, we are being punished. When I listened to you a month ago, you stood up and said, uh, we will not allow people to lose their jobs. They will just be shuffled around and taken care of. That is not what's happened. You've heard from my other firefighter uh, friends, the numbers of us that are unpaid, that are at home, not serving our community, not doing what we love to do. And I just feel that this is sad that here, in America, we are being persecuted and for something that isn't even proven. So thank you very much for your time. Please reconsider. Um, all we wanna do is do a good job and this mandate isn't even protecting the people you say it is. Our next speaker is Delilah Polito. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hi, can you hear me? You can. Okay, I just wanted to say that um, all of you are violating the oath that you took. Um, You're committing the same crimes from the past. History repeats itself in the ugliness of segregation and discrimination. We are all equal. We are all human beings. We are all, we are all born equal and free regardless of ethnicity, religion, gender, and vaccination status. Yet here we are having to stand up for and fight for our God-given rights. It's criminal what you guys are doing. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kevin Report. Please accept the unmute to begin. Thanks for the opportunity to speak. I'm a firefighter for Santa Clara County Fire Department. Uh, at least I was before February 1st when the mandate took effect. I'm, I'm no longer allowed to be on a fire engine uh, because I'm medically unable to get the booster shot. I'm vaccinated and I'm medically unable to get the booster shot because of previous complications I've had and I'm not allowed on a firing agent, and I'm not gonna be getting paid. We have an individual who had heart surgery after dose one of the vaccine. She cannot get another dose without risk of death. I don't say that to be dramatic. That's what the case is. Yet she too will be laid off due to this current mandate. Mandate. It's not right. Our acting fire chief, Brian Class, who many, enough, many at our department have no confidence in, 
has not even requested the waiver from Dr. Sarah Cody as a temporary fix. Uh, he claims we don't have a staffing issue. Clearly, it's not true. Just from February 1st to February 4th, when the mandate took effect, we had to fill spots with 66 overtime firefighters. And we still had to downstaff 10 fire engines because we didn't have enough firefighters. If that's not a staffing crisis and a public safety shortfall, I, I don't know what is. Um, there's, a, there's a big issue here, and the public is going to pay the price. We're not putting the right number of firefighters on fire engines. We don't have paramedics on some fire engines anymore. Um, this is dangerous. Please rescind the mandate. Let firefighters continue to safely serve and protect the public. We've been doing it for the last two years. We've done a pretty good job. Let us continue to do it. We wear all the proper PPE. Let us do it safely like we've done for the last two years. Please, thank you for your time. Our next and 15th speaker is Edward Strine. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Yeah, I just want to say that um, there's ivermectin and uh, hydroxychloroquine and other doctors have proven that uh, this medication does work. <laughs> so there is no need for uh, vaccines. Uh, also, it's uh, against the Nuremberg Code, um, which you guys are doing. And um, if it does go to military law, you may be sent to prison for what you guys are doing, uh, since it is against the Nuremberg Code. Uh, and uh, for uh, your sake and your family's sake, uh, you may want to think about that uh, uh, for the future. Uh, if uh, the law does um, uh, come after you and um, if we eventually have equal justice in this country again, uh, that is uh, something that you uh, may uh, want to seriously consider. Thank you very much. Oh, one moment while we switch the timer to one minute. And our next speaker will be B, the letter B. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. B, can you accept the unmute? There you go. Sorry, it took a minute. I just got to say that what this Board of Supervisors is doing and what Sarah Coda is doing are costing the livelihoods of tax paying voting American citizens in San Clara County directly. There is no question of that. We've proven that over and over again. In addition to that, I would like to show any studies that have been done that show and can from first responders to any time. This mandate is completely unjust, way off of the end, open-ended mandate. All it's doing is we'll have ripple effects that he will do and we'll be feeling first. We need to stop it. Our next speaker is Cody Griggs. Please accept the unmute to begin. Yeah, this message is for Sarah. I hope you're still on here. Let me turn that down. My name is Cody Griggs. I'm a firefighter with the Santa Clara County Fire Department. Your recent health order has ended my 15 year fire service career and taken food off my family's table. I'm currently on leave without pay for my department. My doctor has informed me that I cannot take a COVID vaccine. I have submitted a medical exemption to my department. It has been approved and still the acting chief, Brian Glass has informed me that he intends to fire me. Our department has been running 365 days a year as we always do since the beginning of COVID responding to every 911 call as we always do. We wear full personal protective equipment on all our calls and no one in our department has ever passed COVID to a patient or received COVID from a patient. It's never happened this entire time. My ask is that you alter or rescind this health order immediately so I can get back to work to serve this community, to support my family and save my career I've worked so hard to achieve. Thank you. And Peggy, before we go on to the next one, our last speaker had spoken during public comment on this item. If there's any others that have done so, it's not fair to others that they speak twice. So if you see any names remaining that spoke during public comment already on this, um, they should not be allowed to speak a second time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lake of Fire. Please accept the unmute to begin. 
Yes, uh, I just want you to know that God has blessed us with wisdom and understanding. Everybody behind here talking to you guys. Your data is misleading. It's full of lies. Every voice that you hear, there's thousands of people behind them, and you need to understand that. Your population estimates are no good to determine who is unvaccinated, so your numbers are fake. Hospitalization of the unvaccinated could include people that have broken limbs and are not even there for COVID. You're just full of lies. And let me read you some scripture for those who are planning to vaccinate children. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea, then that he should offend one of these little ones. You need to repent, Sarah Cody, and all of you behind this. You are evil and you need to stop. One moment. Our next speaker is Amber. I don't believe she is a repeat, so I'm unmuting the mic. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Okay, my name is Amber. I'm a nurse um, in the emergency department for the last 11 years. I've been at my current hospital for the last eight, and I'll tell you, I have a religious exemption, but the fact that I even had to submit for an exemption because my doctor, first of all, refused to give me one, even though I should qualify. But the fact that I should have even had to apply is appalling to me. I work day in and day out with really sick patients. All of this time over the last 11 years, we have worked through Ebola. We have worked through so many illnesses. And these firefighters that are talking, I am so heartbroken because I see them coming into my ED and I know how hardworking they are. And I know they are just doing the best for us, as are we. And the fact that these mandates are in place it's sickening. It doesn't make sense. Your data is wrong and you know it. We have so much information out there. Please stop these mandates. You are going to get so much. Our next speaker is Matt. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hello, can you hear me? We can. Hi, I'm a 10 year firefighter and a paramedic who has been directly affected by Dr. Cody's mandate. I'm the sole provider for my wife and two boys and currently unable to work. Others and I have been faced with wondering if and or when we will be able to return to our jobs that we worked so hard to get. I am asking for all of the Board of Supervisors and Dr. Cody to please look at this issue with a microscope and do further research. The county is at risk for losing so many great frontline workers that have worked so hard the last two years. I've been treating COVID patients and, and my community for the past two years tirelessly and now I am not good enough. Please listen to the emotions in our voice as we beg for our jobs and our ability to return to work to serve our community and provide for our families. As firefighters, we were born with servants' hearts. Please let us serve our community. Thank you. Our next speaker is Daniel. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Daniel, can you accept the unmute? Hello. Yep. Thank you. Unmute. Am I unmuted? You are. Yes. Hi, thank you for having me and listening. I'm Daniel with San Jose Fire Department. Um, given this ground to talk to you guys, I've seen so many of these forums where we just, people just stand and, and spill their heart, hearts out and you guys just sit there just motionless, emotionless, and it's just insane. But again, here we are, all these people spilling their heart out, making sense, telling you what's out there, the information. And here we are, I have three kids, almost had my 10 year mark with San Jose Fire, and now I, I can't get my retirement, struggling to figure this out. It doesn't make any sense, the data's out. These vaccines do not work. They can't even stop the Omicron variant, which is like the flu. So why are we being forced to do this? Why are we being attacked? It's, it's crazy. Please do your due diligence and rescind this order, thank you. Our next speaker is Stephanie. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hello, can you hear me? We yes. can. I just, last meeting, I asked for the data on first responders and nurses transmitting this and giving COVID to people. I still, Sarah, I haven't seen it. What I've seen is that you think boosters are so effective. If they're so effective, then 
patients, they can make their own decisions. We have the ability to make decisions and you guys hiding behind screens. I'm a wife of a fireman. He was out on day one when we didn't know what the hell this is. And it was scary. Other firemen were camping out in their backyards and nurses showering in their front yards before going in the house of fear. And you guys sit in front of a computer, Sarah, I still haven't seen you. I don't even know what you look like. I, it's, it's crazy. It's sickening. And it's just, I don't know how you even sleep at night. My mom's a nurse, didn't want to get the booster. Two of her good friends, 40 and 50 heart attacks within 24 hours. I had to call her after she got hers because she only did it for fear of losing her job. It's disgusting and it's sickening. Please rescind this and do Our next speaker is Sue B. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hi, my name is Sue. Um, you are hired servants, trustees of We the People and are accountable to We the People at all times. Under the US Constitution, We the People are equally entitled to all of the protections and rights listed in the preambles and the bills and declarations of rights from any and all states. United States Constitution, Article 4, Section 2, Clause 1. The citizens of each state shall be entitled to all privileges and immunities of citizens in and of the several states. California Constitution, 1879, Declaration of Rights, Article 1, Section 2. All political power is inherent in the people. Government is instituted for the protection, security, and benefit of the people. And they, the people, have the right to alter or reform the same whenever the public good may require it. You are violating our constitutional rights. The response to COVID was not a medical response. It was a control response. You are fully aware from all the peer-reviewed studies that masks do not work. You are fully aware that the COVID-19 vaccines do not work. People vaccinated can still get COVID. And you know that these are EUA vaccines. Stop this now. Our next speaker is Silvana Casale. Please accept the unmute to begin. Can you hear me? We can. This is Dr. Silvana Casale. I'm a school neuropsychologist. I work with children that have mental health issues, and I've been writing to all of you for two years with no responses. Sarah Cody does not respond. I agree with what all the other speakers are saying. You must rescind this. You, I, I'm racking my brain to figure out where you all are coming from in your thinking. It's ridiculous. These children are being harmed. It is child abuse to continue to muzzle these children. The suicide rate for females has gone up 51%. That's on your shoulders. I don't understand if you're receiving other financial incentives from lobby groups or whatever it's coming from, but I continue to reiterate the children are suffering and it's on you all for doing this wrong. You're not listening to the people you're supposed to represent. Do something different. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lydia. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hi there. Um, I came out back in 2020 March. I came out of a five-month medical leave because I got a desperate call from Moore Park Urgent Care. I'm a nurse, Albert and Kushbu and they didn't know how to handle these COVID patients. And I ran into the fire. And from there, I helped them five days a week. Though I'm only three days a week, I saw the need. Surgeries got shut down where I was working. My supervisor allowed me <clears throat> to be a hero front line. <clears throat> from there, I got swooped up to go to COVID pop-up clinics and I served the community all throughout the county. And from there to the fairgrounds. And I served them with the COVID pop-up clinics. And then I was promoted to to be a um, site leader. And then I come back to my home base unit in the recovery room only to find out that because I've had numerous religious exemptions in the past, this religious exemption was not honored. Shame, 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 shame on you, Dr. Sarah Cody and Board of Supervisors. Our next speaker is fired nurse. Please accept the unmute to begin. Can you accept the unmute? Yes. I Your mic is open. I am a nurse and I have been taking care of patients that are not only COVID positive, but that have been hospitalized because of COVID disease. Most of them were vaccinated. Also, I have been taking care of patients since this pandem pandemic started when there was no vaccines, treatments, masks, or wipes even to disinfect surfaces. I was there working all the time and with the uncertainty. Now that we have more data, studies, and we know more about COVID-19 disease, now I have been unscheduled from work, on paid leave, 
because of the COVID counties um, illogical tyrannical orders or mandates. These orders and mandates need to stop now. This, it is illogical. You can see studies from anywhere in the world. I don't know what you're guiding yourselves with, but all this data you're putting out there is not what we see in the hospitals. Our next speaker is Tyranny Response Team. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Can you accept the unmute? Yes, hello and thank you. Um, I believe that there are 165 freedom of information requests for the isolation and purification data of COVID-19 SARS-2 and none of them have been provided. So yeah, it looks to me like your county's engaging in fraud and it's kind of a global fraud. And uh, that's all I wanna say, thank you. Our next speaker is County Guy. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Uh, wow, Sarah, it sounds like uh, you have a lot of fans supporting your uh, ridiculous booster mandates. Uh, you had to pat yourself on the back. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah, Sarah, got a lot of fans out there. Pat yourself on the back, big girl, um, for ruining thousands of lives, not only firefighter lives, their families, police, hospital, frontline workers. You pretty much have destroyed their hope of a career while you go back to Palo Alto in your mansion. Good job. Um, your mandates are illegal and are unjustified. I hope you, the county, and the Board of Supervisors are sued to the hilt. Um, everybody that's on this call, spread the word. Vote every one of these soulless crooks out of office. Any lawyers out there, you stand and take a lot of their money. Please, please listen to these people. Their jobs are at stake, their lives are at stake, and you got one person to thank. Sarah Cody, who calls herself a doctor. I call her a fool. Our next speaker is Christy C. Please accept the unmute to begin. Yes, hello. I am speaking today. Um, I actually had my hand raised earlier, but my name is very similar to somebody else who spoke, so you assumed I hadn't. That's not appreciated, by the way. You kept lowering my hand. Please be more detail oriented when you guys are assuming that some of us have spoken twice because I should have gotten two minutes and I and I really would have appreciated my full time. Anyway, on to bigger and better things. You guys really need to rescind this mandate immediately. Dr. Cody, what you're doing is ruining people's lives. It's unjustified and um, it's not even done legally. Um, people are dying from other things. If you look at the non-COVID death rate of people 18 to 65, it's increased 40%. We're not looking at that. We're not addressing that. All we're addressing is COVID, COVID, COVID. Has anyone ever stopped to think that maybe the vaccine is causing more deaths of more people than it's actually saving? We really need to look into other avenues. Thank you. Our next speaker is Miles Caldwell. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hello, can you hear me? We can. Hi, my name is Miles Caldwell. I'm a 10-year veteran firefighter and five years here in Santa Clara County. I'd like to speak to the man vaccine mandate uh, directed by Sarah Cody. I think this mandate is wrong and it is illegal and it's not unjustified. I am pro-vaccine, but I'm also pro-choice. And I believe my brothers and sisters, that I demand a choice for them to make the choice for themselves. You're separating families. You're separating that you're uh, leaving them without pay and unable for them to provide for their families and for their children. I have heard my brothers and sisters talk about suicide because of this, and this is completely unnecessary and I, and it's not right. You need to rescind the vaccine mandate immediately. Thank you for your time. Our next speaker is Melissa Vallalunga. Please accept the unmute to begin. Melissa, can you accept the unmute? Um, she, she's logged in under a, let's see. I'm gonna go to the next speaker, Rostamon. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. And your mic is open, sir. One love vibrations, everyone. I just want to take a time to think 
about the actions coming from our leaders in this county. Yeah? Think about it with everything we do, we should do with love. Think, Dr. Cody, is the mandate you bring forth coming from your heart for the safety of the people and the one love vibrations for all the members of the Santa Clara County. Because as the Rastaman, what I hear is not that. I hear something wrong, something wrong, very wrong, something evil coming from that. So maybe you take a time this, this evening when you rest your head and you think about what you do and the lives you affect. Is it for the better or for the worse? I just ask you that and you come from a place of love and let the people choose what they put inside their body, yeah? Because you never know when it's going to come back to you one time. You heard me? I love you all. Be safe. One love vibrations. And I will go to Melissa V. And please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Hi, thank you so much for having me. So I'm just calling today because I'm a mother and it's sad to see these <clears throat> mandates in school or everywhere actually. But for my daughter who's in <coughs> oh shoot fourth grade having to tell me that their talent show will be on zoom like what's that a talent show it's not even a human experience on zoom when it used to be like in an assembly in a, in a cafeteria and what's next like field trips are going to be virtual like is that what where the direction that, that we're headed whoever you guys are taking the orders from is just we need to start questioning we need informed consent we need data that that cody should be also um, putting out how many uh, people are depressed because of these COVID mandates. We need that kind of data. We need data where um, people are getting harmed by the vaccine, the, the test, whatever it is, because really it's new. So we are really like guinea pigs. If you really think about it, you know, everybody should be getting tested. Not if you're vaccinated, you're allowed in. And that concludes our speakers. Peggy, thank you very much. And before I turn to supervisors, Dr. Cody, what I'd like to ask, please, is I, I'm sure we've all heard a tremendous amount about the state changing its order that's to take effect in a little while regarding wearing masks. I know I'm getting emails from businesses and individuals if the county is going to follow suit. Could you please update us on where you stand on that issue? Thank you, Supervisor Wasserman. Uh, I know that your constituents are asking you uh, these questions and we are also receiving this, these questions. Um, uh, as you know, we are always seeking to do what we can to be the most protective, but also flexible. And we are looking at our data and where we are in the Omicron wave um, and just going through the process that we usually do um, and don't have a decision to share at this point. Okay, um, what, what I would ask is that something goes out from your office to the public. We'll be help, happy to help spread it through our office because of the confusion that's out there now. It was big he headlines, the statewide, statewide removal of masking requirement and people are assuming that's the case here. More people are hearing that because it's on CNBC and NBC and ABC. So that's what they're doing, assuming we're following suit. Um, if we're not following suit, which sounds like the case right now, I would ask that you do whatever shotgun approach you can do out of your office, including sending us a copy that I'm sure the other soups would disseminate um, as I certainly would so that the public knows we're not following the state order at this time. Thank you. I, I also uh, want to make a very important clarification, which I think is, um, I, I completely hear you that the messaging uh, can be difficult uh, to understand. For students in school for K through 12, that's a separate mask mandate that's from the state. It's part yes. of the K through 12 school guidance um, that says that children uh, in school K through 12 wear masks indoors. It's not a county. There, so I, I get a lot of questions about that and I'm sure you do. Um, and I understand that it's confusing, but I just wanna be very clear on the record that the K through 12 masking is through the state school guidance and requirements, um, not, it's not local. Thank you, understood. What I'm getting them from is, is businesses um, from yoga studios to retail store everywhere that they feel masks are no longer necessary inside businesses. And 
if we don't somehow match the effort of the state publicizing that that's not the case in Santa Clara County, at least not right now, there's gonna be a lot of conflict between people walking into stores without masks and business owners saying you should have masks or whatever other purpose. So whatever you can do would be greatly appreciated until we're the same as the state of California. Vice, Vice President Ellenberg. Uh, thanks so much. Um, first of all, Supervisor Wasserman for asking that, because of course um, I'm getting the same and, and I'm sure the rest of us are too. And I just want to get a quick clarification, uh, Dr. Cody, the, the school's mandate, I understand, is separate. Excuse me, Vice President, for yes. some reason, you're all staticky. I turned off my, my microphone. I don't see any other microphone that is on. Um, oh. I, don't, I don't know if it's a difference in distance, but every word is almost like underwater. Okay, I'm going to try to change my mic. Okay. How's that? Is that better? That's, please, please continue. That's better? Oh, okay, thank you. Um, yeah, that's more of a tunnel effect, but it's better than the prior one. Oh no, maybe somebody can come and help me. Um, okay. From the clerks. Um, and and why, don't, why doesn't somebody else go and I will wait until I can get my mic fixed and then come back to me. Okay, Supervisor Chavez. Thank you very much. Is my mic okay? It's perfect. It's, All right, thank it's you. important to have the right mic. Oh, who knows? <laughs> we don't, yeah, the right mic, the other mic, the other Thank Mike Wasserman. Um, so first of all, I, I just wanted to say to Dr. Cody and our staff um, and to the public, uh, I, I believe that um, our staff and in particular Dr. Cody is making um, decisions and health orders rooted in her best thinking. And I, I raise that because I, um, I'm sorry, Dr. Cody, that that you know you have uh, so so much enmity coming your way and anger and fear and stress. Um, so I I just wanted to start by saying that I do want to better understand philosophically the approach um, to the health orders and in particular what I I am concerned about and I I have raised this at a at a number of meetings is just the difference between um, the, the state orders and what's happening locally and the level of stress and confusion that I believe it's causing. And so we, what, what I'm very interested in understanding is uh, philosophically, uh, if you could just share the um, areas where we differ and why, and then um, Matt Fisk, you're not on mute, thanks. Um, sorry, it sounded like my mother. Matt, mute yourself there. Um, but anyway, uh, Sarah, if our Dr. Cody, if you could um, talk through the the strategy, and then one of the questions that got asked was specifically relative to um, the health order that's impacting uh, first responders and uh, those who are work or. Uh, firefighters and those working with um, high need populations, if you could talk just a little bit about how you anticipate that health order um, time-wise. Thank you. Sure, thank you for your questions. And I, and I, and I, I appreciate your, your words. And I, and I also hear the, the urgency in, in, um, in knowing more. Uh, so I, 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 I really, I really do hear you. The the I'll just start with the booster mandate. Um, the concern, my uh, deep concern, as the Omicron surge was taking off, uh, were a, a a couple. One is understanding the importance of boosters, both in reducing the chance of having an infection and having um, a hospitalization, and knowing that we were having uh, a lot of people. Um, in those critical areas, hospitals and nursing homes and elsewhere, not able to work because of breakthrough infections. Um, and so uh, uh, one um, concern was uh, ensuring adequate staffing. And then as you know, um, we put in place a limited waiver process 
um, that was primarily after the state issued a revision um, because of staffing concerns saying that in hospitals, you know, in a pinch, uh, they could have people who were recovering from COVID uh, work. Um, so part of it, part of it is it ensuring that we have a workforce um, that's healthy and able uh, to take care of people and do what they need to do in those critical sectors. Um, and, it, and part of it is also ensuring that those people um, are boosted uh, and, and we, as much as possible, ensure that the people in their care are safe uh, and, and reduce the risk of them spreading COVID, um, especially in the setting of Omicron, where it was so prevalent. Uh, so, and the, so, go ahead. No, no, please, Dr. Cody. So that's, um, those, were, those were the primary like animating uh, principles uh, behind the uh, booster order in December. And it was really built uh, around the state's booster order. Um, so it went a little bit broader and a little bit deeper, um, but it was very much building on what the state had put in place. And I, I will just re, um, state for my colleagues and I, and for you, Dr. Cody, I, I think it is so critical at this phase that we are aligned with the state and don't have differentiations from the state. Because again, I think the, the level of confusion, consternation, and stress that it's causing is, is significant and, and something that um, I know you're aware of because I know you've been thinking a lot about um, mental health as it relates to the, the challenges we're facing. Um, so from the, based on the reasons you took that action and where we are um, with Omicron, what is your thinking about that, that, um, that further expanded booster health order? Well, I think like with all of the mandates that we have in place, first, I want to, I want to say that um, I and we do not take these lightly, right? It would be um, that they are, they are, they, they are very difficult. Um, for, for all of us. Um, so they're only implemented when there really, really is um, a need in, in, my, in my judgment. Um, so what I am, what I am looking at and is what's, where, where are we trending with the pandemic? What other layers of protection do we have in place? And what do things look like? So I don't have a set timeline. I can't give you um, an endpoint on the, on the booster mandate. The um, limited waiver that became available was available to um, all institutions that were impacted by the um, orders that you're, was that primarily relative to the boost, the booster order? Yeah, that's, that's correct. So the booster mandate applied to just uh, a handful of sectors, um, healthcare, long-term uh, care, congregate settings, uh, such as custody settings and medical first responders. Um, the, the limited waiver applies to all of those groups that are uh, under the booster mandate. So any of those sectors during the Omicron surge that felt that they couldn't perform their operations, if those who were had a exemption a reviewed exemption, either religious or medical. Um, so those with exemptions uh, can't work in a high risk setting. And if in the uh, judgment of the person in charge that was gonna compromise their operations, they can apply for a limited waiver. And did all of the hospitals in our region apply for that waiver? Outside no, not of all of them did. A, a subset did, but not all. So, and are, is that all public on our website? I just, I didn't look, I apologize. Uh, no, that's, that's not, not listed on the website. So, um, and we had some uh, fire departments that requested a waiver? Some, a subset of fire departments also requested a waiver, that's correct. And did all um, institutions that request a waiver, were they granted them? 
Um, not all. There were certain conditions uh, and materials that they had to provide. So if the waiver application was incomplete, they were not granted a waiver. So um, I, again, I'm, I'm just going to um, say that I, my preferences that were aligned with the state, I know why we weren't in the beginning, um, but I think we're at a different phase and a phase that um, really requires us to concentrate on being clear in our communications and that way people have a better option of a better, I, I think we're gonna have a higher rate of support and compliance than we do when people are, are confused. And colleagues, that's really why I'm asking these questions because I, I do think I we're at a different rate than we were. Um, just another- excuse me, uh, excuse me one second, Supervisor Chavez. Dr. Smith, your microphone is open. Go ahead, Supervisor Chavez. Oh, thank you. Um, the other thing I, I wanted to, um, just ask about is I, I thought the numbers of, of test kits that you were able to get out, um, Dr. Smith and team, that 650,000 number was really incredible. And I, I wondered if you could um, speak to just the, um, the availability of those um, test kits. I saw that there's an expansion of the, um, of, of how they're gonna get out, but how is our supply and um, in particular, our supply relative to the needs we know we're hearing from schools in particular. Um, we're at this point, um, you know, have still have inventory left. We're responding to schools when they request um, antigen tests. We are doing the distribution as was described in the PowerPoint. Um, the uh, libraries will start distribution um, this week. Um, we're testing to see how that works out. Um, and we're looking at other options for further distribution. We've distributed test kits to all the county employees and to, um, I won't say all, but most people who came to um, our our testing sites uh, so that they could do follow-up testing. We've also been doing distributions to um, the school sites as was described in the PowerPoint. Um, and we're looking at whether or not it makes sense to uh, purchase more tests. Uh, you know that the federal government now we'll mail everybody um, test to their own home for free. And the um, insurance companies are all paying for um, antigen tests and um, the supply is more available. So we're looking to see if that makes some sense. We're also getting some test kits or antigen tests from uh, HRSA, all those small numbers. Yeah, I, I still, you know, frankly, I, I would be very interested in us figuring out a way to bill the um, the healthcare providers, you know, I, and I, and also to determine whether or not there's a way for us to obviously make sure that we're um, reimbursed. I do want to say that I think for some, uh, you know, through the, the school year, I think it's going to be very important that we're supplied, and by the way, not just for the schools, but for parents and the preschools, and there's just a lot of uh, folks that are going to be impacted. And I think Dr. Smith, I don't know if, the, if there's a limit on how many you can receive. I know if the federal government was sending, I think two or four per household. Um, so I don't know if there's still, like if after you receive tests and use those tests, if you can sign up to get more tests sent to you, is that, do you know the answer to that? From, you mean rules from the federal government? Right. No, I don't know the answer to that okay. question. But so I, in terms of the reimbursement issue that you talked about, we did look into that. Um, we don't do not think that we can get reimbursement from um, the insurance company uh, because it has to be linked to a particular patient. Um, there is some possibility that we can make a claim against FEMA for the costs, but as you'll find out when we talk about mid-year, that's going to be significantly delayed. So we're trying I to figure out any way we can get reimbursed. 
Thank you. And I do want to say, I think in addition to schools, the other groups of um, folks that I've been thinking a lot about are small businesses because losing one or two folks is so significant if someone's been exposed. So, um, so I, I really appreciated seeing that Chabat team is still out there doing doors and, you know, talking to businesses, but I'd also like us to work with the, the um, cities and their and their business organizations just to make sure those are available, particularly for small businesses. Um, just to go back, um, one, one last question or two. One is I would like for the board to get an off agenda report of everybody who's applied for a waiver and everybody who's received a waiver. And then my second question is, I, I wanna make sure I understand this. In our, in our county, um, for all of our departments, Dr. Smith, you're the, you, since you're the lead executive, you are the only one that can ap apply for a waiver. Is that accurate on behalf of any of the county's employees? Yes, that's correct. And every morning I look closely at the staffing for the jail and the fire departments and the hospital and clinics. And, you know, we're keeping on top of it closely if we find a significant uh, change in the staffing patterns or needs will be right on top of it. And my, my concern is both the change in staffing needs, but it's the, in many of these departments and the departments that you just talked about, we have so much um, mandatory overtime that I am really concerned about us straining our resources, not just people um, coming to, to being forced into overtime, but just how long we can do that before we, you know, we burn people out and, and lose staff. And again, I just want to say to, to my, uh, my colleagues, um, I, and I, I still have a lot of uh, respect and admiration for the direction that Dr. Cody has taken our county. I do think that it's time we align ourselves with the state. I remain concerned about confusion and, you know, rule fatigue, but I'm also very concerned about the amount of um, stress that is just in our entire community right now. And I, I'm really concerned that we have to be able to think and, and manage that as well. Um, I, I also finally, I'm sorry, colleagues, I just wanted to say, I thought the report was extremely helpful and answered many questions that I had. Thank you. Mike, you're on mute. You're muted. You can't hear me if I'm speaking. I said we can't hear you if you're speaking. <laughs> Go ahead, Vice President Ellenberg. It, is the sound okay? Let's start with that. No? It's, it's better. All right. Um, I will try to be louder in case that, that's a factor. At the <laughs> last meeting, I had asked for future reports to include information on outbreaks and response support and guidance from our county public health team on congregate settings. And I'm particularly concerned about the jail. The uh, public dashboard shows a rebound in cases last week after having come down from the prior week. Is there someone that can speak to the current status of the situation in the jail? Thank you, Sup Supervisor Ellenberg. Um, I don't have a detailed understanding, but what I can tell you is that overall the cases have been coming down uh, among the inmates. And the difference, uh, what you might see on the dashboard is the sheriff, of course, is tracking and concerned about isolation space. Uh, so it's who's in isolation, which is different than um, newly diagnosed or new, uh, new COVID cases among inmates. So the good news is that we are overall seeing a trend down. And I think that little hiccup on the sheriff's dashboard may just have to be with um, uh, previously uh, diagnosed inmates who are still requiring isolation. Oh, okay, thanks. Thank you, Dr. Cody. With regard to other congregate settings, uh, long-term care facilities, uh, housing shelters, uh, schools, w with regard to outbreaks there, are we monitoring those settings? And, and if so, how are we responding to um, Omicron outbreaks? So things have changed during Omicron, as you can imagine. 
um, two important factors. One is sheer volume. Um, and the other is that the incubation period in Omicron is shorter. So it's just a shorter turnaround time. So by the time an outbreak is recognized and reported, in general, the opportunity has already passed um, to, to, uh, to do particular um, prevention measures. Um, so what we overall, what I can tell you is that the number of outbreaks that are reported through our portal, it's called our spot portal, that's where schools and uh, workplaces report, that's been declining over time. So the overall number of we have a problem and we're reporting it to you, we're seeing less and less of that. Um, the detail that we have on each outbreak, however, um, is not what we had uh, uh, previously in the pandemic. Uh, because the investigation of the outbreak isn't really changing our, the transmission. Uh, we're, um, so we're there, we're, we're receiving the reports, we're providing technical assistance, uh, but we're not getting the detail on each outbreak that we had um, previously. Okay, and it sounds like you're not recommending that we go back to um, reporting on outbreak, out, outbreak tracking and response based on that, that quick turnaround? Right, in the, in the context of Omicron, it really doesn't make sense. Um, the the uh, recommendations are pretty stable for how uh, various entities can prevent outbreaks or mitigate transmission. And of course it involves vaccination, boosting, um, testing, having people who test positive or, or have symptoms uh, stay at home, et cetera. So it's not so much necessary to tailor the recommendations based on the features of the outbreak. Um, and there simply is not the resources to go and get the details on each outbreak in any case. Got it, thank you. And uh, my last question is about the isolation support program. Is that still, needed? Is it still in existence? If so, is it being used? And if not, are we getting requests uh, about it? So we still have the, uh, the, uh, the team from the Office of Supportive Housing that are supporting people who need help during isolation. Um, I don't have a recent update with details about that. I can just... If that could be included in the March report, that, that would be fine. Yes, we can, uh, we can include that in the March report. Okay, great, that's all I have. Thank you so much. Thank you. And with that, I think we're gonna move on to items 15, 16. Sorry, uh, President Bosman, oh, I didn't- Supervisor Lee, mind. your hand just got raised. And Supervisor Smidian, your hand just got raised. Go ahead, Supervis Supervisor Lee, go ahead. You beat him to the punch. Oh, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, first of all, I just wanna say thank you very much for the staff's uh, report for the uh, distribution of close to two thirds of a million indigent test kits in the last few weeks uh, for our county. And that's certainly no small task. It's really a Herculean task uh, to, to do in such a short time given the uh, spike in, in Omicron. <clears throat> and frankly, I've had no, no more people in my own family. Uh, before it was more like a friend of a friend. Now we're talking about close family members. Uh, here and there uh, catching this uh, in the last uh, 46 weeks. So I just want to say thank you so much for getting those tests out there because it really helped identify who they are uh, and that they would get the, the, the quarantine and, and to stay safe. So thank you for all the great work that staff uh, did uh, this past uh, short amount of time. Uh, and then I think you've also answered most of that question regarding the, uh, uh, the supply of antigen kits. Looks like we do have enough uh, right now and uh, and I do hope that we will be able to continue logistically to continue getting these uh, in the future, just to make sure that we don't uh, uh, run low on them. Um, the reimbursement process for these kits has been uh, authorized by the federal government through the insurance company uh, for those that's purchased, I believe, after January 15th. It's, it's a little bit hazy right now. I don't know if anybody has any update on how that process works. Uh, if there's anything you could share today. Uh, on the reimbursement process for these antigen kits for those who purchase on their own? Um, I can try to give a bit of an answer and okay, thank it's a you. Confusing, confusing one. Each, uh, each health system has their own rules about mm -hmm. how to get reimbursed. 
my understanding is that some um, are easier than others to use. I happen to have checked into Kaiser and they um, make it challenging to utilize. Um, groups like TAMP and HealthNet, HCA, others are even more challenging to utilize. Uh, you have to purchase the product and then send them documentation of the purchase price and the um, you know uh, documentation that you actually have it um, and that you're actually a member or a beneficiary. Um, in terms of uh, Medi-Cal and Medicare, um, I, I don't think I can explain it. It's still pretty confusing to me. Um, but um, as typical, it's different for everybody. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Smith. I mean, for somebody with a JD and an MD is confused. I'm sure it's confused to all of us in the community uh, on the process, but uh, certainly I would love, love to uh, uh, be able to provide that to uh, the community as much as we can, because it's a, uh, certainly we don't want people to hesitate of getting these tests when needed. Um, and, uh, and certainly there's something that is now considered reimbursable uh, so that people can get tested. Now, the other question I have is regarding the CDC rules, which for, when it first came out was a little bit confusing. And I don't know if you might be able to help um, uh, Dr. Cody. Uh, the, the initial thing I did remember uh, that came out a couple, few weeks ago was that after the test that positive, um, the individual should quarantine for at least five days. Uh, and then after that, they should be able to not quarantine, but do they need to get tested again first? Uh, so that was the part that I'm a little bit confused about, if you might be able to help uh, explain how that works. Yes, uh, th there was quite a bit of confusion when that guidance came out, and I can clarify it for you. The state of California uh, added a, a testing to that guidance. So in California, if you test positive, you isolate. And then after day five, you can test. And if you test negative, mm -hmm. you can complete your quarantine. I mean, you can complete your isolation. Uh, you can go about your business as long as you are ensure you're wearing a, a well-fitting mask. Um, if you test positive and you continue to test positive, then you need to complete the 10 day isolation. So we, uh, the state of California has added testing uh, to ensure that people who are infectious are not in, in circulation. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's very helpful. Um, and then the other issue is um, the the <laughs> variants. Uh, there have been some discussion of some potential variant, the Omicron, some called the stealth variant. Um, what have you learned most recently that we should uh, know about regarding these type of uh, variants right now? So there's a sub lineage of Omicron called BA. Two, we have detected this sub lineage in Santa Clara County. Um, <clears throat> I don't, I can't give you an account. Uh, I don't have the latest data, but we are, we are seeing it. It is growing. What we know from uh, other places is that it does have a growth advantage as compared to the um, BA1, which is the the variant that we we are mostly seeing. So it's possible that the BA2 could outcompete and sort of edge out um, the, the current dominant variant. Um, from what I've seen, there's no difference in severity. So both seem to cause a milder illness uh, in general. But of course, you know, a lot of, you know, even if it's a small percent of a large number, you still get too many people that are seriously ill. Um, so, you know, it's something that we're keeping an eye on, whether it's going to, um, you know, significantly impact us, my guess is probably not, um, but, but something that we're keeping an eye on. Well, thank you very much for, uh, for that. Um, and one thing, um, in terms of the uh, hard work of our county, uh, I certainly think that uh, it would be appropriate and something I want that to check in with my colleague if they're willing to do to col collaborate on some type of a uh, grat uh, gratitude or thank you video for our vaccination workers 
testing workers and DSWs. I just want to throw it out as an idea if my colleagues would be willing to join and uh, I think something like that, the Doxel Smith, if this is something that's doable, uh, I think it'll be good to really thank our, our workers for all the great work that they have done to uh, keep us going for over two years on this uh, very difficult journey. And that's all I have for now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Supervisor Lee. Supervisor Samidian. Thank you. A number of my questions have already been asked, which is what happens when you're number five to raise your hand, uh, but or number four at least, uh, uh, Mr. Wasserman. Um, I do want to ask Dr. Cody uh, if she could take a deep breath to um, share with us the best current thinking about what the longer term future looks like in terms of the conversation out there about pandemic versus endemic. Uh, the length of time during which our boosters are likely to be helpful, but at what point do we start talking about yet another uh, round of vaccinations uh, being necessary if we do? Um, I've got more, but I'd like to start there and, and not overload the, uh, the question. So why don't I, I think that's plenty for a start. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, first, first of all, I want to say that um, we don't know what's ahead, but by and large. There's a lot of uncertainty ahead, um, and that's a hard thing for any of us to wrap our head around. So, I, but I wanted, I want to say that that's the honest truth. Uh, we don't know. Um, however, best thinking, given patterns that we've seen, is that we are likely to continue to see uh, peaks and valleys or waves, so that we will probably be riding waves at, at, into the future, unknown period of time, unknown type of wave is what, what we're going to have. Um, it's not clear whether we're going to settle into something that looks more seasonal uh, or, or not. Um, I would be quite surprised if we didn't see uh, um, surges uh, during the winter, uh, if not during other times of the year as well. It's uh, a little early to make any predictions about vaccine um, and what the cadence of any additional doses will be. Um, I, I simply don't know. Uh, but what I what I want to, I, I guess another point I would make this conversation about endemic. When are we endemic? I don't think anyone quite agrees on a definition of what endemic is, um, and I think it, in to some degree is a societal agreement about what level of death uh, and severe illness society will tolerate, to be honest. Uh, so there's not really an epi definition the way there is for a pandemic, um, uh, for the word endemic. Well, and, uh, and another point I would make about endemic is many diseases are endemic. It doesn't mean that they're harmless and we can forget about them. There's a lot of endemic diseases that cause, uh, you know, quite a bit of illness and death. <clears throat> Thank you. I guess my, um, my exhortation to you, Dr. Cody, and to uh, Dr. Smith and our, our staff is that as, as hard as it is, both just in terms of the degree of difficulty and uncertainty and complexity, and in terms of how hard it is, just in terms of how much work it is, I, I, I do feel like we, you know, uh, two years in, need to be thinking ahead, even as we manage the urgency of the moment. And I, I feel like we've had this conversation before about testing and about boosters and uh, we have uh, candidly been disappointed from time to time at the level of engagement and participation by some of the healthcare partners out there in the community. Not all, but some, some significant ones. Uh, and so, you know, I, I can't help but be frustrated and disappointed, even as I understand the dynamic, I think. Um, but I can't help but be frustrated and disappointed when you know, we knew all those months ago, uh, and our healthcare professionals uh, out there in the private nonprofit sector knew all those months ago that boosters were going to be necessary. We talked about this at the board, and I push, push, pushed on it. And yet, when the time came, the response was not all that it could have been or should have been by many of the providers, in in my view, 
that means then that we are obliged to step up because uh, you know we're that safety net. Um, same is true with testing, and I, I've been a big advocate for what I'll call non-traditional uh, distribution methods, and I think our board has supported that and developed some non-traditional methods that have been quite extraordinary, but I think we got to keep being creative. Dr. Smith, I guess what I'm saying and to you, Dr. Cody, is, you know, um, I, you know the cliche, of course, is that uh, the urgent always crowds out the important. And I want to make sure that doesn't happen, even looking at an uncertain future, that we are, are thinking, all right, you know, it's entirely possible, understanding that certainty is not uh, easy to find in these conversations, but it's entirely possible that we're going to need to stand up vaccine distribution efforts and testing efforts again and again and again. And I want us to sort of not pack away all of our... Uh, tools for doing that. And I, I want us to be thinking about, all right, we've had two years of experience now, what should we have learned from that? And I want us to be thinking about, um, all right, if other providers haven't stepped up, how can we make sure they will in the future? And again, I know that's an awful lot to ask of people who are understandably exhausted. Uh, but I, I just think, um, as you've uh, explained quite clearly, Dr. Cody, if we're facing an uncertain future, then we have to plan for that uncertainty and uh, not be limited to being reactive when uh, the next manifestation of the virus presents itself. I'll stop on that one. Uh, I would like to say thank you for, I, I asked for the data and uh, you provided it. Uh, and, uh, you know, I understand there's a range of views that we hear about the efficacy of what's been done at the federal, state, and uh, county level, but I, I do think um, whatever the debate may be about individual uh, approaches or actions that have been taken, uh, the mortality data that you prevented, uh, while very <sighs> heavy stuff indeed, um, was consistent with my back of the envelope estimations that I shared with the board a few weeks ago, and you brought much greater precision to it. Thank you for that. I think um, clearly folks in this county have been doing something that has minimized the death toll in a way that can only be described as uh, dramatic. Uh, I mean, we're not talking about, you know, five or 10% here. We're talking about, you know, 50, 60% uh, uh, lower mortality rates than uh, we're seeing at the national or state level. And that's, as you said earlier, something that um, uh, we really, I think, can take some satisfaction in and that uh, folks out there who have been making these sacrifices should uh, be reminded of because I think it's important that they understand that their sacrifices have not been in vain, that, that you know, there's a friend or a neighbor or a family member who's going to sit around the dining room table with them next week who wouldn't have been there but for the effort that people have made. Uh, these are not just statistics. They're, I know you know this, but I, I think it's hard to remember that in the moment of... Uh, sacrifice, the moment of aggravation, uh, the moment of discomfort, uh, the moment of real economic pain and loss uh, as people have made these sacrifices. Uh, I do want to continue to push on uh, non-traditional distribution methods for testing and for, uh, you know, finding new ways to connect in the community because uh, I think if we've learned anything over the last couple of years, it's that uh, this extraordinary, and I mean that in the literal sense, extraordinary pandemic is going to continue to require extraordinary responses, uh, however much we might wish it were otherwise. Uh, finally, Dr. Smith, uh, you know, I, we heard a lot about the, the, the waiver issue, the mandate issue, the employee issues, but, you know, could you just sort of give us the short, simple version of sort of where does that stand? Uh, I mean, we've got, 
I, you know, listening today and having asked these questions previously, it, it seems to me we've got uh, a directive from the public health director who was authorized by law to, to make those directive, offer those directives, excuse me, issue those directives, I finally get it right, uh, and that a waiver can be requested that you are the key uh, uh, staff member in terms of determining whether or not a waiver will be requested. And that uh, that judgment is the public health directors and then yours as to the waiver request. And you've made your best judgment. And uh, we've obviously still got some folks who are unhappy with it, but um, your thoughts about sort of where that rests and where we're headed in the next few weeks and months, because this is obviously an issue that is um, causing considerable consternation among some segment of our workforce. Well, um, let me just reemphasize um, with regard to the county operations, the county executive is the one who would assess staffing and whether or not there's a need for a waiver, um, limited waiver request. With regard to all other operations, San Jose, other cities, uh, other hospitals, um, you know, skilled nursing facilities, other congregate settings, those decisions are made by their um, chief executive. So with regard to just the county functions, um, it boils down to um, our fire department, our EMS system, our jail, and um, the uh, juvenile hall, and the health, health and hospital system. So each day we get a report, I get a report about the outbreaks, the staffing, and the needs in, the, in those systems. At this point, they're able to meet the staffing requirements. Um, that being said, as the board knows, there are some of those institutions, particularly the jail where they've been operating on sports overtime for decades. Um, and so the thing that I'm looking at is whether there's a significant change or significant number of employees that are out. Um, so far, it's all been stable, but every day I look at it, every day I make a decision, and if there comes a point where staffing becomes critical, we'll apply for a limited waiver. I will add a couple of things that were brought up I think uh, Supervisor Ellenberg alluded to them. Um, addressing the jail in particular, um, the outbreaks or inmates have decreased and we're starting to see a slow decrease in um, employees who are resistant to vaccines, but we are seeing a slight, well, significant increase in the population in the jail, which is pushing um, the capacity of the facilities to be able to isolate. So I would say that probably is the biggest factor in uh, assessing the staffing requirements because isolation requires more staffing. I'm watching that carefully and we'll make a decision about that you know, at the right time. But I am very concerned because we know <clears throat> that um, Virtually all of the outbreaks among inmates in the jails have been caused by transmission from people, employees, not necessarily correctional deputies, but employees bringing the uh, infection into the system. So we want to try to make it as safe as possible because these inmates are our responsibility. We have they have no other choice. We have the responsibility to make sure they're safe. So we're being very careful about it. Thank you, uh, Dr. Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That uh, covers my questions for today. As I said, my colleagues were kind enough to ask uh, three or four of the questions I was uh, gonna ask. So I don't need to take up any more airtime. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll just close with a couple of comments. Dr. Cody, it's what is so tough for the public is that 
four unrelated adults can go into a restaurant and sit across a table for a couple of hours eating a meal and drinking wine without a mask on. And that's allowed just because that's, that's allowed. Um, I'm hearing about the correctional officers. I'm hearing about the firefighters. Jeff, I think the comment about the jails have had forced overtime for decades is an issue we have to address and, and resolve that so that is not the case anymore, um, pandemic or not. But Dr. Cody, what I'm trying to figure out is if people can eat in restaurants without masks across a linen cloth table, why can't law enforcement, our law enforcement that we're responsible for? I think of firefighters. I, I think about them with the, they can have a shield on, they can have a mask on, they can have a mask and shield on. I'm trying to understand the distinction that's being made, not just within Santa Clara County, but the state of California. Um, can you shed any light on, on that at all? Because I'd feel a whole lot safer on a gurney with a firefighter over me with a mask on than I would sitting across the table from somebody who tells me they're vaccinated. And I don't know if they are or not. And I know so many people that were vaccinated and got Omicron and they never reported that information to the county. So they're not in our figures. And last but not least, I know we're up around 93, 94% now in Santa Clara County of people 12 years of age and older being vaccinated. And I, I go back, whatever it was, a year or something ago when there were conversations about herd immunity and we wanted to get to 80%. So if you can help me with those kind of things in a closing type manner, I'd, I'd appreciate it because I don't know what to tell people because of the let me yeah. let me try because I think your question is really more in the legal responsibility realm than a public health realm. When you're going to dinner and having wine across the, across the way from somebody that you don't know, that's your choice. Um, and the person on the other side of the table, that's their choice. But when you're an EMT or a firefighter or correctional officer. You're dealing with our patients, our clients. They don't have a choice. Ah, okay. So the real issue is our fiduciary duty to keep attention to the health of our clients. Um, Thank you. That's a great without answer. A, without a choice, they rely upon us to protect them. Thank you. That that's a great answer. I I think you could be a doctor or an attorney with that kind of thoughtful uh, an analysis. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Smith. That's going to help me talk to people when they say, how come we can be doing this and they can't do that? It's because what, when we're having dinner, it's by choice. And otherwise, we're public servants serving people and we want to do so responsibly. Okay, well, I hope very soon we're dealing with something, something different than this topic. That's for sure. Supervisors, any other questions? Nope. All right. We are now going to move on. Uh, Dr. Cody and Dr. Kamal and Dr. Smith, thank you all very much for your time and expertise in this matter. Board members, we are now going to move on to hearing 15, 16, 20, and 21 together. For any members of the public that had been wishing to speak on those items, 15, 16, 20, or 21, please register electronically so we can have you in the queue and we know what to do. With that, we'll start with item 15 and, talk, and start with Dr. Smith on our mid-year yes. review. Yes, Mr. President, members of the board, um, this is our mid-year review. As the board knows, every year we take this opportunity to review the actual expenditures and revenues that have been uh, received and expended uh, for the first six months of the fiscal year. And we essentially revise the budget that you adopted last June um, based on those revised revenue and expenditure calculations. We try to keep the mid-year uh, really filled with only technical 
adjustments. However, there are some minor additions based on particular critical needs that we see. This year we have very bad news. Um, so I wanna lead with that. It's a bad message for the mid-year. The problem is that our expenditures for the COVID response have been quite extensive, well over a billion dollars. Now we anticipated when we um, approved the budget last year that they might get to a billion three, but it looks like they're gonna be far beyond that at this point. We also anticipated that we would be getting some revenue from the feds, particularly from FEMA. We were just told last week that um, FEMA is well behind schedule with regard to reimbursement. They are still trying to deal with claims that were made nationwide in 2020. So we locally have put in requests, uh, claims I should say, for over $200 million. And we've received actually only 40 million and haven't heard uh, back about the remainder of the claims. It's a very long, uh, complicated process, but suffice it to say, it means in the process, we have to assure that the documentation of, of eligibility and we go through a lot of paperwork and we send them a claim and they have to come back and give us a preliminary decision before they actually make the funding. So fundamentally, um, we're spending more than we're getting. And it looks like that will be continuing into next year. So in the mid-year, we also give you a view of what we're seeing as we project into next fiscal year. And because of those facts that I just mentioned, um, we're in a difficult position. As the board knows, the budget is a matter of matching allocations with revenue. It's not specifically related to cash flow. Uh, we've talked about that before. We currently have cash and we're using cash to pay off bills, um, but we don't have the revenues projected to be coming in to match to the expenditures. We've spent over a billion dollars, as I mentioned, on uh, pandemic related expenses. Most of that is personnel expenses. Much of that is not reimbursable by FEMA because they only will reimburse expenditures that were unanticipated in the personnel realm. So when we have DSWs working from other departments, um, that's not claimable as reimbursement. Uh, when we have DSWs working from health and hospital, some of that is reimbursable, but not all of it. So we're looking at a situation where we're gonna have to be very careful about our expenditures and very careful about our new revenues. Luckily, our property tax revenues are improving a little bit, but um, we will be asking you to be extremely prudent until we have a better idea what's gonna happen next year. Also in the question mark range is what is the state budget going to do? As you know, the May revise, well, the governor had his proposal in January, the May revise is coming in a few months. Uh, there are a number of proposals that will have effects on local government uh, significant effects in health and human services. Uh, we also know that there are actions going on at the federal level that may have further impacts. So we're at a particularly delicate spot in the financial progress of the organization, knowing that we have lots of expenditures and having lots of responsibilities, but not having real clarity about where the revenue is going to come for come from to deal with that. So as you look through this mid-year, you'll see it's a conservative approach because we think that we need to be that way in order 
to prepare for next year because we don't see things getting dramatically better for quite some time. And we think the pandemic will last for quite some time. And since you're considering 20 and 21, at the same time, I have a few words to say about 20. Uh, this is consistent with what Supervisor um, Committee was talking about being prepared for the future. We're asking you to approve a number of positions, many of them unclassified positions, to function basically as our permanent DSWs. Permanent DSWs will be able to be reimbursed by FEMA, but of course, it'll be months to years before we actually see that reimbursement. However, it's an option for us in order to maintain the normal functions of county government and still be able to maintain our pandemic response and do it in a way that's potentially reimbursable by uh, FEMA. So with that, I'll turn it over to Greg Aturia, who has a presentation about the mid-year. I just want to end with a strong and clear message. This is not good news. We need to be very prudent in the future. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Go ahead, Greg. Okay, good afternoon. This is Greg Aturia, County Budget Director, and I'm going to share my screen. Did it look like I did that successfully? Yep. Very good. Okay. The uh, report that's in your packet, as well as this presentation, is divided into four sections, and I'll cover it. Um, uh, it took me about 10 minutes to get through all of this, introducing the, the highlights and key takeaways, the uh, a, a detailed uh, COVID-19 fiscal update, a review of the budget modifications in the for the budget for the current fiscal year, as well as a, a preview for next fiscal year's situation. The comprehensive analysis that went into the mid-year review included a great deal of work between uh, my office, the Office of Budget and Analysis, and the fiscal officers from all of the county's departments where we very uh, closely examined all the expenditure activity and revenue activity for the first six months of the fiscal year. And from that analysis, we were able to project what the additional cost and revenues are gonna be for, for this fiscal year to help us identify what adjustments are needed in the current year budget to keep it an accurate record of spending authority for, for expenditures based on actual expenditure trends and actual revenue receipts. This analysis uh, did identify and the mid-year adjustments do address uh, a, a significant deficit that emerged due to the, the pandemic. Please recall that this budget was adopted in June, you know, before we had a lot of the pandemic response activities Omicron, uh, et cetera, for this fiscal year. The report also provides um, our report of the projected base budget situation for next fiscal year. This is our terminology for what the status quo level of staffing and services will cost next fiscal year, what our revenue estimates are for next fiscal year based on current law and funding levels from federal and state dollars, from federal and state governments. And, and based on this, we also see that we're trending towards a mild operating deficit that we will address in the recommended budget. As Dr. Smith mentioned, the, the vast majority of the budget adjustments are generally corrective and true up adjustments. I also thought this would be a good time to point to the public. I know the the board is already aware. But in December, we learned that the Government Finance Officers Association awarded the County of Santa Clara, I believe for the very first time ever, uh, their Outstanding Budget Presentation or, uh, Award. And as the, the board knows, much work has been done in the last couple of years to increase information in the budget uh, document, 
and you know a wide variety of transparency and context improvements and we've got national recognition uh, for that so i thought this would be a good time to point that out regarding the covid 19 fiscal update as dr smith mentioned uh, a, a tad over a billion dollars in costs have been incurred so far for the pandemic response and actually as of this morning it was 1.025 billion in total expenditures and, and encumbrances last summer our estimate was 1.3 billion by june 30th 2023 and clearly we're on pace to to meet that mark well before june 2023 the costs are tracked and analyzed daily for quick reference, I put it up the county's uh, website site address for the dashboard for this cost tracking. And uh, so anyone can see that as costs are, are tracked and reported um, um, uh, on an ongoing basis, we can see the growth and where the cost growth is occurring. No, much of, but certainly not all of the county's operat operational costs for the pandemic response are subject to FEMA reimbursement. FEMA, for the most part, uh, will reimburse certain um, extraordinary costs above what's typically uh, budgeted or typically incurred, and is mostly focused on, on services and supplies uh, needed for vaccination operations and distribution and, and certain um, uh, uh, response costs um, that fit their criteria. However, other pandemic response costs must th therefore be funded by uh, other sources. There are some other specific federal uh, grants and allocations that have been received that have a narrow focus and a narrow allowability. Then of course, there is the, the broader, more general American Rescue Plan Act, federal funds to fund more broadly pandemic response costs that don't have another funding source. And then uh, the source of last resort, the county's limited discretionary funds. And I do want to emphasize limited. The, uh, as the board may recall, this time last year in the mid-year review process, the, uh, uh, the board uh, agreed to allocate as much discretionary resources as possible to help cover costs for the, the pandemic response. And then again, last May and June, if you recall, uh, reserves were had to be significantly reduced. All this to provide funding sources for costs, primarily for costs that we believe FEMA will reimburse in a future fiscal year. And as, as Dr. Smith had, had mentioned, we are learning that FEMA is, is overwhelmed and, and severely backlogged simply on the claims received from 2020 let alone haven't been able to begin on claims that they're receiving related to 2021 or 2022. Of the COVID uh, fiscal uh, uh, expenditures, approximately one third of the costs have been payroll related costs. This has been consistent throughout the response. You may recall last summer when we spent time going over the fiscal update. It was also approximately one third at that time. And this is very um, important to focus on at this point because it has a profound effect on the rest of the county budget and the, the, the measurements and, uh, and condition that we've assessed here in the mid-year review. The, the, the vast majority of the county's employees have as their fund, ultimate funding source, typically um, non-discretionary revenue sources. They are funded predominantly through federal and state allocations and grants or fee revenues that are restricted in nature to uh, their normal working condition or working uh, services. And so we do have a significant hole in the county budget here at the mid-year that we need to address, where we have employees that have been diverted from their normal work to work as disaster service workers, working at sites such as vaccination uh, uh, sites, testing sites, contact tracing uh, support 
et cetera. And for the salaries and benefit costs for those employees, we are uh, not allowed to charge the normal funding source. I'll give a couple of illustrations, though there are many. For example, a road maintenance worker who in our budget is budgeted to be paid, have their costs uh, for their salaries and benefits paid out of gas taxes that can only be used for road and bridge maintenance. When that road maintenance worker has been diverted to work at a vaccination site, we cannot, uh, we're not allowed to charge that cost for that salary and benefit during that time they're at the vaccination site to gas taxes. We have to find another funding source. We have the same challenge with child support service officers. With most of our employees at social service agency whose funding source is a federal or state source, such as the CalWORKs administration grant or uh, a SNAP administration grant, et cetera. I could, I could go on with dozens of examples, but I think you get the point. So this is the hole we have to address at mid-year. There are only two allowable funding sources uh, remaining uh, to, that could possibly backfill those. One, of course, is county discretionary dollars, which we're running um, uh, out of, so to speak, besides what's needed to pay for the rest of the county's operations. And then there's also the American Rescue Plan uh, uh, Act funds that, that are an allowable source. So this helps, I think, provide the nexus to talk about revenues. The ultimate funding source for pandemic response, um, we, we have to carefully manage on the front end, even though we don't know for perhaps in many cases years, ultimately what FEMA is going to, to reimburse, we have to analyze each of these costs as they are being incurred. And certainly before the close of this fiscal year, have to make determinations. And so we have uh, an order uh, that we go through. Uh, the first is to apply the most restricted federal funding source. And this is, you know, of course, limited to the restrictions placed uh, by the source. And then the second is to look for what cost we have a high level of confidence that FEMA will eventually reimburse, even if it is years down the road, we have to make a, a determination or best estimate of, of what's likely to be reimbursed. And generally, this is going to be for services and supplies, temporary workers, things are, that are outside the normal budget, over and above the normal budget, um, but not for county personnel costs for, for regular uh, employees. That's, uh, FEMA has already been clear about that. Uh, then third is the application of American Rescue Plan Act. I'll use ARPA for short. And generally, this is going to be uh, allowed and used for county personnel costs that cannot be charged, that cannot charge their salary and benefit costs um, related to pandemic response to their normal funding source, as well as um, other response costs. Um, that FEMA won't reimburse and there's no other funding source and of course costs approved by the Board of Supervisors. And then ultimately, uh, when there's no other source available, there's the county discretionary resources. And, um, but as, as, as mentioned, this is where we're running out. The, all that we were able to capture in our mid-year true up is around 40 million of uh, discretionary resources that could be used to help front costs that eventually FEMA will reimburse. Also at the bottom of the slide, I, I put uh, uh, like we did for the expenditure side, I've got the link here for the, the new dashboard for cost tracking, revenue tracking. This is relatively new. I think it's been up there for a, a few days now. So I wanna make sure everyone has access to that. I want to take a look. And, and so this is a view uh, of the revenue dashboard and you can s get a sense of the proportions for what we've actually received so far. And I'd like to take a couple minutes to speak to, um, uh, to these, at least the larger ones. I believe there's important context for each. First is the Coronavirus uh, Relief Fund or CRF. This was part of the CARES Act. You may recall that term. This is the first set of federal funding that uh, local governments received to help pay for initial pandemic response costs 
uh, the county's allocation was 189.6 million, and that has been completely exhausted or completely spent since, um, uh, and again, funded costs in the early part of the pandemic response. And then the next is the American Rescue Plan Act. So this is a, a total allocation of 374 uh, 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 million. We have received cash wise, the first uh, tranche, uh, approximately half of it last May, and we'll get the second tranche, the, the remaining uh, an additional 187 this coming May. So it'll be this fiscal year, therefore it makes it available in, in its entirety for, for use this fiscal year. And if the, just real quickly, if the, just to remind the board of that 374, some of it has already been appropriated uh, earlier this year by the board, approximately 75 and a half million of that has already been appropriated. In your actions under consideration uh, right now, I mean, items 15, 16, 20, and 21, the administration is recommending appropriating 135.5 million for that to cover uh, pandemic response costs that are already uh, have already been been incurred or expected to be incurred in the remainder of this fiscal year for, for our response. So just to give you the map real quick, 374 minus the 78 and a half minus the 135 and a half means there would still be approximately 160 million of unappropriated and available. ARPA funds um, uh, after the mid-year budget actions. Um, then next, I'd like to speak a little bit about the pro provider relief fund. These are federal funds that are restricted and limited to offset the impacts of the hospital system. And so far, the the county has uh, received and used uh, 100 and and 17.9 million. And this is what is uh, uh, described as phase one and phase two of the PRF. We are still anticipating two more phases. Phase three, uh, uh, hopefully, is something that we would receive this spring, although there's no certainty that we're gonna get it this fiscal year. There's, uh, there is still some degree of risk that it would uh, be received after the close of this fiscal year. Then there's phase four, and phase four is you know, much more likely to be uh, in, in uh, the next fiscal year, certainly after phase three. Both those phases, while we don't know the amounts, we are currently estimating that each of those phases would be approximately 40 million each. So, uh, so we're looking at perhaps 80 million in additional provider relief funds. Um, we just don't know how much would be received this fiscal year versus next fiscal year. And then third, uh, next, I'd like to um, cover the FEMA. So far, we have received $42.2 million in a FEMA advance. So this is not a claim reimbursement. This is an advance from FEMA for vaccination uh, distribution. And in, in the, the mid-year review, on, uh, in fact, in, in our packet on, on page uh, 44 at, at, in the, the mid-year review, asking the board to allocate 19.1 uh, uh, million of that to cover costs for vaccination distribution and response so far. That is different than what's already been submitted for claims. I don't know if, if uh, you're able to see the details to the right, but so far in our revenue dashboard, you can see that we have submitted uh, 137.2 million in, in claims from um, the, the county's um, uh, general uh, response. Uh, separate from that, the uh, VMC, Vitaly Medical Center, is also uh, putting the finishing touches on on, on their claim. And when they get that uh, uh, submitted, it of course will be much more than that uh, that will be claimed. Uh, I would anticipate exceeding 200 million. Um, the, the fine point there is that we'd be submitting these claims. We have submitted many of them 
but we do not anticipate getting a reimbursement from FEMA uh, uh, for these claims till some future fiscal year. Therefore, it's not available to help be the funding source for the cost this fiscal year before we close out. And that's why there's such a, a high need and a high demand to use discretionary dollars for uh, to the extent that we can to front costs. Okay, I know I covered a lot there. I'm, I'll try to uh, wrap up uh, the rest of this a little more quickly so we can get to questions. So the, so the recommended budget modifications in your packet include the many traditional adjustments, recognizing additional fund balance, replenishing the, the county's general fund contingency to the board policy level, and uh, you know, adjusting expenditure appropriation revenue estimates to, to, uh, to, to based on actual revenue and, and ex expenses, correcting errors, funding the pandemic response costs uh, to date, as, as well as what's anticipated uh, for this fiscal year, allocating the ARPA for, for non-FEMA allowable costs. But it also includes funding for a couple of uh, uh, initiatives and directives that the board made earlier this year, including funding to expand the, the primary care access program the, uh, to fund the loan to close the gap for the educator workforce uh, housing, as well as funding the development of the supportive interim housing sites. These are the challenge grants that we think could support up to 1600 units. And then it also uh, eliminates the general fund reserve we had for the special recall election because the state ended up funding that uh, uh, election uh, instead of having to rely on the county general fund for that. So to, to put numbers to this, the recommended actions add 7.8 million to replenish the contingency reserve back to the target, the, the target of 5% of general fund revenues. Uh, it gives us back to the 184.6 million. Uh, again, the $8 million reserve, coincidentally, 8 million uh, is, um, is no longer needed. And it also provides a, a kind of a cleanup action transferring 3.5 million from one IT reserve to another information technology reserve. This is part of a process we started last year, if you recall, to get those reserves out of the general fund and into a standalone fund for greater transparency, I would argue, but also to make it very clear to access those funds that we would need to come back to the board each time for specific funding out of the IT stability fund for uh, any additional funding for IT projects and services. Regarding next fiscal year, the, for the most part, I'd say uh, at least 90% of the budget is, is put together for what we call our, our base budget for next fiscal year. This is where we've estimated the, the costs and, and the revenues and for uh, the general fund, as well as the funds that are dependent upon discretionary uh, resources for support. There is a mild, uh, uh, is, is my description, uh, deficit in the base budget at this point where costs are exceeding uh, uh, revenue growth. And of course, this calculation is going to change regularly as we get new uh, updated uh, cost uh, uh, estimates and revenue estimates. In this year, more so than most, a precise projection is, is, is challenging due to the unpredictable nature of the pandemic and uh, due to you know, potentially significant funding decisions by higher levels of government, federal and state uh, budget decisions yet to come. With all this being said, this is why we provide caution and a, a call for prudence. Uh, the cost to provide county services continues to grow faster than the revenue growth, despite a resilient tax base. And a lot of this is because of that cost growth and, and pandemic response uh, uh, cost as well. So our challenge for the next budget cycle is going to you know, be maintaining a structurally balanced budget while addressing community needs, our, our safety net, s maintaining our service instructor in, uh, infrastructure and core services. And then to wrap up, just as a reminder, 
where we are on the timeline for developing the, the fiscal year 22-23 budget. Department budget proposals are due to my office uh, on the 11th of this month. And then throughout March and April, we work very closely with the county executive and departments to review and analyze all of the proposals and ultimately support the county executive's development of a balanced recommended budget for board consideration. That document for the balanced recommended budget will be distributed by May 1st. Budget workshops have already been scheduled for May, 5th, May 16th, 17th, and 18th. And the budget hearing has already been scheduled for June 13th, 14th, and 16th. So at this point, I'll stop my presentation and turn to the board to see if there's questions for Dr. Smith or myself. And you are muted, President Wasserman. Thank you very much. Dr. Smith, do you have anything else to add before I turn to supervisors? And again, any members of the public that wish to speak on items 15, 16, 20, and 21, please register now. I guess um, I would add that with, I'm already mentioned, uh, item 20 has to do with uh, ongoing COVID response as well as item 21, um, because we're, as I mentioned, uh, anticipating that COVID response is not gonna be ending. So we're recommending creation of unclassified and classified positions in order to maintain a response um, and plan for the future as was mentioned earlier. So that's what those two are for. And then um, item 16 is a salary ordinance with a few positions at mid-year, which are based on need and usually, and in general have to do with performance and response of various parts of the organization. And then in addition to that, we will be as Greg mentioned, we're going through the process of finalizing a um, level budget, a current base budget, and then we'll be uh, asking the departments for proposals. Um, but for the most part, we're not gonna ask them for any in increase in uh, uh, costs. We're asking them for more efficiency and we're focusing this year in our budget requests upon measures of success rather than expansion. As I mentioned, um, between now and the end of the fiscal year, there's lots of, lots that's unknown. Um, we're counting on some more money from, uh, to the health system uh, from the state and the feds. Um, we're also, hoping for some more um, federal relief. We're exploring the possibility of additional loans from FEMA. And uh, so we're giving it our all to try to maximize as much revenue as we can recognize at all. So with that, I'll be quiet and ask for questions. Super, thank you. And 40 minutes ago, I asked for public speakers. 30 minutes ago, I asked for public speakers. And five minutes ago, I asked for public speakers, and we don't have any. So, Peggy, I want to close the public speaking portion, and I'll start with Supervisor Lee, who has his hand raised. Uh, thank you, President Wasserman, and thank you, uh, Greg, for the uh, detailed report. Uh, certainly, it covered a lot of things, and uh, I'll try to uh, uh, make sure I understand the type of funding that has been coming through. So. Um, Going back, looking at the chart of all the revenues, uh, the big funding that we first got, we call it the CRF, um, that was $189.6 million. That, and that basically is all long spent. That was long gone. First uh, money it came in. Then the second thing is the PRF, the provider one, which is $118 million. And again, that's also spent as well. But you say there's some additional phases coming in, probably around $80 million more. We've got a FEMA uh, advance of about 42 million so far, uh, and that we have, we have submitted about 137 
uh, and change uh, for, for reimbursement. But then the VMC is going to submit a much bigger reimbursement, expected to be exceeding 200 million. Um, those are the big numbers. So I just want to make sure that I understand those. And of course, given what we're looking for, the FEMA uh, reimbursement working for at the end of the day of what we're requesting probably will be what closer to half a billion to a billion. Is that a fair statement? I guess I'll jump in, Greg. Did we lose you? Okay, there we go. I hit my my unmute button twice. <laughs> I hate the way it happens. Yes. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah. The only clarification I want to add is the uh, regarding the the FEMA claims, mm -hmm. and and so yes, about one hundred and thirty seven point two has been submitted so far. Mm -hmm. and, and then the the, uh, the claims that uh, VMC staff are working on, um, I, I think uh, looking like it's going to be a little over another 100, maybe uh, 100 to 130. And, and you know, of course, they're still being worked on. We don't have a precise number at this point, but to give you a range, if you add the two together, that's when you get over 200 million. And so okay. just, uh, just uh, you know, just that's the only clarification Total. I think I want to make there. Okay. All right. Okay. So, um, and then one of the issues that you mentioned, the problem with the FEMA reimbursement is we could get reimbursed uh, for uh, things that we paid for, but when it comes to salary, it's a big problem because it's basically excluded, especially in light of the fact that we did a lot of the DSWs where those are employees of the counties anyways, so they don't look at that as additional expenditure, and therefore that's why we're not getting those reimbursed. Is that correct? Yes, uh, that is correct. But it still leaves a hole in our budget because uh, because we're county, which may be different than maybe some cities or, or other local governments. But uh, the vast majority of our counties have as their, their normal funding source restricted funds, federal and state, state grants or other fees that are restricted in nature. And we cannot charge uh, the, the cost of the employees for the time spent doing disaster service work to those restricted funding sources, to a restricted, uh, like, like a, 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 a permit uh, revenue or a grant or a state allocation um, or a federal allocation, we're, we're not allowed. And so we have a hole there that we have to identify another allowable funding source, which we're limited at this point since we already spent the CRF. All we have left that's uh, kind of discretionary in nature besides our normal discretionary amount is the American Rescue Plan Acts that have been provided by the federal government to help pay for these types of things that FEMA won't reimburse. Right. But the PRF is something that you said we'll be getting another probably another 80 million in some, we, some yeah. fashion. Yeah. Yeah, we have a high degree of certainty that we're going to receive funding in 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 phase three and phase four. Mm -hmm. We are uncertain of when we're, we're going to re receive that. Our best estimate for purposes of, of planning, our best estimate is that we would likely receive phase three this fiscal year and likely receive phase four next fiscal year. But again, these are uncertain. It's just for planning purposes. And excuse me, Supervisor Lee, I think Dr. Smith wants to respond as well. I was only gonna make the point, um, you know, we do have, as Greg pointed out online, our expenditures for COVID and our revenue sources. I just wanna make the point for the board and members of the public that these are ever-changing numbers um, moment to moment and so we try to keep them up to date but they're not necessarily real time because the way our reporting goes um, costs don't show up in SAP immediately um, so they're within a realm but changing constantly um, so I don't want people to believe that those are exact numbers as of now they're the best we can get as of now okay thank you dr smith uh in terms of the initial fundings of crf that you mentioned what 189.6 million that money has been received and spent and there's no more phases on that one right that's that's a done deal correct that's correct okay thank you um going to our report uh on various issues here on 15a um, I asked a question earlier, and I think there was some confusion. I just want to double check with you uh, regarding the issue of the fuel uh, sales. 
uh, as some uh, would remember, the county has switched to uh, provide the unleaded fuel responsibility started this year at Reed Hillville, right? Um, and for that, there's certain some type of uh, revenues has coming through and, and, and adjustment as well. So on page 39, the report stated that it would increase the appropriation uh, by 3.68 million in object two and object four. And then they thought there will be a revenue for 750K in funds 061 uh, due to these uh, changes. Um, and that would result in some type of 2.93 million decrease in fund balance. Could you explain that to me? Because uh, these numbers seem very large uh, and doesn't seem like it's just only related to fee only. There might be other stuff going on. Thank you. Yeah, I think there, there is some other things going on. And I know that um, uh, the roads and airport department is working on a companion um, a document uh, that's going to be coming to the to the board uh, to um, seek some additional uh, funding for some of that fund balance. So um, so this is only part. This is the part where we're recognizing some some revenue estimates and moving funding around within the current uh, uh, budget. Um, but it's only part of it. So maybe that's the reason why the numbers look uh, a bit large because they're still in need uh, for some additional funding. And I know that uh, the department's working on uh, a ledge file to come at a future board uh, to seek some ad additional uh, uh, funding, uh, uh, likely a loan request or, or a, a general fund, you know, ad advance of some sort. Okay. So, so my my main point really is that because this is a pretty large number, we're talking about the decrease um, of funds, like close to three million dollars, according to report. I guess my my real question really is by switching the the, the responsibility of fuel sales, we are not subsidizing it by millions of dollars to sell the fuel, right? We only subsidize a little bit, as far as I know, correct? If at all. Yeah, that, that's correct. Much of that number, again, it's, it's going to be addressed in a future report, has more to do with the construction costs, safety improvements, where the cost for some of the safety improvements is is is, is going to be higher based on most current uh, uh, estimates as, as we're finding in a lot of construction uh, projects. Okay. And I know the department's trying to work on an updated estimate and come to the board. So that's a big part of that. Great. So uh, we expect it is the off agenda or actually maybe a full agenda report regarding the breakdown of these uh, different costs of the construction and the fuel sales as well in the future? Yes, yeah, to be a full agenda report and, and, okay. and then uh, also a request uh, to the board uh, regarding funding solutions. Okay. All right. So that will be coming back to us. Thank you. Um, the uh, uh, other question I have is on page 24 of the report, there's also a one-time increase of $2 million to support the COVID-19 response activities facilitated by outside contractors. So I would just like to uh, get some uh, clarification on the funding source on if this money is, will be coming from general fund uh, or OPER or FEMA, where would that be coming from? This is the, the $19 million for vaccination, right? Yeah, we've already got that's what am I, am I asking about the right thing? Um, I believe there's some type of a two million dollar increase uh, for public health. I think that's what I'm reading on oh. page twenty four. Yeah, yeah, that that is an additional uh, two million dollars a general fund uh, for right now, and then right. they then they are going to to the extent that we can, we're going to try to build FEMA, and we just don't know the amount at this point for what FEMA is going to uh, to reimburse on that. This is the challenge we have in a number of fronts where we have fee where we believe are FEMA reimbursable costs. We right. have to use uh, a discretionary uh, resources to pay for it this fiscal year, uh, understanding that FEMA is not gonna reimburse us until some future fiscal year. Okay, all right. Well, I'll, that's all I have for the time being. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Dr. Smith, your hand is raised. We got an email asking about charging to FEMA, and I want to try to explain a little bit. Um, there's been quite a bit of discussion we've had in the past that um, we can't double charge the state or the feds. So if we have an expenditure that we think qualifies for FEMA reimbursement, we go through the 
claiming process, we cannot uh, try to claim that from another source. And that means that we need to use discretionary dollars from the county, um, which is basically cash. We still pay the bills. We still have to make the uh, budget balance, but we don't uh, we don't recognize the revenue from FEMA until it's approved, and we have a guarantee from the feds that it's coming. Thank you very much. If I may, may just one comment on that. That's unique, not unique. Um, it's just the scale is different. We've had that with uh, wind storms. With, with floods, with fires in the past. We, we've always had this as a challenge, but we've always had uh, you know, enough in reserve to handle the smaller amounts. The scale here is just different than yeah. past e events that it, it required FEMA reimbursement. Thank you very much. Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. Um, I wanted to just go back um, and ask sort of a broad question relative to uh, reimbursement. Um, and make sure I understand kind of the overall charts that were shown. So the, we anticipate by the end of this year, uh, over the two year period since COVID hit, we would spend approximately a billion dollars locally in response. Is that accurate? Yeah, the, the billion dollars has already been, uh, uh, that's how many costs have been incurred to date. So those are expenditures, plus um, contracts that have already been uh, encumbered and guaranteed. We just haven't paid the invoice just yet, but you add the two together. And as of today, it's 1.025 billion. Okay. And we uh, also, in the <clears throat> summer, we anticipated or predicted 1.3 billion by the end of the fiscal year. I think we will have to reassess that and you know reproject. Personally, I think it's gonna be more like 1.5 billion, but you know we're not going to put that into stone until we have a chance to re readjust. So, um, of that 1 billion, and I just want to be much more broad, uh, 1 billion of expenditures that we know of to date, we anticipate through the FEMA process getting how much of that back into the county's. Um, offers and for that we don't have a, a strong estimate at this time uh, we, uh, we have uh, the 137 that's already been claimed i'm aware of you know um, uh, final touches being put on claims for an, another 100 to 130 million related to the hospital every day we incur uh, fema reimbursable costs especially uh, through some of these spikes we've seen you know some, some large amounts, there's going to be more claims put together. But as far as what the end result is, we, we don't know. We, we don't, and we also don't know what FEMA is going to actually reimburse. You know, so there's, there's maybe two different questions of what we're going to eventually claim, which is an unknown. And then another unknown is what they're going to actually reimburse. So I, I am very interested in understanding, um, given that we, what you've just said, that we don't know um, what we're going to claim, and we don't know what will be reimbursed, um, how that impacts um, projections or resources and cash flow over the next two to three years. And um, that, that would be helpful to understand. And what I'm wondering is, um, can you all be prepared during the budget, the, the budget in June to review that with the board. Yes, we'll be reviewing that with the board and we'll be reviewing it here weekly with uh, OBA. And I think we're all asking the same questions. Um, you know, budgets are always projections. Uh, there's always built in some uncertainty. This year, there's a lot more uncertainty, a lot more uncertainty, mostly because our expenditures are quite uncertain. In a typical year without a pandemic, we can project our expenditures pretty well because 
We know how many employees we have. We know how many, they, how much they cost. We know what the contracts are. We know how much they're going to cost. We know, you know, utilities and the like. In the normal year, um, we're very good at predicting expenditures, and we have some uncertainty with regard to revenue because we don't know property taxes as reliably because that requires us to predict turnover and purchases. And we obviously don't know exactly what the state's gonna do. This year, for the next fiscal year, um, and for part of this fiscal year, both sides of the ledger are moving constantly. So projections for both expenditures and revenue are um, really difficult to do. And that's why we're trying to give you our best conservative estimate today in the mid-year, and we'll do the same during the um, regular budget cycle. So um, so given that, that um, that's something that is being worked on, um, you know, on a weekly basis with um, OBA and I'm sure with our outside consultant. Um, I, I guess what I'm wondering is if, if we if we have a if, if are we still working on the process? I, and what I'm really asking is um, why we don't have that for mid year versus end of year. Is that more that it's still a work in progress, Dr. Smith? Sure, I understand the question. Why we don't have what? The, the, um, you know, it's the the framework around what we're going to claim and what we anticipate being reimbursed for. Because I, I didn't realize what you just said, Dr. Smith, a minute ago, was that this is something that you're working on on it on a weekly basis. And so I, I was just wondering why that wasn't part of mid year, given, given the point you just raised about how, how, how. Um, how many balls are in the air and what, what has you worried? Well, this is the mid-year projection um, in front of you. Um, I think what Gar Greg is trying to say is that our final amount of claims and our final reimbursement and our final time of reimbursement is still up in the air. But as far as right now in mid-year, what you have before you is what we have as our best projection. In, in, if, this is Greg, if I may. Uh, in our report, you know, we do have an estimate for, for this year that we do need an, an additional approximately 40 million in discretionary revenues, which uh, the adjustments uh, uh, provide right. for that. And it's on uh, page 26. I'm looking yeah, at that yeah, right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. so we think that's the amount that, that we need to go out in front for costs that yet to uh, uh, need to be covered that we want to, we expect to claim for FEMA. And then um, what we don't know yet, and, and I thought this was, what I thought I read too, into your question wrong, perhaps I did, is what are we expecting next fiscal year? What do we think our pandemic costs are gonna be between July 1, 2022 and June 30th, 2023, that would be FEMA reimbursable. That is the crystal ball uh, question that- Well, what is, I'm wondering is, yeah. is that given that we've been at this for a couple of years, we've hired outside consultants, there is a huge fear about the amount of money we've spent, what we think we're gonna get back over what period of time. What I'm really trying to ascertain is whether or not when we look at the budget in June, I'm going to be able to see the, the um, with, with more clarity, what you see relative to where we have um, risk and what, what's the delta of the amount of money that we, we really don't know what's going to happen. And, and the reason I'm asking this question is that when I was looking this document over, and I, I have a couple of other questions relative to this, and Dr. Smith has um, been very focused on helping us understand that the environment we're operating in is, is full of moving parts. It's difficult for me to understand, based on the presentation today, what that what that um, that risk uh, looks like. Is it a half a billion dollar risk? How much of it is one time? How much of it is ongoing? And I absolutely recognize that you know we we don't have control over um, property taxes and all of those other pieces. 
but I'm having a hard time um, adding these numbers up relative to the amount of money we're spending. So that that's really what I was trying to understand. If what you're telling me is that we will have more information in June, great. If we can't have more information in June because we, for some reason, don't have it today, that's really what I'm trying to understand is the reason we don't have that information is it just information that we don't feel confident we can ascertain. Well, we'll have more information for you in June, but as I pointed out, the numbers change basically on a weekly basis. So we will have in May, May 1st, our best projections for the next fiscal year. Um, okay, so I'm gonna switch, switch areas of requests for information. And I wanna just talk a little bit about the hospital. And in particular, I'm looking at the um, cash report that was sent out to the board on February 7th. And by the way, I really appreciate this report and I wanna thank the staff for it. It's, it's very helpful. And there were two areas that raised uh, concerns that I wanted to better understand relative to the budget discussion we're having today. One is that the, um, that the general fund cash balance was almost what well, was $170 million lower in December, 2021 than it was in December, 2020. And, um, and it looks here that there, there's a really good explanation about increasing uh, payroll costs, which makes a lot of sense to me. But, but my question is, as you think about this relative to the June budget process, how or if, how does our cash flow weigh into uh, recommendations if it does today and recommendations that we're going to see in June. Yeah, this is Greg. Yeah, I could maybe speak to this. Of course, there are a number of uh, ins and out any given day uh, payroll timing and, and revenue timing as you alluded to. But I share your overall trend concern if that's what you're getting at that the cash position generally uh, is declining in large part to us paying for the pandemic costs that the, the federal government uh, will not reimburse until a future fiscal year. So it very much ties, in my view, to the, this discussion, the analysis and, 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 and calculations we've made with the, the mid-year. And, and, and certainly that's gonna be uh, a part of uh, our planning for next fiscal year. It's not only looking at having a structurally balanced budget, but how do we manage our anticipated cash flow as well? As part of that, um, could you speak to that same issue relative to the to the hospital? And this goes back to the reason I'm asking the FEMA reimbursement question is it's hard to, it's recognizing that FEMA reimbursement will come further into the future. I, I understand that, but I'm also looking at that same memorandum that it it looks at the negative 563 million compared to a negative 290 million between December's 21 and 20. So from, from yeah, if, could you just, if you know, could you speak a little bit about that relative to the hospital? Because again, I'm wondering, is that money that's, that's gone forever or is that money that is uh, gonna be reimbursed either from FEMA or other sources? Yeah, well, there's two things there. So one is the, the FEMA, and and uh, is, is, is similar to what we have in the general fund. Uh, there are going to be costs that FEMA is is going to reimburse in, in the future, so there will be catch up for that. As I mentioned, just for this fiscal year alone, I, I think there's going to be looks like between 100 and 130 million of that's going to get claimed, and and we should be able to get that. So so that part of it is certainly you know one time in nature and will get caught up. And then some of the other parts uh, is a timing thing. It's, it's the challenge we've had for quite a while in that the federal and state government will fund a lot of their, what we call supplemental revenues a year or two in arrears uh, after mm -hmm. the expenses. So there's just a timing thing. And to some degree, it's just frozen in time. Um, and uh, with that uh, uh, one to two year lag on, on, on reimbursements. So it's a mix. 
and Greg. And I'd that, like to add a little bit more to that. Um, our accounts receivable in the hospital and clinics are very large, and that's because um, the vast majority of it is with accounts receivable from Medi-Cal and Medicare. And as Greg points out, that's because they delay their reimbursements and the supplementals. Um, so we know that our cash will get better in the hospital over time, but of course we don't know how much uh, FEMA is going to, I mean, uh, the pandemic is going to cost the hospitals. We're beginning to see some stabilization as Dr. Kamal pointed out earlier, our numbers of, you know, COVID related inpatient uh, visits are going down and we're starting to see some improvement, but um, the costs are still a little unpredictable because of COVID. Right, and what, what my follow-up question was intended to be was to see whether or not the, the timing of the federal government in terms of repayment was also strained by their strained resources as well, you know, staffing and COVID and the like. And so could that mean that we have to wait longer than we normally would for reimbursement? Well, certainly from FEMA's perspective, they are being restricted. That's why they're, you know, not really processing claims very well going all the way back to 2020. With regard to the non-FEMA related reimbursements, which are mostly Medi-Cal, Medicare, um, we know that they are slower than they've been in the past. We haven't been specifically told why. Presumably it's because of COVID, but could be other things. And then we also have um, the changes at the state level, which um, will have some effect on that reimbursement schedule. Yeah, um, that's actually the, my follow-up question was gonna be about, right. about that change. That's exactly right. And, and do we, yeah. I mean, I think that would be some really important information just to have again, as we get into the, the June budget cycle as to what the states, state and feds anticipate their, their um, repayment, you know, uh, repayment timelines to be if they could update us because I do recognize that transition is going to be a little confusing and that that brings me to um, one last question on this section and that is that I know that um, the, the different ways we get paid particularly as it relates to behavioral health are, are all different pathways to how we get reimbursed with CalAIM it looks like there's an attempt to actually integrate all of those payments that 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 payment infrastructure is that accurate what i just said yeah that's generally true we're um calaim is a multi-year process to reform a lot of things about medical but one of the major reforms is as you point out the um reimbursement for behavioral health which was categorically separated initially when may managed medical occurred so there was a whole different reimbursement structure which still exists and the plan is to reform that and make it more like a medical model reimbursement instead of being instead of doing billing based on minutes of visits you do billing more based on um, number of visits but that hasn't been worked out in regulation yet and we're not expecting clarity about how that's going to be done until 2023. It'll be a major reform because it'll be rethinking behavioral health reimbursement completely, but it is a great approach because it means treating behavioral health problems just like any other medical problem not related to your brain. Um, so um, right. That's... I guess, yeah. And Jeff, the reason I was asking that question is that it does seem like from a reimbursement perspective, and I'm really thinking about this more as it has to do with cash flow for the healthcare side of our organization, and, and perhaps even other parts of it, but the health, healthcare, behavioral health, that in a way we would be closing up books on this current way we get reimbursed, which
which looks like it's still going a little slow, and then a whole new process for reimbursement and making sure that we have some, um, some cash reserve that's gonna recognize that new business model may also have some challenges in terms of reimbursements, which are not only gonna be hard on us, but are gonna be hard on our, our um, clinic partners as well. Yes, you're right. Um, what would in the private sector be called operating capital will be important for us to have as that changing business plan occurs. And in our world, that would be called reserves. And you're right, we need to prepare for that. Thank you, I don't have any other questions. Thank you, Supervisor. Vice President Ellenberg. Thank you. How's the sound now? It's good. All right, glad to hear that. Um, Greg, thank you very much for the, the report and Dr. Smith for your, uh, for your addition. Uh, thank you both for the addition of the revenue dashboard uh, that was added just yesterday and the inclusion of slide seven in today's uh, presentation. I need to continue to review the information, but with the significant ongoing cost of direct COVID response, specifically looking at testing and vaccination operations, I'd like to know first, and, and I'll pause after the first question, how much revenue have we been able to recover to date from insurance uh, reimbursement for people that have private coverage but have come to the county for testing and VAX appointments? Well, I can, I can speak to it uh, uh, partially because there's kind of two categories. One is going to be for, um, for the costs that are incurred within the, the, the hospital system and patient billing is really mixed when they go and, and bill insurances. They could be, you know, a billing for a wide variety of services for the patient while they're in the system. Some of them could be uh, uh, testing or vaccinations or whatnot. But the, the other group is going to be outside of that system where, um, and that's where, uh, the, you know, of course, uh, uh, there's the effort to try to recover as much to hospital billing as well. The last number that I heard, which is a, is a bit dated, was I think it was 12 million by the end of October. I don't have anything more current than that with me though. 12 million from October of 2021. Yeah, through October, that's how much I think, uh, that's how much was collected from you know uh, uh, outside insurance for the uh, vaccination uh, uh, programs that were conducted outside of the hospital system, you know, at like Levi Stadium, uh, fairgrounds, uh, things of that nature. Greg, it's twelve. So I was one of those people that got the vaccine at the uh, actually got my McGilbert High School and had to give my my health net insurance. Is that twelve million? Does that represent? Um, 80%, 5% of um, the, what we should be able to, uh, to get reimbursed? Yeah, I don't have that with me. And we'll, obviously we'll have to uh, uh, consult with others too to make sure that we're getting uh, the right information there. Okay. Yeah, I'd like, like to get that information because certainly we have a record of every person who got a vaccine. We have their, infer their health insurance information and I would just like to confirm that we are billing the insurance, the private insurance companies in, in every instance uh, for reimbursement. So I'd like to get that, um, I think on an off agenda report because certainly well in advance uh, of, of coming back together for the budget. And okay. tied to concern, great, thanks, thanks so much, Greg. Tied to concerns that were raised by my colleagues in the last item, what steps are being taken to assure that our residents utilize their primary care providers for these labor intensive services, especially considering the updated order for health systems that Dr. Cody issued about a week ago. Probably and, Dr. Smith. Yeah, that's, I think that's a Dr. Smith question. <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, can you rephrase the question again? Sure, when, when, we, when we did the COVID item, uh, we talked about these labor intensive and expensive uh, services that the county is standing up um, in many cases in lieu of people going to their primary care providers. What steps are we 
undertaking now to assure that residents utilize their primary care providers for those labor intensive services. Um, again, especially considering the updated um, order for health systems that Dr. Cody issued about a week ago. Um, related to the testing and vaccination, um, yeah. we're not diverting patients away, but we're trying to motivate their primary providers to do the vaccination and testing as much as we can. Um, you know, obviously you would agree we don't want to turn people away when they show up, um, but uh, we are informing people over the um, web that they can get the testing and um, vaccinations at their primary care site. Regarding ER visits and um, hospitalization, we use our same procedures um, as before we bill for those services that are um, supposed to be covered by private insurance. I don't know if that answers your question. Right, I'm, I'm, I'm less concerned about the hospitalization and and emergency room, but really thinking about the the COVID specific uh, the vaccinations and and tests. And I appreciate that we are pushing out the information. Um, I appreciate that we're not turning people away. I certainly want to make sure that we are getting, in every case, their health insurance coverage and that we are billing for it. And, and that's what the what the op agenda report I'm asking for should address. Uh, but do we have a, a stick for violations um, by the private health systems if they are not doing their part? And are we relying wholly on a um, self-reporting or patient reporting complaint mechanism to drive that? I must be a little <clears throat> dense today. <clears throat> Can you try that again on me? I'm not sure I understood. Sure. How are we ensuring that that um, that the primary care providers are providing these services? Given that we've got a health, we've got a, we've got an updated order that says that they need to do that. How are we ensuring that it's, that the order is being enforced? I guess um, I would say that we're encouraging, we're not policing the effort. Um, so will we have metrics to know if we are successful and if our um, private hospitals are in compliance? Or will we just need to presume that if our numbers go down? You're talking about the public health order that requires vaccinations mandates, right? Or what are you, is that what you're talking about? I'm lost. Maybe uh, County Council has an idea of what what's going on. We we want our private healthcare providers to provide to their patients vaccinations, boosters, and testing so that everyone is not coming to the county, which is extraordinarily expensive and has placed a huge toll on our general fund in many cases. We have now an order in place um, directing the hospitals to provide those services because they had, some of them in some cases, were hesitant to do so. That's what I'm asking about. Yeah, I can, I think, clarify. We have a health order that is, it only applies to testing, not vaccination. Okay. Um, and the health order requires large health systems to make testing available for their patients, uh, including those who are symptomatic, those who are close contacts, or those who are recommended for testing by either state or local public health guidance. We have enforced that order in the past, and we are doing additional enforcement with respect to that order. Entities are subject to fines uh, under the order. We are active in those enforcement efforts. Um, the business compliance unit has gone out, for example, to 
once again check that the notices are out. There's requirements that in the coming few next few days, the uh, revised order just took effect uh, yesterday. And there are requirements under the revised order for affirmative uh, communication to patients. And those have to go out by a date certain and we'll be validating that that has occurred as well. And we are prepared and will be imposing uh, fines in the event that there's non-compliance. We also encourage anyone to submit complaints to sccovidconcerns.org. We are following up on a number of complaints that have been received from members of the public with respect to that order. But just for clarification, the order only applies uh, to testing, not vaccination. Thank you for, for clarifying, James, and thank you also for describing um, some of what we hope uh, will be a motivating force. I know that my colleague, Supervisors Favas and, and Comidian have been talking about this uh, for the better part of, of two years. Uh, and I think what we're seeing now is uh, the tremendous expense incurred by the county because we have done our job and then some. We have not turned anyone away. Uh, and I'm not advocating that, that we should have, but as a result, I think, I think it's important to look at the consequences as a, as a result of not turning anybody away. We have absorbed tremendous costs in, in materials, in um, infrastructure, and certainly in, in labor. So I, I think it is just absolutely critical for all of our health partners to, to understand uh, the position that we are in, to understand that we are a county government uh, really set up to serve the most vulnerable folks in our population, not all uh, 1.9 million, and to really um, help us as, as good, strong partners. Uh, and thanks again, James, for clarifying that. Uh, I want to also share a concern uh, raised by Supervisor Chavez about estimating the overall portion of our total county expenditures that have or will be claimed by, by FEMA. Um, can, can, Greg, can you help me understand how this is tracked on a, on a rolling basis? And just to give context to the question, I've heard the statement that we've received 42 million so far and another 137.2 million has been submitted. That seems low compared to our overall spend of about a billion to date. So I, I understand the breakout of deployed staff in dedicating funding sources not being in, de in dedicated funding sources not being eligible for FEMA, but I would have thought that contracts and supplies would be largely FEMA eligible and a higher portion of our ex uh, our expenditures. So can you talk about how we are uh, how we are doing that? Yeah. So as as costs get incurred, whether it is through you know the 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 direct payment of a vendor or the issuance of a contract. Uh, we, our fiscal staff and all the departments that are involved have a coding system where they, where they tag uh, a number to it. To, to basically, it's inside the system, but it lets us know this is a, a pandemic response re uh, related costs. And then as each of these transactions, and there are literally thousands and thousands of transactions, uh, as each of them are incurred, they are reviewed by uh, fiscal staff and the controller treasurer's office. They have a consultant uh, that's been brought on board to, to help. And each individual transaction is analyzed to determine what is the, uh, the, uh, the best bucket, so to speak, to pursue for ultimate uh, 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 payment. Because as was mentioned earlier, you can't double dip. You can't, you can't claim it to one source and also claim it to another. So everyone has to have its unique targeted funding source. So that's what that analysis has done on, on, on a flowing basis. And I, I shared the, uh, the, the preferential order in the, one of the slides, that the most restricted federal uh, state funding sources first, then take a look. Uh, if, it does, if it's not eligible for those, is it eligible for FEMA? If it's not eligible for FEMA, then you know, is it eligible for ARPA? If it's not eligible for ARPA, then, uh, then ultimately the discretionary resource, which is, of course is the most limited actually at, at this point in time. I understand the, the system and the funding. Um, what, I'm, what I'm asking about or, or observing is that um, uh, the fact that we've submitted 137 roughly million dollars in, in um, 
unris in outstanding claims. We've submitted that. We've only, we've gotten 42 million back, but we've spent about a billion to date. Are we? How much more of that billion do we anticipate um, submitting to FEMA? Yep, and that's that's the crystal ball question. In 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 large part because we don't know what future costs we're going to incur related to the pandemic response that are going to be FEMA eligible. So I would think though that at any any point in time that we would have a snapshot of how. Uh, of how all expenses reviewed by the consultant would break out into the four buckets. Um, why, I, I think that's what Supervisor Chavez is asking for, if I'm, I don't want to reinterpret your, your question, but, but that's what I'm looking for too. I, I don't understand why we can't have point in time snapshots. Yeah, I can I can go back and, and take a look with the controller treasurer's office, see what there is. I know many of of the costs that have been incurred or still have not yet been you know, tied to a, a, a funding source, in part because they, they're working with the consultant. Um, there are questions, you know, with FEMA, too, uh, to get their sense if there would be an exception, which so far we're not, we're not uh, getting favorable responses from FEMA about uh, you know, giving a special treatment. Um, so there is dialogue as well. And so um, you know, the, the point in time might be a little trickier in that many of the costs don't yet have, aren't, aren't, aren't married to one of these ultimate fund sources. But I can, I can try to find out what we do have uh, with the understanding that there'll be caveats, of course, for things like that. Of course. I think uh, the other thing I'd add to that is that um, I know the disparity between a billion dollars and 400 or 40 million <clears throat> sounds huge, but remember FEMA is not going to pay for, and therefore we're not going to be making claims for most of the personnel costs, which are a huge portion of the billion. So, um, that's, so that's why we're looking for these four breakout buckets of what we anticipate to be in each of them. Again, so we can understand the size of the risk. If something is certainly not FEMA eligible, then we don't have a risk there. We know that we have to find another funding source. I think we really need to be more granular and, and I'm certain that this is extraordinarily complicated, but it's also critical that, that the five of us, that, that the five supervisors who are the fiduciaries and who really represent the public, that we can understand all of this and defend it. So um, the detail and the clarity really, really is important. Um, I just have one other related question. Um, if the status of FEMA claims and the ongoing accumulation of FEMA eligible expenses by the county, um, I, 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 well, let me put it differently. I'm wondering if the status of FEMA claims and the ongoing accumulation of FEMA eligible expenses by the county might be something that um, FGOC would be willing to review on a regular basis to make sure that we're clear going into the annual budget. So I'll look to Supervisors um, Chavez and, and Lee rather than try to give work to another committee. <laughs> um, well, Supervisor Lee um, is seems to be away, but yeah, I, I, that makes a lot of sense. And it's probably helpful for the staff to get to run through it with a couple of us before they come to the full board. So that makes sense. I, I would expect that to happen. And um, thank you, thank you uh, all for the for the work and for pushing forward and for the continuous improvement process. Thank you, Supervisor Smithian. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And let's see. I think we can make all systems go here. Um, well, I have been intrigued and gratified to hear the conversation thus far uh, about <clears throat> the cost of what I'll call non-participation by some of our healthcare partners. And I, I have struggled with this one as was referenced for the two years we've been at this. Uh, and, and the way I have framed the, the, the model 
is that while our county is not typically the healthcare provider for 2 million residents, we are the public health agency for all 2 million residents. And that poses a challenge when other partners don't step up and do what we would consider their proportional fair share. And, you know, Mr. Chairman and colleagues, the mo most recent number just happened to stick in my head from, you know, a month or two ago was when I looked at the Sutter numbers, the Palo Alto Medical Foundation numbers, and we were informed by our staff, our county staff, that while Sutter Palo Alto Medical Foundation had 16% plus of the um, patients in the county, that they had performed only, excuse me, that they had provided, uh, actually, I think it was just two and a half percent of the booster shots. And forgive me if I've misremembered what what numbers go with boosters versus tests. I think now in benefit of hindsight, it was, it was, but I just remember the disproportionate share of 16% as compared or contrasted to two and a half percent. And I do think it was on, on the boosters. And, you know, that's a conversation we could have about many of our providers here. But as Ms. Ellenberg has, I think very uh, clearly underscored this isn't just an academic issue of you know who's who's doing their fair share or not. It's um, real dollars taken away from the mission of the county and our ability to serve others. And as I said, we may not be the provider of record for two million people, but we are the public health agency for two million people and have to respond accordingly. Let me go to. Um, Mr. Uh, Williams and, and just get some clarity. I, I heard you uh, refine and remind us that the, the directive, the order from the public health department, as I understand it, is specific to testing, but does not apply to vaccinations or boosters, presumably. Did I get that right, Mr. Williams, through the chair? That is correct. And I'm trying to recall what it was we had in place in the way of guidance, direction, orders uh, a year and a half ago when uh, vaccines were in the offing and people were in fact directed that they had to say yes if somebody asked for a, a, a vaccine um, pursuant to the protocol of who was first in line, second in line, third in line. Was that only because we were actually the provider of the vaccines, except for the multi-county entities, as I believe they were called? That's right. We provided direction that providers could not refuse to provide vaccine to um, persons based on their insurance or whether they were a patient of that facility. But that was very different in structure from the testing order, which requires um, access based on certain timelines and so forth so it's it's a it was a, it was a totally different structure and it was based on the limited availability of the actual vaccine itself and does that mean that irony of ironies the multi-county entities which i believe were primarily two uh, kaiser and uh, sutter pamph were were not subject to that requirement because they were getting their vaccine directly from the state well, they were as well because they actually did receive some vaccine from us in addition to their state allocation. And we made that a condition of the receipt of that additional vaccine from the county. Well, I, 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 wanna, I wanna first be sure I understand who's responsible for what. Presumably the, the order on testing was issued with uh, obviously guidance and consultation with your office, but that's ultimately a, a judgment call for the public health director, yes? That's correct. And would that be the same for any order about providing vaccines or boosters? Yes, and indeed that was true of the vaccine allocation as well because it was a state allocation through specifically the health jurisdictions, the local health jurisdictions. So, 
you know, we, we had an extended conversation earlier today uh, about COVID and here we are again, but is there any reason, and I understand you're not the public health director, but given the financial consequences, as well as the human consequences and the public health consequences, is there any reason why our public health director would be precluded from issuing an ordinance if she or he chose to do so? In this case, uh, it's uh, Dr. Cody, so uh, if she chose to do so, any reason they would be precluded from uh, issuing an order saying, you know, if you've got a, a, a patient uh, and they uh, are uh, timely for a vaccine or a booster, you are obliged to provide it. Uh, same with testing going forward. Any reason that that can't be done? None that I can think of. All right. Uh, well, I'm sure that will be revisited. But uh, again, I appreciate the fact that, you know, while we've been talking about this in a largely public health context over the past couple of years, the, the cost implications that were underscored by uh, Supervisor uh, Ellenberg's questions, I thought were um, very, very uh, much on point. I'll just let it go at that. Um, let me just say, Dr. Smith and Mr. Ituria, I think um, there's good news and there's bad news, which I guess is a variation on the one hand, on the other hand. Uh, it, you know, the, the bad news is that FEMA hasn't denied as much as they might have, the, uh, uh, or the good news, rather, is that they haven't denied as much as they might have. Uh, the bad news is, is because they haven't uh, even processed our applications yet. Uh, is that kind of where we stand, Dr. Smith? Yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, you know, we can um, project what we think will be eligible, but, um, you know, the responsiveness from FEMA is pretty much zero at this point. So they it's an iterative process. They have to work with us in order to decide what claims they're gonna pay and which they're not gonna pay. Got it. So to the questions from my colleagues, and I, I, I wasn't surprised because I think we're all trying to figure out what the future looks like here with uh, limited ability to do that. Um, you know, excuse me, essentially what I hear people asking, or at least what I'm, what I'm going to ask is, is there some ability to say, look, we think we've got a quarter of a billion, a half billion, a billion, a billion and a half outstanding. We think we're going to get 90 cents on the dollar, 80 cents on the dollar, 50 cents on the dollar, do the math, and then say, here's our best estimate, understanding that uh, we won't know until uh, the decision is actually made. Is that is that kind of how you're approaching this? If 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 not, you know, how are you approaching it? And why? Well, we've been approaching it from the standpoint of not projecting things that we're not pretty sure of, um, because of the timing and cash flow implications. Um, even if something is claimable. Um, there's no guarantee it will be paid within the next five years. Um, you remember all of the hurricanes and um, uh, typhoons, or not typhoons, um, flooding in the South. You know, many of those expenditures didn't get paid for a decade. So what we're trying to do is give the board and the public an accurate picture of what we think will get paid soon, which means really just the claims that are approved. Um, but now that I understand what the board's asking for, we can certainly go back and give you an idea of what we think and our consultants think should be claimable with the big caveat that we, we don't know until we get some responsiveness from FEMA. So we can't book it until we have some certainty. Yeah, no, I, and I don't mean to be flip at all, but I, I, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't count the money until FEMA's check clears the bank. I, I mean, I, I that's kind of, kind of how I, how I see it, um, and, and I, and I mean that quite seriously. It's, it's to your point. It's, um, we don't know what they'll approve, and we don't know when they'll approve it. So you know, with those two big gaping holes, it's uh, a little hard to, 
plan for the future. The only thing that would be worse is if we didn't know what our future costs were going to be. And it turns out we don't because uh, we don't know what the future of the pandemic is going to look like. So we're kind of 0 for 3 on having certainty or knowledge about um, you know, issues that would help us budget. And Dr. Smith, again, not to take poor Mr. Iteria's work and you know, smudge it down to uh, a sentence or two, but it sounds to me like you're saying there's a lot we don't know, there's a lot we're not going to know, and since we don't know and won't know, uh, you are encouraging our board to be a little bit more cautious than usual and reminding us that that will present some cash flow challenges along the way. Is that the summary of this hour-long conversation that I should share with my constituents when I go back to sidewalk office hours again? I think that's pretty much it. Um, you know, from our administrative perspective, we strongly suggest that we make commitments based on what we know and what we can rely upon in the near future. Um, and that means we have to be more prudent. Now, with any hope at all, um, things will lighten up and our expenses for the COVID pandemic will decrease and we'll get some more responsiveness from the feds and the state. But I don't wanna give people false hope that that's a guarantee in any way, shape or form. Got it. Uh, just two more questions, Mr. Chair, although there they're, uh, could be um, more than a little bit of a question. So Dr. Smith, on that cash flow issue, uh, and uh, I'm asking this because I just I want to make sure I have it clear and that it's a record. Um, our board has previously allocated uh, $25 million. Uh, Supervisor uh, Ellenberg and I uh, put forward a measure that the board approved for a loan fund working cooperatively with California Rebuilding Fund. Uh, only about $6 million of that $25 million was part of the first drawdown. Uh, I know our board uh, asked, and I certainly agreed, uh, let's not send them money that they aren't going to move out in the form of loans. But it's my understanding that they are getting close to the uh, end of that first $6 million and are likely to come back for subsequent tranches. Um, I know you're using that $19 million, if I'm reading the budget uh, right here, uh, you know, that was allocated for uh, this purpose for other purposes as part of the mid-year adjustment. But uh, can we count on your ability to find funding in some other source, uh, you know, if would they come back for, a, you know, a next installment, obviously not 19 million, but whether it was four or five or six million uh, for the next tranche, is that going to be doable using one of these sources so that we are following up on our earlier commitment and the vote of the board? Let me try to put it in a bigger picture. Um, you know, we are aware that the board has intentions to invest in a number of different programs and um, some of those from ARP, some of them from other funding sources that the board wanted us to use. So at this point, in terms of actual allocations, we're suggesting we do it in um, sort of a piecemeal approach. So like you're saying with your particular program they're referring to, um, once the current allocation has been utilized, the, we'll expect them to come back to us and we'll consider a, another allocation, but not doing it all in one big shot. Um, I think the same is true with a number of other programs that the board would like to see us invest in. But what we're saying in the budget really is you can't allocate it yet until you have some uh, details behind it. Otherwise, that allocation puts the money essentially in a reserve. And that would mean that we'd have to start cutting resources. Yeah, so I don't want to do that. Dr. Dr. Smith, I get that, but the word that made me a little bit uh, discomforted is when you said consider. This is a vote of the board. We already voted to do this. I mean, I've got paperwork stacked up here beside me that I can, uh, you know, sh read into the record, if you like, about what vote we took on what date. And we said we are doing it. We're committing $25 million. The only caveat was that we were not going to put the next uh, millions of dollars in place until there was a need to draw them down. So 
you know, absent a vote of the board to reverse direction, I, I believe we are entitled to expect you to fund those programs in the budgets you bring us. Yes. Yeah, I think you should erase the like the word you didn't like. Okay, I I, I would be pleased <laughs> to erase. Say, I'll I'll just agree with what you just said. All right, I'll I, I'd be pleased to erase it, and I just, um, yes. you know, I'm I'm trying to be a a, a a a good soldier here about accepting the fact that the funds that were allocated previously are being reallocated, and I understand the sense of urgency about that, but uh, I just want to make sure that that doesn't mean that. The next tranche is uh, at risk uh, if there is a legitimate demand after the first six million has been used. I'll let I'll take yes for an answer, uh, Mr. Uh, Wasserman. I could see you. hoping I will take yes for an answer, so I will. Last question, Dr. Smith, is um, you referenced earlier my remarks, and uh, you hit the nail right on the head actually about um, these disaster service worker positions that we're talking about. A couple hundred folks here. And, you know, I think um, a lot of folks, uh, certainly those closest to the county's operations have been asking, you know, how long can we keep uh, doing this? How, how long can we, you know, take care of the county's day-to-day -day business while so many folks have been tasked with so many other urgent assignments? And uh, so I, for one, just want to say, I'm pleased to see that there is some thinking about all right, how do we manage this in the future? Um, I do have this question, which is for some of the budgetary reasons that you and Mr. Ituria have already uh, described, um, these folks are not uh, sitting in what I will sort of flippantly describe as the Department of Disaster Service Workers. They are being assigned to various uh, departments and agencies within our county and budgeted as codes in those various departments and agencies specifically, yes? Um, there's a variety. Some are in the in OEM. Well, I guess what I, what I want to ascertain, and, and, and if you can provide some assurance, that would be helpful, is precisely because we don't know what the future holds, I just want to make sure there's enough flexibility. And when the next uh, emergency lands on our heads and we are saying, you know, whether it's fire, which we've had, flood, which we've had, pandemic, which we've had, that we're not told, well, we can't use these people to respond to the immediate crisis because they're not in the right department. Can yes, I that's correct. All right. Then uh, looking at Mr. Wasserman, I will take yes for an answer a second time in a row and say thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. I think Supervisor Chavez raised her hand. Uh, thank you. And, and um, Supervisor Simidian, were you referring to the items in uh, 20 and 21? The uh, disaster service workers, if I may, through the chair? Yes. Uh, yeah, yes. 20 and 21. Yes, and is. thank you. And uh, is staff going to present on that too, or is this the time to weigh in on that? You can weigh in on that now. Jeff's already spoken on as far as 21. Okay. And I we got some 20 done in the budget presentation, but please go ahead, Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. Um, on on this uh, this uh, so first of all, I'm also very excited to see this new um, Office of Emergency Services really being fully staffed. I, I think. We've learned a valuable lesson, and I think with climate change, we're we're just going to see a lot a lot more of this. But I but I want to ask, um, just I, I, the hard. So I don't I don't actually understand from reading the staff report, um, Dr. Smith. Um, where are are all of these positions going to go to OEM? Or I mean, I, I know some are going to go to housing and the and the like, but is the are the bulk of these employees going to the Office of Emergency Management? Um, I don't yes. know that I would say. Yeah, yeah, yeah this is Greg going yeah. to various places. Yeah, go ahead, Greg. I was going to say, yeah, initially, and I and I think Supervisor Smitty and uh, uh, hit hit the point there. Uh, initially, in Office of Emergency um, Management, but they'll be providing support. 
through uh, multiple departments. And part of that is, is the need for flexibility. And, um, uh, you, know, you know, for example, uh, knock on wood, I hope I'm not gonna jinx it, but what if we had wildfires this summer? Um, or what if we had some other type of event right. and, you're, what, and you're working on multiple incidents at one time, the flexibility is needed. So here's what my, my concern is, is that I, I literally have never heard us use the word flexibility relative to once we put someone in a position. And I, and I, I don't mean that like I, there are roles that people <laughs> play and they go from, from being in a role, right, then to becoming disaster service workers, which is the model we just used. So what I'm wondering is with the placement of these um, positions, uh, I, three questions. One, if we're, if based on the way these positions are hired, can they be FEMA reimbursable versus us using disaster service workers? Well, let me, let me try to jump in on that. That's the intention is we're trying to create a cohort of employees that um, are not assigned to specific other tasks that are therefore going to be reimbursable by FEMA. And we're trying to balance that with questions of permanency. So you'll notice a lot of them are unclassified positions so mm -hmm. that there is the possibility um, that if we don't need them, you know, then we don't utilize them. But some of them are classified because we know that we're gonna need um, efforts um, to manage the pandemic on an ongoing basis, and we don't see <clears throat> that slowing down anytime soon. In terms of flexibility, because these are county positions, um, they'll obviously have to comply with their <clears throat> minimum qualifications, but we will be able to reassign them to duties across the entire county um, but they won't be doing normal departmental business. The departmental business will be done by <clears throat> the current DSWs who can be sent back to their home department. So, um, and I, I, I was reading, I was reading with interest the, the, the DSW um, versus these employees. And I, I just wanted to reiterate that what would, well, that, I, that if that's the intent, that we're structuring this in, in a way that we've used our FEMA consultants to help us determine that that is, that that, that, that creates an opportunity for us. So I, I just wanna put a pin in that for a moment and then ask the follow-up question. Dr. Smith, the, the director of OEM, the Office of Emergency Management, who is that now? Um, right now it's Dana Reed. And he reports to the county executive. So, um, so the, the the all of these positions will go under Dana Reed's position to as a broadly, and then report through you, which is why this says county exec because it's county exec because the OEM is Im embedded in your office. Yes, right. Okay. They won't technically all be in the same budget unit, but they'll all report operationally for directions through that structure, yes. So um, I, I think this is really a very important step forward. And um, I am very enthusiastic about you having the team you need to be able to deal with these issues on an ongoing basis. I, what would be helpful for me um, is that if, as in, in the next maybe one or two meetings that we have with FGOC, if the structure of, of this um, new expanded department, I mean, I know the department's not new, but this new expanded approach can be walked through with, um, uh, through FGOC or, or through public safety and justice. I would recommend FGOC because I think our, our work plan is a little lighter than yours as public safety, but I think really deeply understanding how this crew is going to work is important across the board to the county. And I'm really, I can't say enough about how excited I was to see this. It's just that there wasn't enough information for me here to say, oh, I, I can, I understand how this is gonna work relative to the experience we're, we're having right now with COVID-19. So when the motion gets made for this um, direction, I, I would 
appreciate there be a report back to FGOC before we get into the, the budget process in June so that this gets layered on top of the other um, uh, additions, Dr. Smith, that, that you'll be looking at making. Sure, we'll be happy to do that. Thank you, and I'm excited about, about the direction. Supervisor, is that your final comment? It was, thank you. All right, thank you. I think this has been a very healthy, productive, informative two-hour conversation on these, these items. Um, very important, like I said. I'm just going to make two minutes of comments right now. Um, one, I want to say to both Jeff and Greg, even if we're reimbursed 90% of our $1.5 billion, it still means we're out to $150 million. So this is a... Uh, these are very large numbers we're playing with. And getting back 90%, I'm sure we would all say, wow, that's not gonna happen because of all the salaries that are ineligible for reimbursement. I really like the program of hiring the 100 new people, the, call them the flex team, call them whatever you wanna call it. But for those individuals that will be reimbursable, should they be deployed? Well, we still have our COVID issue going on, so they can be deployed right away for that. And I can't tell you how soon I want our DSWs back in their, in the positions, Jeff, that they were originally hired for. I know that you do too, but it's, it's hurt us throughout the entire county, while at the same time, it has helped us throughout the entire county. So that's my one comment. Oh, and my 10% of a one and a half billion is 150 million was my other comment. So that ends my comments. Now I'm moving on. I'm gonna go on to number 15 now, and I'm gonna make some motions because I have it in front of me and I'm gonna read it. I'm gonna hope for a second. We can have discussion and vote and do whatever you wanna do. So 15A was just to receive a report which did not require a motion, yet Supervisor Chavez asked for a report back on that item. So I'm gonna make a motion uh, 15A to receive the report and get the report back requested by Supervisor Chavez and 15B to approve the request for appropriate modification number 110 for 628,839,968. And that will be my motion, a second by Chavez, I believe I heard. Yes. Thank you, Supervisor. This requires a four-fifths vote. Is that a hand up, Supervisor Ellenberg? You're, You're muted. Mute. The hand was good, though. <laughs> Oh, her phone's, her, her, um, it's, it's not working. Okay. Now I, for the host to unmute me. Oh, I just wanted to verify that the, that the direction on 15 also included request for a report back, please. Yes. An off agenda. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. So that is the motion and the second. This requires a four fifth vote. No further discussion. I'm going to call Peggy, if you're still with us, to do a roll call vote. I am here. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Yes. Vice President Nallenberg. Yes. And President Wasser. Yes, as well. Thank you very much. I'm now going to move on to 16. It requires a little more reading. My motion will be for adoption of salary ordinance number N as in Nancy, S as in Sandy, 5.22.81 an ordinance amending Santa Clara County Salary Ordinance number NS-5.22 relating to compensation of employees, deleting and adding various positions as part of the fiscal year 2021-22 mid-year budget review. That counts as the introduction, as the adoption of this. I'm now gonna say in my motion that we waive the reading and that we will preliminarily adopt this on February 8th, which is today and that we'll get direction for a final adoption on February 15th, 2022. Second. Second by Supervisor Chavez, thank you. Any further discussion on this item? This is item 16. Seeing none, Peggy, roll call vote, please. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Submitian. Submitian, aye. Vice President Nellenberg. And President Wasserman. Aye. Thank you. Now on to item number 20, which was held from January 25th, where it was previously item number 71. The motion will be to approve the request for appropriation modification number 70-, number 70 
for $11,122,040.50. Thanks for getting that 50 cents in, Greg. Transferring funds from the American Rescue Plan Act's fund, increasing the 2013 Measure A sales tax revenue, and transferring funds from the COVID-19 and other economic uncertainty reserve to the Office of the County Executive, the Office of Supportive Housing, and the Public Health Department budgets relating to adding positions to addressing the COVID-19 pandemic response. That is my motion. Second, Chavez. Thank you. Any discussion, questions, comments? Seeing none. Peggy, a vote, please. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. And President Wasserman. Yes. And before we move on to item number 21, I want to let anybody know who's watching at home that we are going to return in just a minute to item number 18. So if you wish to speak, please go ahead and register. We now move on to item number 21, which was held from January 25th, 2022, was item number 72. My motion is the adoption of salary ordinance number NS, Nancy Sandy, 5.22.40, which was an ordinance amending Santa Clara County salary ordinance number NS-5.22, related to compensation of employees, adding various classified and unclassified positions in the Office of the County Exec, the Office of Supportive Housing, and the Public Health Department relating to COVID-19 response. Unclassified positions shall expire on June 30th, 2023. The steps needed on this motion are to introduce, which I just did, to waive the, re the reading, which is in my motion, and preliminarily, preliminarily adopt this on February 8th, which is today. And the motion is to direct adoption, which will be the final adoption of this on February 15th, 2022, which is next Tuesday. That is my motion. Second. Thank you, Supervisor Chavez. Looking for any hands raised for comments or questions? Seeing and hearing none, Peggy, vote please. Supervisor Lee? Yes. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Yes. Vice President Allenberg? Yes. And President Wasserman? Yes. Yes as well, thank you. You are multitasking, Vice President. All right, item number 18 is going to be presented by Sherry Terrell. Sherry, yes. Sherry did, uh, I pronounce, did I pronounce that correctly? You did, President Wasserman. Thank All right, you. thank you. Thank you for being here with us today. Take it away. Great. Uh, good afternoon or evening, uh, President Wasserman and members of the Board of Supervisors, Sherry Terrell, Director uh, with Behavioral Health Services Department. And we also have Bruce Copley, our Director of Access and Unplanned Services, who oversees our mobile crisis uh, response program. Um, so before you, you have a um, report related to um, being able to uh, develop a program, a mobile crisis response team in North County. And uh, we have provided you with information related to utilization, uh, calls, um, costs associated with uh, implementing a team in North County, as well as some additional information related to um, a grant that we have applied for, which we are waiting uh, to implement uh, via the state, um, which will come online in April of 2022, along with some additional information related to overall mobile crisis response team utilization across the county. Um, so we're happy to answer any questions that you may have. Um, and so both Bruce and I are available to do that. Thank you. Sherry and Bruce, thank you both very much. I think it's a wonderful idea, but before I turn to Supervisor Simidian, um, Supervisor, would you like to speak first on this idea or would you like me to hear from the public first? Why don't I go ahead and move the staff recommendation, see if there's a second, which I I'm hope happy to see. And then that will give the public something to comment on. And then if you can come back, uh, I will be happy to speak to the item. Thank you. Let's hear from the public, if that's your will, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Simidian. And members of the public, we're going to recognize you in just a moment. You'll have two minutes to speak. And please be aware that Supervisor Simidian has made the motion for approval, and I have seconded. And the only clarification I would make, Mr. Chair, excuse the interruption, is 
Uh, I know Ms. Terrell meant to say North County slash West Valley, and I say that since I now have the privilege of representing you in Los Gatos, sir. I didn't want you to think that that was uh, overlooked. Thank you, and I did. I did. Thank you. I appreciate that. It's. Uh, I'm getting used to it too. All right. So Peggy, with that, please two minutes each for our three speakers. Our next speaker is Jesse Gomez. Please accept me on mute to begin speaking. Hi, thank you and good afternoon. This is Jesse Gomez speaking on behalf of PATH, People Assistant Homeless, supportive item 18. As service providers in North County, we frequently see the need for fast responding mental health support, especially for our unhoused neighbors without traditional support systems. At PATH, we see it every day. Living on the streets is tra traumatizing. Exposure to the elements, fear of harassment without knowing where to lay your head or where you're gonna get your next meal. Those experiences can destabilize anyone. We know that when people reach a crisis point, they need and deserve a trained specialist who can talk them down and get them proper support. In addition to our on-site clinicians at our housing sites, PATH is also piloting targeting clinical outreach to people experiencing homelessness in downtown San Jose. So we see the profound need for these supportive services every day. We're grateful for Supervisor Smidian and Chavez for their commitment to removing barriers to support for our most vulnerable community members. These mobile crisis response teams are a successful model and we look forward to continue to work with those teams when we you approve them today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lori Valdez. Please accept me on mute to begin speaking. Hi, thank you. Um, yes, I'm um, an impacted family member who worked over COVID with this mental health um, response team. And I just want to let you know that it's it's very important that we keep it the way we want it, that the most vulnerable, the ones with mental health crises, that they um, include in these teams, that they include the impacted community as to be part of it and oversee what's going on. And so it doesn't divert and start doing something else that was not intentionally meant to be, because like the homeless do get um, harassed a lot and looked down on, but there's people with mental health throughout our county and um, that we have this response team without police is very important. Please do not ever change that. And thank you for getting this started. And, and don't forget to include the impacted community members to be part of overseeing and making sure that it is complying the way we originally wanted it to go forward. Thank you. Our next speaker is Victor Vasquez. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Good afternoon, uh, Board Victor Vasquez, someone's Mayfair, and I, and I agree with the previous speakers that you know we uh, want to applaud this initiative of bringing uh, uh, the proper response to our homeless community in terms of mental health, and we know this also connected to the impact of racism and poverty and and the stress that's created for a lot of the people who are living on the streets. And this solution is, is hoping to uh, create uh, true healing, but also to address the basic needs of community members. And we know that under COVID, I can only imagine that such need has been exasperated and um, continues to impact all of our community members, not just the homeless community, but our Latino community that's connected to that and all our communities that are being impacted. I would highly encourage you to also continue to involve the most impacted to create the solutions, evaluate these solutions, and help us redirect these resources so that they actually serve the needs of those most impacted. And I think it's a great uh, opportunity for this county to, to highlight, this is what we wanna do. We take care of our community and that's what we do with our policy and our resources. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kirthi Kodokula. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Kamala uh, Kirti. I am a clinician on the mobile crisis response team. Um, I just wanted to um, say thank you to everybody who um, is recognizing that the need for crisis services in the community. Um, and I would also like to say that, you know, I believe that it is the, uh, it is the management's best interest for our team to support us. So we kindly want the Board of Supervisors to do something so we can retain more staff on this team because we are losing more and more um, staff, seasoned staff, even though um, we have, you know, we have actually lost less staff during the peak of the pandemic when we were working. We have been losing more staff now. So kindly do something um, and make sure that we have more staff if you are expanding codes um, and because we need these services in the community. We need them right now. Thank you. 
And that concludes our speakers. Thank you, Peggy. Supervisor Simidian, and then Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. Uh, I will be brief and say uh, thank you to staff for responding on such a timely basis. Thank you to colleagues for supporting the initial referral. I did want to underscore that uh, it's not just North uh, County, it's West Valley as well in all seriousness. Um, I wanted to ask Mr. Rao, uh, we're getting a report back, I believe in April. Am I remembering that correctly from uh, your comments a minute ago? Uh, yes, that's correct. Um, could we get a uh, status report at that time on uh, efforts to staff up for this expansion, please? I, you know, I know this has been a, a continuing challenge and I just want to make sure that the, um, the action is real uh, in terms of our ability to staff up for it. And the last comment I'll make uh, before I ask for an I vote, Mr. Chair, is just I really do think that regrettably the need for this expanded service is really undeniable. Mm -hmm. And that by uh, creating this West Valley North County uh, operation, it will take some pressure off uh, the other outposts in the county and allow them to do an even better job for our constituents in those other regions. So it is, I believe, truly of a countywide benefit, notwithstanding uh, my emphasis on West Valley and North County placement. Thank you, and I ask for an I vote. Thank you very much. Supervisor Chavez. Thank you very much. Um, a couple things that I, I'm very excited about this, looking forward to voting for it. And I want to just raise some issues that I, I would like to make sure we can get an off agenda report relative to um, what uh, Supervisor Smithian just asked for in terms of both staffing. Um, and also, I, I'm very interested in understanding the following. Um, we've received a number of um, comments to our office about this particular program. This is one, colleagues, that I told you I tried to do a ride-along with. And, and after the last meeting, when I said I'd like a ride-along, I, I got a, re a request for, I mean, I got it responded to. But it was after, like, I'm not kidding you, months and months and months of trying to get through um, I, I believe, well, anyway, trying to get through to get that done. Um, but I'm concerned about a recent decision questioning whether or not the um, MCRT work qualifies as supervised hours towards licensure, with, which limits interns or college students from receiving clinical credit. I'd like that can, to be responded to in the off agenda report. I'm very concerned about um, how we're handling and managing and supporting extra help. Um, my understanding is that we've released some extra help without, without explanation, which means that we're also putting more pressure on that team to respond because there's not enough staffing. I'm concerned about staff uh, turnover in part because of the organization not being fully staffed and the, um, and really taking a look at as we expand at the uh, scheduling too, because I think that might have an impact on on the, the strain of resources. And then also, I'm very interested in making sure that requests for training and safety equipment um, are, are being followed up on at the lowest level more quickly than it appears today. The other two requests, you know, that I would like to, or one request I'd like to make is that as part of that off agenda report, or when this comes back to the full board, um, based on what Supervisor Simidian is requesting, that the staffing recruitment and other needs are surfaced so that we can hear them from, from you all and um, not just from the, the folks that are being impacted um, on the ground, which would tell me that there are more conversations happening with those folks. I know these are really hard jobs. We really want to get the best and the brightest in them. And I want to make sure that we've stabilized what we have as we expand into a, a, a you know, a broader service model. And I totally agree with Dr. Uh, with Dr. Smithian, Joe, that um, with uh, Supervisor Smithian, that by addressing these uh, issues, it'll take strain off of the current uh, workload. I think that's very smart and makes a lot of, makes a lot of sense. Um, Sherry, do you have any concerns or questions about what I've just raised? Uh, no, I don't. We can certainly uh, respond to those via an off agenda report. Thank you, and I, I do want to just say, I know I don't have to say this, but I want to make sure that we are, there's zero, uh, 
retaliation for any of what I just asked for on behalf of these uh, workers. Thank you. Thank you. We've got a motion and a second. Supervisor Chavez, you're in favor. And Supervisor Lee, your hand is raised. Yeah, thank you, President Lussman. First of all, I'm extremely excited to see that this program is uh, moving forward, uh, hopefully after this vote. Um, and a quick question I have with uh, <clears throat> Sherry, if, uh, if I may. Um, the, the award that we are expecting to get from the Department of Healthcare Services uh, coming up is about a couple of million dollars. Uh, this will be part of the funding will be used to expand this mobile crisis service, right? Uh, the grant funding that we're seeking um, is actually going to uh, some specific activities. Um, Bruce, do you want to comment on that? Yes, <clears throat> there are actually two aspects to the two million. There's a up to two hundred and fifty thousand for uh, temporary resource development, which we're looking to add to uplift. The bulk of the uh, dollars are for infrastructure, and what we're looking at is developing a a database that can be integrated both with the um, the youth crisis and with the adult crisis and also with the trust program coming on it will integrate the ability to take calls to dispatch individuals to the community as well as provide the caller updates such similar to what uber has as to where the team is uh, mm -hmm. as they move out to to the uh, uh, the community member which will uh, help reduce anxiety. Additionally, it will provide an overall dispatch ability. So if there's a, a second crisis call, we'll be able to identify what the closest team is to deploy them, again, reducing the time between the call and actually the connection in the community. So it's a very exciting process uh, that will, I think, improve tremendously uh, the communication with the, the community uh, who calls for crisis services through our teams. Yeah, thank you, Bruce. And I do know that the Palo Alto Police Department, uh, the PERT uh, team, the Psych uh, Emergency Response Team, this is something that we will be working closely with the MCRT that we're talking about today, right? And so that system you talked about, would all those be coordinated together as well? Yes, uh, with, with the expansion of the team in North County, West Valley, there's a PERT team with Palo Alto law enforcement. So this will provide a, an integrated approach and we'll be able to better Great. identify whether the PERT team needs to go out or whether the MCRT mm -hmm. team needs to go out and will reduce significantly the, the delay in getting out to the community and dealing with the crisis at hand. Great, yeah, and that's exactly what we need so badly uh, in our North uh, County in the West Valley is uh, uh, Supervisor Smitty mentioned, and I just want to say thank you very much for that, and I'm really looking forward to just getting uh, uh, implemented as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Roll call vote, please. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. And President Wasserman. Yes. Thank you very much. We now move on to item 19. And the last item after that is 22. And item 19. Um, I can comment on I'm this. Talk, turn into Dr. Smith. Yes, go ahead, doctor. <clears throat> this is uh, related to uh, hero pay uh, for the uh, nurses who are members of RMPA. There was some concern that board members had that individuals who were in permanent part time positions who worked up to full time uh, during the pandemic received only uh, a fraction of the 2500 uh, that was equivalent to their portion of their uh, code. Uh, therefore, you know, half time received half of the 2500. There was concern to try to expand that in a way that recognized that they worked over code. So uh, <clears throat> the board has asked us to come back for authority from you to do that. We're suggesting um, that the maximum would still be 2,500 for full code or someone who was in a permanent part-time code that worked up to uh, full-time. And if they worked less than full-time, it would be the differential based on what they actually worked. We're suggesting that we take the same time period that we utilize 
for the um, extra help um, employees. So um, that's Thank the you. recommendation. Thank you, that, that seems fair. Do we have a motion by any supervisor? Otherwise, I'm Vice President Ellenberg. We can't hear you, Susan. She's getting there. Okay, I know it's tricky today. Um, I, I had a, a question first, see that there's a, a public speaker. Uh, Dr. Smith, when, when do you expect to bring this item back to the board uh, to authorize the additional uh, funds for pandemic pay? We'll consider this authorization if the board votes for it today. So I don't think it needs any further authority. Okay, then then I'll make a, a, a motion. Uh, second, then, but, um, Thank you. So we have a motion and we have a second. Anything further you wish to say, Vice President Albrecht? No, nope, that's good. Thank you. All right. We do have one member of the public speaking. So we have a motion for approval and a second. I will certainly be supporting this as well. Peggy, if you'll please give our speaker two minutes. Our next speaker is Alan Kamara. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Alan. Yeah, good afternoon, bottle supervisors. Um, this is Alan Kamara, the president of RMPA. First and foremost, I want to thank the bottle supervisors for accepting this report. And just to the public, um, I know we just talked about budget. This has no physical imp fiscal implication on the budget that Dr. Smith talked about before. Um, so this was budget that was already allocated. Just to give you um, some kind of um, context uh, about our supervisors. Currently, the RMPA bargaining unit has 3,589 members. Out of those 3,589 members, we only had 876 full coded nurses, 1,707 part time nurses, 1,005 extra help and per GM nurses, non benefited nurses. We just run that report right now just to give you, just for the public and for you all to know. Thank you. During the pandemic, all these nurses walked up, some of them up to full time just to meet the need of the crisis. And we feel at the minimum they deserve to be reevaluated and be paid the amount. And um, we wanna thank the board uh, for taking this. And we just wanna highlight, I know Supervisor Cindy talked about extra help. It is a problem in this county to have 1,005 extra help and pro GM non-benefited who are serving the community and they're not getting benefit out of this community. Um, I, this is just for you guys to know that, and we can run that report and hand them to you whenever you ask or you want. But we wanna thank you all for everything that you do supporting our nurses. We couldn't do it without your support. We thank you all. Thank you. Peggy, vote please. Supervisor Lee. Yes, actually, I was gonna make a quick uh, statement there. Uh, oh, Supervisor Lee. So, yeah, sorry. Uh, I certainly uh, uh, am extremely uh, appreciative of what uh, Mr. Kamara has mentioned and, and learned something about the fact that uh, the fully coded number of nurses, actually a very small portion of the full force has been helping us through this uh, critical work uh, during the pandemic. Uh, due to these nursing staffing shortages we have for so long, we certainly have been relying on the extra help in these partially coded nurses to work up to four times uh, to take care of our community. So we really owe it to our unsung heroes for these sacrifices. I just want to mention that, and I will be strongly supporting this. Thank you. And my my vote is aye. Thank you. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. And President Wasserman. Yes. Thank you very much. We now move on. Peggy, do you concur we did not pull any items from today's consent calendar? That is correct. Thank you very much. We now move on to item number 22, which we'll hear from Tiffany and James. It says under advisement from December 17th, 2019, receive report from the clerk of the Board of Supervisors and County Council relating to the effectiveness of the agreement with the OIR group regarding 
providing correction and law enforcement monitoring services. OCLEM. And I'm looking for James and Tiffany on my screen. Yeah, I'm here, and I don't, I don't know if Tiffany had something she wanted to specifically present either, um, but. Okay, uh, so you're available? Had, yeah, we're available for questions. I think the board had asked for a check-in yep. uh, on the agreement, and our recommendation, given everything that's been going on, is to check back in uh, and, and after a little bit more time has passed. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm seeing shaking noddings of head. Tiffany, thank you for being here. You appeared on the top of my screen and James on the bottom of my screen. So you guys threw me off there. Um, Move approval of the recommended action, which is to receive the report, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Second. Thank you. We've got a motion and a second, no speakers. This is receive only, but let's end this meeting with a flare. Peggy, vote please. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. And President Wasserman. Yes. Thank you all very, very much. Very important meeting today that was very informative. And um, I appreciate all that you do. Any other comments or questions from anybody? Nope. Then with that, I'm going to say this meeting is adjourned at 516. Thank you all. Have a good evening. Thank you. Recording stopped. And with that, this meeting will be, this room will be closed. Thank you and have a nice evening.